Uh, figuratively. <laughs> Thank you. So where's our flag behind me? Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call the May meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission's business meeting to order. Would everybody please stand with me and join in a moment of silence where we ask our higher power for guidance in this meeting any personal needs. Amen. Now please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. <sighs> I'd like to remind my fellow commissioners of North Carolina General Statute 138A-15E, which mandates at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair also shall inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at that time. Does anybody recognize a conflict of interest for our business today? None being. Also, I'd like for you all to refer back uh, to North Carolina General Statute 143B 289.54.G2 for further uh, uh, information on the conflict of interest issue. Laura, can you do roll call? Please, ma'am. Yes, Chair. Chairman Romano? Here. Thank you. Chairman McNeil? Chairman. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Do you know something I don't know? I'm having, nope, I have a, a technical difficulty, so I'm off my game. All right. <laughs> Commissioner Hendrickson. Thank you. Commissioner Cross. Here. Commissioner Blanton. Here. Commissioner Posey. Here. Commissioner Roller. Here. And Chairman Bizzle. Here. We have a quorum. We may conduct business. Before you is our agenda for today's meeting. Chair would entertain a motion to approve this agenda. So moved by Commissioner Posey. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner McNeil. Any other discussion on it? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Also, you're mailed out our minutes from our last meeting. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to these minutes? If not, Chair will entertain a motion to approve them. Commissioner so, Roller. So moved. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner McNeil. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move now on into our public comment session. Um, anybody that spoke last night will not be allowed to speak this morning, and I don't think I have a list of anybody who wants to speak. Do we? Hold on one second. Thank you, Colonel. Okay, got two today. First, Glenn, Stan Glenn Skinner, followed by Kathy Fulcher. Uh, 
Thank you all. Uh, Glenn Skinner, um, Commercial Fisherman, Executive Director of the North Carolina Fisheries Association. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're all not surprised I came here to talk about the uh, gillnet closure above the ferry lines in the Noose and Pamlico Rivers. Uh, uh, y'all heard a lot of comment last night, uh, even though y'all had tried to take this as an option off the table. The public has spoke. Uh, the advisory uh, committees also reviewed this option and had given you recommendations. Two of them recommended to put the gillnets back up these rivers. Uh, I would hope that y'all would do that. Uh, the main thing I want to talk about today is the process that was used to get this gillnet ban put in place. Uh, you, you know, it was an emergency meeting with only 48 hours notice. There was zero public comment allowed. The first public comment heard on this issue was last night, three years after the net ban had been put in place. Uh, that, that's outrageous. It's uncalled for. Uh, not only did they push the issue without input from the public, I attended the meeting in Kenton. Data was used from when I was in grade school to justify this net ban. The data was from a drift net fishery that does not exist anymore. It was absurd. This was simply a means to an end. Had nothing to do with science, had nothing to do with conservation. Uh, again, it was uncalled for. When we finally got a chance to address this through the process at y'all's last meeting, a majority of this commission voted to take allowing the use of gill nets off the table as an option, try to censor the public. Public spoken. All three advisory committees discussed it. One advisory committee could not come up to an option, and one of the commissioners here uh, was chairing that and tried to strong arm his committee into not discussing it. Uh, that was uncalled for. It was brought to my attention after that FinFish committee meeting that that commissioner reached out to advisory committee members on other advisory committees and called them up and verbally attacked them for their votes on that issue. Their job is to advise you. Your job is not to advise them. That should not be happening. You all have rulemaking authority. They serve in an advisory position only. You choose to take their advice or not, but you do not attack them for that advice. I don't know how many were called. I did get a call from one in the Southern Regional Advisory Committee who told me he was attacked. That should not happen. If you all do not lift this gill net ban, you're not only supporting a net ban that is not scientifically supported, you're supporting the process that got it here. It is not appropriate for you all. I know some of you personally. You are too good a people to support a process that did not allow stakeholder input. Time. Did not consider. That's time. Three minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, up next is Kathy Fulcher. I did forget to mention that we do have three minutes for your comments, and you'll be reminded of when 30 seconds is left. Good morning. My name is Kathy Fulcher. I'm a business owner in Craven County. My company, B&J Seafood, supports many local commercial fishermen. Many of these fishermen gill netted in the Upper News and Pamlico prior to it being arbitrarily closed. Our company has long history of providing bait to recreational fishermen from all over our state. Since the gill net closure, we have not been able to provide bait to the many fishermen going to the coast to drum fish. The primary bait used for drum fishing is mullet. Most of the spring and summer harvest of mullet normally occurs in the Upper Noose and Pamlico Rivers by gill netting. I formally request the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission to reopen all gill net fishing in the Upper Noose and Pamlico Rivers to the extent it was prior to being arbitrarily closed. This action will allow us to accommodate the recreational and commercial fishermen that depend on our ability to service them. Thank you. Thank you. Has everybody had a chance to address the commission that wants to? That being said, uh, public comment period is closed. Moving on into the chairman's report, everything should be in your briefing books, the letters and online comments about what we're taking up today and other things. Uh, Laura, is everybody up to date on their ethics uh, training and SEIs? 
Um, almost. We okay. have had some issues with the website, so we are yeah. working on that. So everyone is up to date or working on it. Yeah. And Tom. Okay. And I'll, I'll link closer and we can also turn it up. Thank you. All right. Okay. But you'll address those individually and get them in compliance. Correct. Great. Yes, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the committee assignment reports are there and other committee reports are also in your books. Um, there's also a report in there of the um, joint meeting of the, um, of the uh, commercial resource fund. So all that is in your books and we don't need to go over them at this time. One thing I do want to mention is, you know, we got this issue of water delineations that we've got that we are trying to address. Um, I've met with staff on a couple of occasions and we've come up with some preliminary thoughts. We are meeting with wildlife on June the 6th to see what their thoughts are and see if we can come up with a consensus about who should be managing what waters. Uh, this is going to be a long process. Uh, this it'll come back to this commission several times for final approval and adoption, and I'm sure other agencies too for their input for approval. So just wanting to let y'all know that this process is started, and we will keep you advised as we go along the way with things. Okay, moving on into the direct report. Kat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can everyone hear me good? Commissioner Hendricks, can you hear me over there? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we got a lot, got a lot on the director's report today, but we'll try to be as expedient as we can. Um, to start out, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the 200th uh, anniversary for marine fisheries management in the state of North Carolina. We are quickly approaching that. Uh, it's a, a milestone that we're very proud of. I don't know how we survived this long, but we have, and we will continue to as long as we can. Um, we've also begun to reflect on the progress that we've made and the challenges that we face in, in fisheries management every day, and we need to keep those uh, in the forefront as we move forward. Uh, as the director, I, I do believe it's important that we consider um, we consider this with our eyes open and with the determination to make a better a future, a better fisheries in our state. And that, that is going to take a lot of willpower um, from all sectors and all of our stakeholders in the state. In North Carolina, fisheries management began uh, almost 200 years ago uh, at, with regulations on oysters. And now it encompasses 30, 13 uh, species or groups of species managed by the state and a host of other species that are managed with our federal and state partners. And as we as we move into the bicentennial, bicentennial we want to um, acknowledge this journey and set the division sites uh, to, to manage what are, in my opinion, some of the greatest fisheries in this country. We, we have some world-class fisheries uh, in the state of North Carolina. And with that, I, I look forward to working with the commission to continue to try and improve, improve our fisheries across the state. We want this bicentennial to be a year long celebration. That's what we're planning um, beginning in December of this year and going throughout uh, 2023. And we'll continue to keep the commission up to date on the plans for what we will be doing across the state in the coming year. So when I, when I took the job as director, one of the things that I wanted to focus on is improving communication with our stakeholders. Uh, I think that is critical. We want to foster stakeholder understanding and collaboration as well as address the mounds of misinformation that we battle daily. Uh, I have quickly learned that all of this is not, not simple. It takes time and resources that as a state agency, you all well know we often do not have. So. Luckily for me and the people of this state, um, these folks are always up for challenge. And so we've set up an internal uh, committee uh, in the Division of Marine Fisheries called the Communication Action Team. Uh, we like acronyms. We call it the CAT. 
and the job of this team is really to develop an uh, engagement and communication strategy for the division to go go by. And the goal is to better engage the public, you know, bring awareness, improve knowledge, and develop relationships for better understanding of fisheries management in our state. How does this really work? And really understanding the mission of the Division of Marine Fisheries. Uh, our, our objectives are basically to engage, educate, promote, and collaborate with our stakeholders. Uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries operates in a very competitive age of constant communication where the consistent communication is critical. And I've said this to, to staff many times, if we don't tell our story, someone else is going to tell it for us, science included. Um, so by educating and collaborating and presenting factual messages that are based on science and policy, we, I think the division is better prepared and, and can anticipate plan and manage to, um, to manage with the perception of facts. Stick to the facts, that's what we want to do. We want to make a clear path for the science and the facts and minimize the rhetoric and misinformation as, as best as we possibly can. So just to cover some of the outreach and what that might look like over the last several months for the division, the staff has participated in a number of outreach activities to help educate the public about our programs, about fisheries management in the state, about regulations and any other issues that they happen to have questions and want to talk about. We have staff, we've had staff attend the Dixie Deer Classic in Wake County back in March. Uh, we've had staff do presentations about the shellfish, shellfish sanitation program. Uh, we've participated in Earth Day festivals uh, uh, across the state to discuss ethical angling and presentations at elementary and high schools uh, about various DMF programs that we do quite frequently. And I personally am, am trying to practice what I preach uh, about communication, but it really does take a lot of time. And But I really feel it's important. And I've asked the staff to do this as well on top of their real jobs, which is not this. Um, but we do, we all agree that it's very important. So try, in trying to do that, we planned a, um, and you wouldn't believe how, how much planning it takes to get two women to Cape Point on a side-by-side -side in March. But we, the Deputy Director and D. Lupton and myself uh, planned this and we wanted to go out and talk to Red Drum uh, anglers at Cape Point. And we had Marine Patrol and Fisheries Management on staff. And we, we wanted to do this to talk to people about fisheries management, hear their concerns face-to-face, uh, -face, and hopefully share some information about proper handling of large red drum to, to anglers. And the most common comments, of course, we wanted to do this on a day when there was actually a red drum call, and that didn't happen, and, um, but sometimes that's the way it is. But the most common comment we got from folks, and a lot of folks that we did talk to were from out of state, but they um, very much love coming to North Carolina. They come here specifically to fish, some of them specifically for that fishery, uh, as you can imagine. And really the other thing was how much they appreciated us taking the time to be out there uh, on the beach and, and talk to them. And I even understand from talking to the chairman that he has recently um, talked to some civic groups as well about fisheries management in, in our state. So um, outreach isn't easy. Uh, it takes time, it takes resources that, uh, again, sometimes we don't have. Uh, and if y'all have any ideas, uh, groups, know of groups that we should be talking to, events that we should be aware of, aware of please don't hesitate to, to reach out to Laura and myself, and, and we'd be glad to discuss those. But these are the very types of activities that we hope to be, be ramping up in the, in the future. And you should, you should look to see more of DMF and, and our, our staff and us talking about fisheries management in our state. So moving on to seafood uh, quality and safety workshops, the Division of Marine Fisheries staff in partnership with uh, North Carolina Sea Grant held a seafood quality and safety workshop for 42 North Carolina registered environmental health specialists, uh, basically county health inspectors. This was in Greensboro on May the 4th. The one day workshop focused on providing up-to-date information regarding specific areas of seafood safety that local health department staff are likely to encounter when they're conducting uh, seafood inspections, uh, safety inspections. And the topics uh, include approved sources of seafood, shellfish tagging, uh, common seafood illnesses, identifying various seafood products and evaluating their qualities. 
uh, participants uh, gave extremely uh, positive reviews of the workshop, and it would not have been a success without the contributions of the division staff from Shellfish Sanitation and Recreational Water Quality. Also, Marine Patrol participated in this, and staff from Sea Grant. Uh, the Chatham County Health Department and the facilities were hosted by Southern Foods. Uh, it's a very important job to keep make sure that our um, seafood is safe in our state and this recreate this water quality folks and uh, shellfish sanitation they do a good job of this and often people don't even realize what they do myself included I've had taken the time for me to get up to speed on what they actually do but it's a, a it's very important uh, part of the industry here in our state. <clears throat> just moving just moving on to talk about the North Carolina Coastal Recreational Fishing Guide. Uh, this year's uh, Fishing Digest, excuse me, is now available. And I think Patricia has some copies uh, around outside on the table. I saw them earlier uh, last night. The Digest is published uh, annually and provides anglers with information they need to uh, fish responsibly. It contains license options, artificial reef information, some best fishing practices as well, information on how to identify and measure fish, and has a table with recreational size and bag limit seasons, things like that that are, in, that are of interest to recreational fishermen. It's provided uh, free for the public, and it can also be found online at fishing piers, tackle stores, visitor centers uh, throughout our state. So pick you up one today if you, you don't have one. So now I will ask uh, Deputy Director D. Lupton to come up and give you an update on our Federal Economic Assistance Program. Good morning. So um, this is our quarterly update on economic assistance programs. At the last meeting, I told you we concluded the CARES 2 program and we were transitioning into the federal fishery uh, disaster program. Um, as a reminder, in 2018, due to Hurricane Florence, governor requested uh, federal government to declare a federal fishery commercial disaster, commercial federal fish, uh, fishery disaster uh, caused by Hurricane Florence. Um, NOAA did grant that uh, disaster declaration in December 2018. Um, it's taken a while to get to where we are. Um, that required NOAA to do a, a damage assessment. So in 2019, they issued their assessment um, that there was $38 million in damages to vessels and businesses, $56 million in lost revenues, and um, 3,500 fishing-related job losses due to the hurricane. Um, following that assessment, um, um, NOAA notified, we were notified by NOAA in March of 2020 that we were eligible to receive $7.7 .7 million in federal fishery disaster assistance from um, NOAA Fisheries. And we had to develop a spending plan and have that approved. It had to be approved by NOAA and the Federal um, Office Budget Management. Um, so we went through that process. COVID happened. Um, and that refocused NOAA some, but um, in December 2021, we were finally notified that the plan was approved with a start date of January 2022, and we have to ha be complete by June 20 2023, so we have 18 months. At the last meeting, I told you we wanted to finish the, the second part of the CARES program before we started this program since they were so closely uh, linked there. So we opened the um, application period for the federal fishery disaster on March 1st. Um, the applications had to be in by um, April 18th. Uh, financial aid is available to eligible seafood dealers and processors, ocean fishing piers for higher fishing operations and bait and tackle shops that were affected by Hurricane Florence. Um, the division mailed applications to those stakeholders that we licensed like fish fish dealers and ocean fishing piers, um, but we don't license um, uh, processors or bait and tackle shops. We we also emailed um, for hire license holders. Um, so we mailed the, that group their applications and then we made it available on the website and issued some news releases for those that we don't license and let them know the application period was open. Um, 
So um, the applicants who wanted to apply, they had to demonstrate loss of revenue in the months of September, October, and November of 2018 relative to the previous three-year average of that same time period, along with any damages caused by Hurricane Florence. So this is a little different than the other programs we've had because damages were allowed too. Um, applicants can claim loss of revenue and or damages. Um, the applications we got in, some just claim revenue, some claim damages, some claim both. Um, so we're having to go through that. Um, we received 103 applications. Um, we're in the process of reviewing these applications. Um, a quick breakdown of the 103, we have 66 from seafood dealers and processors, 26 from for hire operations, five from ocean fishing piers, and six from bait and tackle shops. So because damages are also um, allowed in this program, the verification time uh, to review these applications and verify the data takes a lot longer. Um, we have to go through all the damages, have to look at receipts, have to make sure we're not paying for stuff, stuff that uh, other programs have paid or if insurance is paid. Um, so it's taking a little longer than the CARES program um, to. So we have to review all the applications and settle all the appeals um, to require a final determination before any funds can be issued because the funds are based on the percentage of eligible claim losses, losses, revenue, and damages in relation to the eligible stakeholders. So there's all the categories. It's, it's a percentage who qualify in that category. Very much like CARES, you have to, everybody has to be reviewed and they go in that single pot and, and the percentage is based on their claim and the amount of money that they will be issued. Um, we anticipate trying to complete review all and have checks issued this year. We got until June 2023, but we're hoping to have this done by the end of the year and then we use the rest for our reporting um, part of this program. Um, so that's uh, my update for this. We'll have another update in, in August. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit more where we are in the status of um, actually issuing checks. So, um, I will say um, $7.7 .7 million does not go very far especially with what the damages that we're seeing people claim. Um, there, were, there were huge losses. All right. Thank you, Dee. Any questions for Dee? Tom. Thank you, Dee. Um, I received several phone calls from for higher stakeholders regarding this. And, um, and, you know, I also called staff on this. They were wonderful. They always picked up the phone and answered all my questions. One of the questions, you answered most everything that people had, but what is your formula for how the funds are going to be based out? Could you go into a little bit more depth on that? So, I really understand how you explained it. So, I can't recall off the top of my head. So, $7.7 .7 million uh, less our uh, administrative fee. A certain percentage of it is for seafood dealers, a certain percentage of it is for the for hire industry and Ocean Pier. So, if some, so for whatever, like the for hire industry, whatever that amount is, the applicants, their claim loss, say if they all claim, say there's a million dollars there, but the total claim for each applicant is a million dollars. Each one of them had a different percentage. So that million dollars, so if you claim 7%, you get 7% of that million dollars. Um, you would get 10% of that million dollars. That's straight math. So it's proportional based on their claimed losses. Now, what we'll see most likely in some of the categories is they're not going to, and they can't go over 100%. Of, of their claim. Um, so we can we can uh, reimburse up to 100% of their claim um, if we can verify that that that's how much it is. So some of the damages we have to, you know, some people uh, had insurance claims to are like, oh, insurance pay for that, you don't double dip. So we have to take that out when they when they come in. Um, so if some categories have money left over. Um, say we compensated one, one group all that they had, all the applicants, um, say it's for higher industry. If there's any money left over in that category, we can transfer it to another category to make that category closer to 100%. There's going to be some categories, just like CARES, that is not going to come anywhere near 100% um, compensated. But we try to get them as much as we can. But we have to take care of the, each category first before we do that. I don't know if that helps, but that's 
is a percentage based on your claim. No, I think that's very helpful, okay. and I'm sure the public listening will yeah. really appreciate that explanation. Do you have off the top of your head the breakdown of the different categories where the money went, like for dealers, processors versus for hire versus? Um, here? don't I don't have that with me. It's um, I don't think so. Well, wait a minute. Yes, I do. <laughs> so seafood dealers, um, we have 66 applicants. It's $4.2 million is in that category. For hire, we have 26 applications received, $1.6 million. Um, ocean fishing piers, it's five applications for $1.4 million. And bait and tackle shops is six applications for $227,000. So that percentage by stakeholders is to, is, was based on the NOAA assessment of the damages. So to, that report NOAA did, they broke up, you know, that total amount of damages. They had already come up with the, the amount of damages per the category. So we applied that percentage to the $7.7 .7 million to come up with that, that amount. And our spending plan, it's on the website. It explains all this in our spending plan that NOAA approved. So. Great, but so it's great also here and on the record because people yeah. are listening. But thank you for that. And just another thank you for your staff for being so helpful. That was a pretty lengthy application. Anything else for Dee? Thank you, Dee. Appreciate you. Adam Durant. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Dee. Um, now I'd like to bring up Chris Bat Savage, who is going to uh, give you an update on happenings at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, for this update, I'm just going to cover the ASMFC meeting that was held a few weeks ago. The uh, Mid-Atlantic Council meeting last month had a pretty light agenda. So um, anyways, uh, as always, I'll just uh, cover the, the highlights and um, and I'll start with striped bass. Uh, the striped bass management board took final action on draft amendment seven. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Direct ASMFC, ASMFC management of striped bass in North Carolina only applies to the coastal migratory stock. So this management action does not apply to the state's estuarine striped bass populations. The uh, four issues considered in the amendment were management triggers, recreational release mortality, conservation equivalency, and a soccer building plan. The uh, public hearings held this spring were well attended and thousands of people submitted written comments on the amendment. The uh, board reaffirmed most of the existing management triggers in place to address increasing fishing mortality and decreasing spawn and stock biomass, but chose the option to require a stock rebuilding plan be implemented within two years of the spawn and stock biomass trigger being tripped. The uh, FMP didn't have a, a, a timeline for, for doing this uh, before. Um, the board uh, also chose a recruitment management trigger that is more sensitive to low recruitment events and requires management measures based on a lower fishing mortality rate. The, the previous uh, management trigger uh, didn't uh, specify the management type and also uh, wasn't se as sensitive to uh, low recruitment events. The uh, board also chose uh, the option to defer uh, action on a trip management trigger if work is already underway to uh, address a previous trip management trigger. The uh, board didn't take any action on implementing no targeting closures for recreational striped bass fishing to address recreational release mortality. That will likely be addressed in a future action, um, depending on the next stock assessment uh, results. Uh, to reduce recreational release mortality, gaps will no, will no longer be allowed to be used to land striped bass and legal size striped bass caught using natural baits on J hooks must be released. The uh, use of conservation equivalency in the striped bass fishery was limited by not allowing it when the stock is ever fished, requires a certain uh, level of recreational harvest estimate precision, requires a higher reduction to account for uh, estimate uncertainty, and reduction in liberalization targets for conservation equivalency must equal the state specific level, not the coast wide level. Uh, for the stock for stock rebuilding, the board chose a low recruitment assumption for the upcoming stock assessment to calculate the fishing mortality level to rebuild the stock by 2029. If the stock assessment indicates that at least a 5% reduction in re removals is needed to achieve this uh, uh, fishing, re this rebuilding fishing mortality uh, target, the board may adjust measures uh, to achieve this uh, board action. 
What this does is it allows the board to implement measures in 2023 instead of 2024, which would uh, occur under the uh, the timeline for an addendum to uh, to an FMP. Uh, and then the FMP was later approved that week by the full ASMFC at, at their business session. So uh, overall, the uh, board made very risk averse decisions that will uh, help uh, help rebuild the stock in its overfished condition uh, and implements uh, timely management measures when the stock is in better shape but showing uh, concerning trends. The uh, stock rebuilding plan that will occur this fall after the upcoming stock assessment is complete uh, could result in uh, additional regulation changes, however, and I'll keep this commission updated of any, any changes if they occur. Uh, so next species I'll cover is uh, Mako sharks. Um, the Coastal Sharks Management Board approved a zero retention limit for the commercial and recreational Mako shark fisheries in state waters upon implementation of the final rule in federal waters. The, uh, this action was taken in response to the 2019 Atlantic Shorefin uh, Mako stock assessment update that indicates the resources overfished and experience in overfishing with a stock rebuilding uh, date of 2070. The uh, zero retention limit also uh, responds to the recent determination by the International Commission on the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas that all member countries need to reduce current Mako shark fishing mortality to accelerate the rate of recovery and to increase the probability of rebuilding success. Uh, we plan on issuing a proclamation next month that aligns with the zero retention limit in federal waters. Uh, next up is uh, is Cobia. Uh, the Coastal Pelagics Management Board shifted the three-year quota time block for Cobia from 2020 through 2022 to 2021 through 2023. This shift accounts for the uh, change in the commercial and recreational allocations and recreational management changes that all occurred in 2021. The uh, total of 80,112 fish, which is the combined recreational and commercial quotas uh, that was set in 2020, remains through 2023. Uh, the board will meet next year to uh, consider setting new specifications for the 2024 through 2026 time block uh, fishing seasons. Uh, so I'll finish things up uh, for this summary uh, with uh, with Red Drum. The uh, Science Management Board reviewed and accepted the Red Drum Stimulation Assessment and Peer Review Report. In 2020, the board initiated a simulation modeling process so the Red Drum Stock Assessment Subcommittee could uh, determine the most appropriate management strategy for Red Drum. The peer review panel recommended the stock synthesis model be used uh, to assess both the northern and southern red drum stocks, um, while the uh, statistical catch at age model should no longer be used. The panel also recommended uh, uh, using a traffic light approach to monitor changes in landings and stock abundance in between assessments. Work will now begin uh, on the red drum benchmark stock assessment, which is scheduled to be completed in 2024. So that concludes uh, my update. Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Chris? All right, great report, thank you very much. Thank Director, you, Chris. Director Riles. Um, Trish, Trish Murphy couldn't be with us today, uh, so I will um, be giving her South Atlantic report uh, that she provided for us. <clears throat> the council, uh, South Atlantic Fishery Management Council met in Jekyll Island, Georgia, Mar March the 7th through 11th. They approved two fishery management plan amendments uh, for review by the Secretary of Commerce, Amendment 34 to the Coastal Migratory Pelagic Fishery Management Plan, which uh, increases the annual catch limits for king mackerel. Also, Amendment 50 to the Snapper Grouper Fishery Management Plan, uh, which will establish a new rebuilding plan and catch levels for red porgy. I also let the commission know that the Dolphin Wahoo Amendment 10 rules went into place and the division issued a proclamation that was effective May 2nd, uh, lowering the vessel limits from 60 fish to 54 fish. The council also uh, began development of regulatory amendment two to the Dolphin Wahoo Fishery Management Plan uh, for the Atlantic region. The options being discussed in that plan uh, include size limits, uh, vessel and bag limits, and modifications to retention limits by captain and crew aboard charter and uh, aboard charter vessels. And the, ca um, the council will discuss this at their June meeting again. Uh, they continue their work on snapper grouper FMP amendments 51 for snowy grouper, 52 for golden tilefish and blue line tilefish. And Amendment three, uh, 53, excuse me, for addressing gag. Um, we think we have a hard time with Amendment 1, 2, and 3. I don't know how in the world they keep up with all these, but 
Um, the council continues to work on framework amendment 35 to the snapper grouper fishery management plan. Uh, this amendment focuses on ways to reduce uh, release mortality in the red snapper fishery. The council is considering time, area, and depth restrictions uh, and a revision to the catch levels as well. They're also considering options for private uh, recreational snapper grouper reporting um, and permitting. The council plans to develop an advisory panel that is focused on this topic to assist them with guidance during the development of the private recreational permitting and reporting amendment, which is snapper grouper amendment 46. NOAA recently announced the opening dates for the limited red snapper uh, fisheries in federal waters. The rec season is July 8th and 9th, which is a Friday and Saturday. It's one fish per person per day. The commercial season will open July 11th and close at 12.01 a.m. on January the 1st of 2023, unless earlier by prop. Uh, the commercial uh, trip limit is 75 pounds gutted weight. There's no size limit uh, in either of those fisheries. At the last meeting, uh, Commissioner Roller asked uh, a question about the allocation decision tool, and Trish just wanted to provide some more information for that. And I know she hates she can't be here to, to talk about this, but uh, just the goal of the allocation decision tool, and I know I know Commissioner Roller is aware of this, but for the group, is um, to help the council develop an approach uh, for decisions re regarding sector allocation that are consistent and transparent across all species. Uh, it is very basically a decision tree that they've divided into four categories, landings and discards, stock status, economic factors, and social factors. And each category has a series of questions that are designed to be designed to be uh, answered using readily available information uh, and data and to be completed in a short time frame. Um, the tool will be used to supplement the allocation decision making process. And the council will continue to work on the tool with plans to review it again in September. Um, I think just the fact that they're developing a uh, tool, uh, such a tool, kind of speaks to the complexity of allocation discussions, as this commission is perfectly uh, aware of. But certainly, um, at the council and and uh, commission, other ASMFC, the, the discussions about allocation are difficult, and they hope that this tool will help them uh, and help the public as well understand those discussions so we'll see how that how that turns out um, hopefully it'll be something useful and we could potentially use it in the future depending on on how that looks so that's the south atlantic report is there any questions questions uh, of cap commissioner roller it's more of a comment if you'll allow so uh, first of all, thank you for the explanation on the allocation decision tool. It's a really interesting thing the council is doing. And just to be clear, I'm, I'm a South, our North Carolina at large South Atlanta council member. Um, there's a lot of DMF staff involved in it and uh, on the on our special meeting. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that we had kind of an explanation because it's a really interesting process. Um, and, and while I have the microphone here uh, regarding the report, um, I wanted to comment a little bit on the dolphin wahoo fishery, specifically dolphin or mahi-mahi, whatever you want to call them. Um, this is a really big issue at the council right now. Um, Florida, it's a very important fishery to Florida, particularly the for hire and recreational fleet. And um, in Florida, they're, they're not catching them like they used to. And the for hire fleet is very upset. And they're coming to council meetings and they're providing public comment. And what was proposed by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is our, the Florida's version of the MFC, um, they reduced state waters limit to 30 fish and I believe five fish per person. Um, and they want the council to do something similar. Um, the problem is, is those sort of reductions don't really do anything to reduce the harvest of mahi, particularly in Florida. But they will have a big impact on the North Carolina fishery, particularly the for higher fleet and outer banks. And so for anybody listening or anybody who's going to come back and listen to the recording, um, if this concerns you as a North Carolina angler or for higher fishermen, you need to get involved in the council process because we're hearing from a lot of people and we need to hear from more people from North Carolina. So thank you for that moment with the mic. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Roland. Okay, anything else of uh, the director on this? Okay. Thank you for the report. Please proceed. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, we will have the Marine Patrol update uh, from Colonel Carter Whitten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, 
and good morning, commissioners. I'm Marine Patrol Colonel Carter Whitten, and today I'm here to update you on your Marine Patrol activity over the last quarter. In your briefing materials, you will find the Marine Patrol update memo. The shellfish relay program began April 1st with officers coordinating relays from locations in the central and southern districts. The relay programs provided an opportunity to relay clams and oysters out of specific polluted areas to leases. Marine Patrol oversight of the relay activity is mandated by the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. The program successfully concluded on May 15th with officers overseeing 34 relay participants in the central region and 19 in the southern region. Um, if you see on the two boards, this is the swift water team that the Marine Patrol has put together for emergency management. Marine Patrol has newly Marine Patrol has a newly swift water rescue team that will be available to North Carolina Division of Emergency Management as needed. Marine Patrol is the first state law enforcement agency to have a swift water team. Seven officers attended a week long swift water boat operators course in Morganton, consist, consisting of classroom and in water training on Lake James and the Catawba River. The Marine Patrol swift water team is an asset to the region during future flooding and hurricane events. Um, we participated in three different um, events this year. We had seven people go to Morganton for a boat operators course. We attended a heart exercise at Hammocks Beach State Park where seven different helicopters came in and were stimulating picking up victims from hurricane damaged areas where we had assisted with that. And then we assisted with the Catawba flood exercise. The Marine Patrol education team provides outreach to the communities across the state, educating the public about marine fisheries. The team puts on presentations to the local schools, organizations, and expos. Recently, the team has presented to the Craven County and Dare County High Schools and a Hyde County Middle School in June. We were also participating in the Black Bear Festival the third and fourth next week, along with boating, along with hosting a booth, the Marine Patrol will be trying to do a swift water demonstration there also. From February to April, officers conducted over 21,000 checks and issued 87 citations. We're starting to see the number of recreational trips increase as the weather improves, and we're anticipating a busy summer. Officers have observed a good number of Spanish mackerel catches, and the cobia have arrived, and we're seeing fishermen bring those in. Presently, the Marine Patrol has nine vacant positions, we did have one sergeant vacant position that we just filled Monday. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions, Sir Colonel? Whenever I see Marine Patrol participate in some of these rescue efforts, it gives me a sense of pride. I want you to know that. I appreciate what all you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Madam Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I echo that. We are extremely proud of the Swift Order uh, team, and they were actually doing um, – some training out in front of the office yesterday, but we didn't know they were doing training and all we saw was a sinking boat. So it did cause a bit of alarm for just a second, but then we quickly realized that there was some some training going on. So thanks to those those officers for stepping up and doing that is it is important uh, team for sure. Uh, next up, I'd like to ask Jacob Boyd to come up and give an update on the shellfish lease program. Good morning. Thank you, Director Rawls, Chairman Bizzle. So today I'll be discussing some important updates on the shellfish lease and aquaculture program activities since your last meeting. Uh, and if you remember, we started these um, updates for each of your meetings at the last meeting. So I won't be covering all of the updates, but kind of further updates since then. Uh, staff continued to implement mandates and recommendations from the 2019 Shellfish Aquaculture Bill and subsequent legislative studies, including the User Conflict Study and SEAs and Moratorium Area Studies, and that's Shellfish Aquaculture Enterprise Areas. For the User Conflict Study, amendments to three of the 11 shellfish lease rules resulting from the User Conflict Study are tentatively becoming effective in June 2022, with amendments to nine additional shellfish lease rules proposed. Staff are working on corresponding efforts to implement the rule amendments, including developing a cumulative impact policy and the new shellfish leaseholder training program that emphasizes user conflict reduction strategies. 
For the SEAs, we finished meeting with officials from all the local municipalities surrounding Bogue Sound to provide background information on shellfish leases and SEAs in general. We received great feedback and are hosting a virtual event in early summer to present more in-depth information to all members of the public. We may hold additional virtual events based on the initial turnout. We will keep you updated on the progress as we move forward and report out. We formed an interagency aquaculture work group with staff from agencies in charge of managing aquaculture activities in North Carolina, which includes uh, DMF, uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture, and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission uh, to begin developing a North Carolina interagency aquaculture policy as a comprehensive approach to aquaculture management in North Carolina to further support the growth and challenges of the present industry and a better plan for the future. The policy addresses issues affecting both in-water and upland aquaculture facilities, provides clarity to existing regulations, and provides for more efficient coordination with the aquaculture management agencies to ensure consistency across authorities. The shellfish aquaculture gear management and storm preparedness plan we discussed at your last meeting was included in the 2022 shellfish lease application package. And uh, we will be broadcasting that through a news release and um, on the website shortly. We were finally able to hold the inaugural State Marine Aquaculture Coordination Network workshop last week after two years of delays due to COVID. As a reminder, DMF partnered with the National Sea Grant Law Center and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and received funding from the NOAA Sea Grant Program to plan and host the workshop for state aquaculture managers and extension personnel. The workshop provided a networking forum for state aquaculture coordinators and regulators, state extension personnel, and federal regulators. It also promoted efforts to compile regulatory information across state aquaculture programs and help program administrators learn from each other's experiences and challenges on a variety of topics, including user conflict issues. The next steps are to secure long-term federal funding, expand nationally to include all U.S. coastal states, and meet annually to update the inventory and other pertinent information. Commissioner Hendrickson uh, requested information pertaining to the issues surrounding potential floating structures on shellfish leases at your last meeting. In short, at the request from shellfish growers, the Division of Coastal Management, with direction from the Coastal Resources Commission, were researching potential avenues for allowing working platforms on certain shellfish leases in North Carolina, including the world rulemaking process and or through the CAMA permitting process. After discussion at their February 2022 meeting, the CRC agreed that before they consider any regulations for potential floating aquaculture structures, input was needed from the state attorney general to determine if aquaculture is considered a form of agriculture and therefore exempt from CRC regulation. To date, there has not been any determination made. And lastly, I wanted to, uh, to end the update on a positive note and make the commission aware of some really interesting research that is coming out about the ecosystem services provided by certain types of aquaculture and using aquaculture for restoration purposes. Uh, the Nature Conservancy released a report recently about rest restorative aquaculture for nature and communities. Restorative aquaculture occurs when commercial aquaculture provides direct ecological benefits to the environment with the potential to generate net positive environmental outcomes. While North Carolina was not a part of this effort, I thought it would be good to share. A body of research conducted by the Nature Conservancy scientists and partners demonstrates that aquaculture can help restore estuarine and ocean health, as well as provide economic development and food production in coastal communities worldwide. Although there are still outstanding questions to be answered, including how spatial expansion of marine aquaculture will affect the provisioning of ecosystem services, existing research has demonstrated that marine aquaculture can contribute to ecosystem service provisioning that extends beyond production of a resource. That concludes my report, Chairman Bizzle. Questions for Jacob? Mr. Posey. Well, first of all, comments. Um, applaud the division on tremendous efforts as we move forward to, to meet the state's uh, targets for aquaculture. And on your last point, um, you know, just to reiterate, there's been quite a few studies, some of which in North Carolina, that have shown the ecosystem benefit of aquaculture, at least at moderate um, densities, not only of carbon removal, nitrogen removal, burying into the sediments, but also providing habitat for various um, fin fish, various um, aquatic crustaceans. 
Um, I did have one question. Um, with the education program, could you outline very, very briefly what's included in your education program? And, and also how it interfaces with Carteret Community College's program, if it does. So it, it does, and you know they had uh, they had a C grant got a grant in 2020 to develop the um, new the trading program. Um, it's a it's a one semester program for, and so from the beginning we wanted to ensure that whatever they developed, uh, we helped develop their syllabus. So that way, if you completed that certification, you didn't have to complete our certification. So it counted for if you became a new leaseholder. Uh, so it included all of the previous requirements. So before you had to pass a test for 70% with some of the information we provided. Now we're gonna be actually conducting like a one day um, annual um, trading event that new growers um, come to and that we provide information on uh, shellfish lease in general, regulatory information, um, you know, shellfish sanitation, those type of requirements, but also user conflict mitigation. So it'll be much more comprehensive and aligned with how other states do their type of training programs to ensure that new leaseholders um, have that information um, at, at the very beginning. And so we coordinated with the community college and Sea Grant to um, develop that. And um, so it's worked out pretty well. Well, sounds great. And once again, it's exciting to see um, um, the efforts move the program forward and also to get ahead of and be proactive of any potential conflicts. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Roller. Uh, thank you for your report, Jacob. Quick question. Do you know the economic value of the aquaculture fishery right now? Uh, the latest farm gate value that was calculated last year, I believe, was around three and a half a uh, million. I'm not. I can get you the exact number, but um, it, it has steadily is, increased since. Is that X vessel value three and a half million? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yeah, Commissioner Cross. Just a real quick clerical issue, Jacob. When when y'all are issuing the renewals for the leases when they're coming out, it would be a great benefit if y'all could provide the prior copy from the prior renewal because some of these places, I mean, like uh, when I went to renew one of mine, I, I had to look forever because we actually lost it in the storm. So just to speed up the process, if you can include a prior, the prior copy when you go to renew it, just so they've got a reference, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks for the feedback. Right. Anything else from anybody? Right, Jacob, thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Director. Thank you, Jacob. So next, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Southern Flounder. Mike is going to be um, updating the commission on a flounder symposium that the staff attended uh, in March. But first, I did want to just have a couple of updates about implementing the FMP. One of your action items today is to vote on the final approval of the Southern Flounder um, Amendment 3. And if you approve this plan as is with the quota, mon quota management option uh, in place, the division is going to uh, will need to implement quota monitoring before the commercial uh, flounder season can open. This is obviously not the case for the recreational fishery, but we'll get to that next. Um, the trip, 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 trip ticket program uh, has worked with the Department of Information Technology to develop the estuarine flounder dealer permit that all uh, commercial seafood dealers uh, will need to obtain to pur purchase uh, flounder for licensed commercial fishermen. Uh, the permit can be obtained at any division of Marine Fisheries Office that sells licenses. The conditions of the permit will require the seafood dealer to submit uh, daily logs to the trip ticket program for flounder quota and so that we can monitor that daily. The trip ticket program is currently in the process of hiring a second biologist to assist uh, with data collection and compliance of this uh, daily monitoring. So there's been a lot of work behind the scenes uh, in anticipation uh, of this. <clears throat> so moving on to discuss a little bit about recreational monitoring. The recreational catch of, of uh, flounder will continue to be monitored by the Marine uh, Recreational Information Program and the Gig Mail Survey. Uh, we are well aware that MRIP uh, is not designed to provide real-time results as we, have, as we have discussed and heard many times. Uh, and this is why the division is actively pursuing methods of capturing this data uh, more quickly. We're currently working with the Wildlife Resources Commission to develop a call-in system that recre recreational anglers uh, can use to voluntarily report uh, their daily catch harvest. 
Um, we're also, um, the Coastal Angling Program, which is known as the CAP, continues to collect data on recreational discards uh, of Southern Flounder uh, using the Catch You Later app that was created in conjunction with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council uh, and the Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Statistics Program. The CAP is also collaborating uh, with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and the ACCSP to develop a customizable mobile app uh, called SciFish that uses citizen science to collect fisheries data. Um, SciFish may be available within a few years for use. So um, you can see the effort here in North Carolina, and it's absolutely not just in North Carolina. These are issues uh, for the entire East Coast states and all managers. This is really the top, uh, pro probably one of the top things on folks' lists is try to get a handle on uh, real-time recreational uh, reporting. So we are partnering with uh, other states, other agencies, and academia uh, throughout the East Coast to try and uh, answer this need for sure. Um, I want to talk uh, about the the other thing I want to talk about is the our plan and our discussion to update the Southern Flounder Stock Assessment. I know Commissioner Hendrickson at the last meeting asked about uh, the money, um, what we would need to get the assessment done, and certainly we We'll never turn down money. We appreciate uh, all the help we can get funding-wise as a state agency. But for this particular issue, it's not really about the funds. It's really more about the data and the timing of the assessment. And one of the big questions is, do we have enough data over a long enough time period to measure a change in the fishery? So this includes impacts from management changes and if management has been in place and long enough for us to see any changes or any response to that. And these are the questions that the staff talks about when they come up with recommendations and we discuss, you know, when we want to, to do this. And although we may not have quite the time frame we would like, we, um, you gotta, we gotta keep in mind that the reductions um, that were outlined in Amendment 2 were for all of the southeast states and not just North Carolina. And we put management in place a lot sooner than these other states uh, did. So that's an important thing to keep uh, keep in mind. But I feel like it's important to conduct the update to try and help us determine at least if we're, we're headed in the right direction. And we, we have discussed um, updating the stock assessment with our current uh, partner states and we they have committed to giving us their data. Uh, and so we, we've had those discussions with them and we plan to, to do that in um, 2023 with data through 2022. That is our plan at this time. Um, there are things that potentially could change that, but right now that's what we're, what we're looking at. We hope that the 2022 fishing year will give us a year without COVID impacts to, to be able to look at as well. Um, and those restrictions on sampling and data collection, their discussions up and down the East Coast as well. What do we do with 2020 data and, to, and other data that was affected by COVID? So um, th those are discussions that other management agencies are also having. And we have to recall that our terminal year for the current stock assessment is 2017. So that gives us five years of data, uh, but it does not give us five years of management. So that is always going to going to be a concern. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Um, in March, the division staff attended a flounder symposium hosted by the Gulf States uh, Fishery Management Council. And we're all well aware of the um, discussions that we've been having about flounder in our state, but they also having these discussions to our south. And uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, items that We'll discuss at that symposium, and Mike's going to fill you in on those. And certainly, I'll be glad to take any questions about my yeah, I think Commissioner Roller has a question, and I may also go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, Director, you mentioned that you were working with the WRC to have a call-in program to, this is the word I'm underlying, voluntarily report catches. Why wouldn't we be requiring the reporting of it? Well, working towards that. right now, this is just something that we are, um, it's kind of like a pilot thing that we're working on so it would be voluntary at first and and we've had a lot of discussions about voluntary reporting and the issues with that I think mainly what we're looking for is to try to get something in place sooner rather than later and uh, we won't be able to do it for this year uh, but again I think it will just be 
if we can work something out for next year, it'll just be a tool that we're looking at right now. But certainly mandatory reporting is something we can we can look at down the road once we get something in place that we feel like we can really work with. Thank you, Director, and I just want to compliment you all on your work and outreach on this. Um, you guys were doing so much work with your partners. People started calling me and trying to see if you guys were trying to do a new program uh, to replace MRAP. So there's a lot of rumors going around and appreciate you guys confirming that wasn't the case. So, Well, we, we appreciate that. And uh, Deputy Director Lupton is, serves on the um, ACCSP, and she's been rattling some cages about recreational uh, in-season monitoring. So we appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, Madam Director, I've got a question for you, too. Yes, sir. Uh, when we start the stock assessment in 2023, how long will it take to complete this, and will it be done to make any adaptive management measures for the season that year? I'm going to say no for 2023. So we will be using 2022 data that we won't get until mid-2023. So it'll be... Will it be into 2024 by the time we get results? Maybe somebody else can speak to that. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Bizzle. I mean, <clears throat> timeline-wise, it'll be mid-2023 before all the data is in and finalized. Um, since it's an assessment update and not a benchmark, um, it doesn't require the workshops and development. It's... Um, and Laura Lee will probably kill me for saying this because she doesn't like me to say this, but um, you can think of it as more of just, uh, you know, turning a crank, so to speak. So we just plug in um, the new updated data and then run the model um, as is. So if all the data is in um, by late spring 2023, um, there is hopes that we could have it um, completed and reviewed by the end of 2023, but um, I'm not going to say that that is a definite because um, since we do have the gap in 2020 data, um, if there are issues that come up in that, that'll have to be addressed. But um, I can promise that we will be working diligently on it, and um, we would love to get it done by the end of 2023. And at that point, we would um, provide that uh, assessment report to the commission, and then it's in y'all's wheelhouse as far as if you deem management action is needed or not. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the director? If not, I Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so on March 29th and 30th of 2022, Steve Vanderkoy with the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission and Dr. Michael Dance and Dr. Steve Midway with Louisiana State University hosted a symposium entitled Floundering Around, uh, evaluating a declining species in the southeast United States. Um, it was a great opportunity to get representatives from management and researchers together all in one room. Um, the purpose of the symposium was to bring researchers, managers together to discuss declining founder populations um, from North Carolina through the Texas coast. The symposium was divided into several sections that are outlined in your memo. And I'll go into some greater detail um, on that for you today. Um, and there's definitely some interesting information that came from several of those talks, and I'll highlight some of those. Um, the Life History and Population Dynamic session featured 14 presentations from topics ranging from the stock assessment of Southern Flounder in the South Atlantic given by NCDMF stock assessment lead, Laura Lee. And that ranged to potential impacts to declining populations due to changing environmental conditions. A presentation on a stock assessment of Southern Flounder in Alabama waters was provided by Dr. Sean Powers of the University of South Alabama. This assessment included harvest data from commercial gillnet and gig fisheries, as well as recreational fishery data. Um, however, there are no discard estimates included in this particular stock assessment. The assessment indicated that the southern flounder stock in Alabama was not overfished, but was undergoing overfishing in 2017. Since the completion of this assessment, Alabama regulations have been updated to include an increase in minimum size from 12 inches to 14 inches, uh, a bag limit change for the recreational fishery from 10 fish down to 5 fish per person per day, and a new commercial limit of 40 fish per person from unlimited catch. In addition, Alabama closed both the recreational and commercial fishery from November 1 through November 30th. 
These closure dates are important as other Gulf states, Texas and Florida included, have adopted similar closure dates. According to David Smith with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, who presented on characterizing the Louisiana Southern Flounder Fishery um, during the time he worked there, angler informed management of a declining population. In Gulf waters, October and November coincides uh, with the peak timing in recreational harvests in that state. And as a result of declining populations in Louisiana, rec recreational anglers indicated strong levels of support for various regulation scenarios that increased limitations on their fishery. Environmental conditions were discussed and presented by several participants. Dr. Troy Farmer of Clemson University discussed modeling work that is focused on impacts of wind direction, wind duration, river flow, and winter duration on recruitment of southern flounder in the state of Alabama. He indicated easterly or westerly longshore winds in the Gulf, high river discharge, and, and intermediate winter temperatures and duration improves recruitment in Alabama. Declines in recruitment in Alabama may be attributed, attributed to weak westerly or easterly winds, strong southerly winds, low river discharge, and short winter durations in recent years. There was also a lot of discussion about environmental sex determination with Dr. Godwin from NC State University, and he discussed how XY chromosome males are always male fish, whereas XX chromosome fish may become male or female fish depending on temperatures during settlement. 23 degrees Celsius produce the highest proportion of females, and those temps below or above 20 degree, 23 degrees Celsius produced more males in the population. These temperatures impact fish around 35 to 65 millimeters, usually from March through June at settlement. The aquaculture and genetic session featured three presentations on stock enhancement efforts in Texas, South Carolina, and Alabama, with a fourth and final presentation on environmental sex determination in Southern Flounder, implications for aquaculture and stock, en stock enhancement. This was a very interesting group of talks. Paul Kaysan provided interesting information on stocking efforts in Texas. Since 2006, Texas has made significant advances in rearing southern flounder. To date, 17 year, years or so, they've released almost 600,000 southern flounder. And in comparison to the same time frame, they've released 15 million red drum and 8 million spotted sea trout. Stocking has ranged from 450 fish to 115,000 fish in a year. There are certainly difficulties in rearing southern flounder as it's necessary to have climate controlled facilities with independent tanks having their own temperature controls. Salinity control is also very important. They're having pigment issues and sex ratio issues likely from temperature fluctuations. And they've, they have identified 18 degrees Celsius given a one to one sex ratio. But at that temp, they have very slow growth rate during the rearing process. Anecdotally, they have observed some smaller fish being more productive than larger fish. And they have not seen an increase in fecundity in larger fish from the hatchery. In addition, Max Westendorf with Alabama Marine Resources Division gave a talk about their efforts in stocking. They have 26,000 square foot facility for broodstock maturation and spawning. They have algae and live food production, egg incubation, larval rearing, and juvenile holding. And in addition, they have 30.2 acre ponds and a greenhouse facility that contains recirculating tank systems and two seawater pipelines. They have released 12,000 fish in 2020. 35,000 fish in 2021 and 118,000 fish in 2022. All their fish are released from boats into appropriate habitats. And like Texas, they are having issues with pigmentation. The sex ratios are unknown as they're being released prior to the 35 to 65 millimeter window of determination. And it's important to note that for Texas and Alabama, there is no information on post-release survival. So it's not possible at this time to determine how effective these efforts actually are. Aaron Watson from South Carolina DNR provided information on South Carolina efforts to uh, follow their responsible approach guidelines and adhere to strict internal policies that ensure health and well being of the resource. They're planning and implementing needed infrastructure renovations for southern flounder production at the Marine Resource Research Institute in Charleston. 
and the Waddell Mariculture Center in Bluffton. Broodstock collection, coordination of genetic sample collection along southeastern states, and to be the beginning of genetic marker panel and experience to begin captive rearing husbandry and spawning protocols is underway. North Carolina is aiding in these efforts. In the fall of 2021, North Carolina DMF staff collected genetic samples from large migrating uh, offshore females. In the spring and summer, we're already collecting fin clips for fish from post settlement. The session concluded with discussion provided by Dr. Bor Borski from NC State on implications for aquaculture and stock enhancement. Dr. Borski discussed environmental sex determination like mentioned previously. And they've developed a technique that produces an all-female population of southern flounder. Additionally, they have observed increased sex skewing in various color tanks. So, for example, fish raised in blue tanks produce more cortisol and thus produce more males. Very interesting. Whereas gray and black tanks produce closer to the 50-50 sex ratio. So everyone at the, the symposium got a good chuckle about the info presented about the blue tanks as many hatcheries use blue tanks as a very common color for tanks. Uh, and obviously for southern flounder can impact the sex ratios of the species. Um, the movement and migration session featured eight presentations outlining research in Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, and North Carolina waters. These three presentations were from North Carolina researchers, including Dr. Scharf, Caitlin McGarrigal at ECU, and Shelby White with the division. These three presentations included current and past research funded by the Coastal Recreational Fishing License, as well as the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund. Presentations from Alabama indicated a couple fish returned to the estuary were tagged after several months at large. Work presented on um, by Caitlin McGarrigal with ECU. Um, showed that a couple of fish that they acoustically tagged returned to Core Sound after a potential spawning run offshore as well. Mississippi researchers are undertaking a study uh, telemetry tagging southern flounder Mississippi Sound and are seeing emigration from September through December, similar to most other states. Landis Randall with Texas A&M Galveston presented info showing immigration from November through December for fish tagged in Galveston Bay. This is interesting for Gulf states as a timing of immigration peaks with fishing pressures during the fall months down there. And interestingly, South Carolina presented some efforts where they tagged 118 southern flounder greater than 275 millimeters and found that 88% of those fish stayed in the Ashley River and 12% were moving towards ocean waters. They raised the possibility of skip spawning or the potential for spawning in the estuary, though no eggs or larval fish have been collected there. The symposium finished with a synthesis session that was comprised of four small groups, including a management and research group for both the Gulf and Atlantic states. Each group debated a series of questions and provided a summary to the larger body to facilitate discussion and highlight the many research and management questions that are common among the various states. Some of the key points from the symposium are increased future collaboration between South Atlantic and Gulf state researchers and agencies. A change in environment, including increasing water temperatures will likely impact Southern flounder and managers should be prepared to adapt to this. Management of Southern flounder is complex and encompasses a broad range of knowledge, including biology, ecology, environmental science and human dimensions. Common questions across the species range include spawning locations and post-spawning movements, information on the dynamics of male southern flounder, latitudinal variation in histology, and environmental influences of temperature on sex ratios. The agenda abstracts for each of these presentations and the audio for the four sessions can be found on the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission website. And video of the sessions is available on the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission YouTube channel. And I would, uh, uh, you know, encourage all of you to go and, and view those. It's very interesting information. And thank you for allowing me time to provide this update. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions of Mike. All right, Mike, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Madam Director. Thank you, Mike. So next we want to uh, give you a um, blue catfish update. It's been a, a popular topic of discussion here with the commission. And um, we also had a 
uh, email from a, a commercial fisherman up in the Albemarle Sound area regarding uh, small electrofishing uh, commercial fishery, which is a small permitted fishery, and they're going to talk about that as well in here. So we just wanted to bring you some some more information. Uh, Janelle Johnson is going to uh, be giving you this uh, overview on blue catfish. This is Janelle's first opportunity to present to the commission uh, since she joined the division last August uh, as our blue crab biologist. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, introduce her. Uh, in addition to blue crabs, uh, Janelle leads the fish out sampling program up in the Elizabeth City office. She earned her master's degree in marine biology from the College of Charleston. Her research focused on reducing diamond bacteria and mortality in the South Carolina blue crab fishery. And she worked uh, for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, performing inshore fishery independent monitoring research and working on many uh, different types of projects uh, and species uh, on small tooth sawfish, juvenile tarpon, snook. Uh, she did some water quality work and also participated in the offshore sea map survey. So we're happy to have uh, Janelle on board at the Division of Marine Fisheries and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you very much for that great introduction. Good Hold that up a little closer to you if you would. Yes, sir. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present the commission with information regarding blue catfish. I'm Janelle Johnson, as already mentioned, and I am a biologist with the fisheries management section of the division. A memo corresponding to this information is available in your briefing materials. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the life history of blue catfish, then we'll go over some of the division's data. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'm going to talk about some research out of the Chesapeake Bay that may help guide North Carolina as we move forward with this invasive species issue. Topics I will cover include biological research, management goals and strategies, a new commercial fishery in Virginia, and an ongoing study on the economic and social issues facing the development of this fishery in Virginia. Blue catfish life history varies by region and environmental and ecological conditions. In general, blue catfish are thought to live between nine and 10 years. However, in the Chesapeake Bay and in Lake Norman, blue catfish have been aged over 25 years. In 2010, in the Albemarle Sound, before the blue catfish population became what it is today, we had nine and 10 year old fish. Thus, it is likely that in the Albemarle Sound, we have fish living over 20 years as well. Blue catfish mature between four and seven years, and females produce between two and 4,000 eggs per pound of body weight. So a 10 pound fish can produce over 20,000 eggs. They typically spawn between May and June in low salinity waters with little turbulence, and males guard the nest to increase the survival of the offspring. They are tolerant of poor water quality with high nutrient levels, varying salinity levels, and prolonged periods with limited prey availability. Blue catfish are native to the Ohio, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers, and they were introduced to areas outside of their natural range, such as Lake Norman, the PD River system, and the James River in Virginia in the 60s and 70s. This map is from the United States Geological Survey's non-indigenous aquatic species database, and it shows the blue catfish native range in brown and their introduced range in maroon. Blue catfish were introduced to waters outside of their natural range to enhance local fisheries, and they have since spread through range expansions and anglers releasing them into different waterways. It is also believed that blue catfish escape from fish farms during flooding events. And although blue catfish have been collected in North Carolina's coastal waters for quite some time, in recent years their populations have increased and expanded. And this is evidenced in our Albemarle Sound Independent Gillnet Survey. So in this figure, you will see year on the x-axis. On the y-axis to the left and represented by blue bars is the total number of cat, blue catfish caught. And on the y-axis to the right and represented by the orange line is the relative abundance. Blue catfish have been present in the Albemarle Sound since at least the 90s, um, but it is more recent years that their populations have truly expanded to be captured in the survey to a large degree. Commercial landings also appear to be increasing. On this figure, year is again on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is pounds of commercial landings of all catfish species. Um, in blue is the landings from the Albemarle Sound and its tributaries, and in orange is the rest of North Carolina. As you can see, landings from the Albemarle Sound have really driven catfish landings throughout the state. And based on the division's fish house sampling, it is believed that the landings that are high in the 90s were driven by channel and white catfish, while as the landings that are high in recent years are being driven by blue catfish landings. Catfish are mostly landed using hoop and fike nets, 
hound nets, and gill nets. The use of trot lines has increased recently, and the use of fish pots has declined. Blue catfish are also popular in the recreational sector, being targeted as a sport fishery, a subsistence fishery, and a trophy fishery. There are groups throughout coastal North Carolina that hold monthly tournaments targeting large catfish. And some charter captains in the Albemarle Sound have begun targeting blue catfish with some of their clients. Blue catfish populations are also increasing in the Chesapeake Bay, which has led to increased research from that area, primarily out of Virginia. And one important area of research for any invasive species is diet content. In the Chesapeake Bay, blue catfish were found to consume around 2 to 5% of their body weight per day. The most common prey item in the diet includes is the invasive Asian clam. Other species that were common that are important include white perch, gizzard shad, blue crab, American eel, and threadfin shad. American shad and river herring were also encountered, but to a much lesser degree, which is thought to be due to low population levels. One study found evidence of Atlantic sturgeon and striped bass to be present in blue catfish diets, but this was at very low proportions. What you'll notice here is that species that are most common in blue catfish diet are most common in the system, whereas species that are less frequently encountered are not typically common and are only present seasonally. In our independent gillnet survey in the Albemarle Sound, in recent months, our technicians have been seeing mostly rangia clams followed by white perch. Other prey items include Atlantic menhaden, gizzard shad, river herring, and American shad. Another area of research in the Chesapeake Bay is salinity tolerance. In the Chesapeake Bay, blue catfish have been caught in salinities up to 22 parts per thousand. As a reference, full salinity seawater is 35 parts per thousand. And while blue catfish cannot remain in these high salinity waters for prolonged periods of time, their ability to travel through them has allowed them to spread through many Chesapeake Bay tributaries. Another area of research in Chesapeake Bay was abundance, and in some areas they have very large populations. For instance, in the tidal James and Rappahannock rivers, blue catfish outweighed all other fish species caught in one study and were estimated to comprise up to 75% of the total fish biomass. In the James River, in a seven and a half mile study area, it was estimated that there were 1.6 million blue catfish, which is about 40 catfish per linear foot of river. Another area of research in the Chesapeake Bay is impacts to native species. And in some areas, white catfish populations have declined as blue catfish populations have increased and expanded. One study found that consumption of blue crabs was so high that they um, suggested doing a population impact study on blue crabs. And while American shad and river herring were not seen to a large degree in diet studies, researchers are concerned that due to large population sizes and high feeding rates, that blue catfish could impact the recovery of these species. But the extent to which that may be true is unknown. The popularity of blue catfish as a sport and trophy fishery has led to competing management objectives. Many recreational fishers do not want to see commercial fishing increase in the Chesapeake Bay, and those targeting trophy catfish want to continue to do so. This has led to a maximum size limit in Virginia's Chesapeake Bay waters. But imposing maximum size limits on an invasive species to promote trophy fisheries hinders the work of conservation groups and leads to confusing messages to the public on how to deal with invasive species. There is also concern on the potential desire to manage the commercial fishery as a sustainable fishery without keeping population control and eradication as a goal. And this has led to different harvest regulations in the Chesapeake Bay. In Maryland, there are no regulations on catfish and new harvest opportunities have been brought to the table in the form of opening tidal, tidal waters to jug lines and offering a cheap uh, commercial trout line in tidal waters. In Virginia, as I mentioned, there is a maximum size limit of one fish over 32 inches that may be kept in both the commercial and recreational sectors, but they have also created a new fishery that is benefiting a small number of commercial fishermen. Due to the issues surrounding invasive catfish in the Chesapeake Bay, the Chesapeake Bay program convened a work group which puts out a list of recommendations for managing invasive catfish. The first suggestion given by this group was to um, consistency of regulations. Additionally, they suggested that um, anglers be educated to retain or kill blue catfish rather than returning them to the water. Additionally, continued and more consistent monitoring of blue catfish populations was suggested to determine if mitigation strategies were working, to determine if blue catfish populations were expanding, and to be able to compare between systems. 
in, in areas where there are new expansions of blue catfish populations, targeted removals were suggested. And finally, increasing commercial harvest and developing new fisheries was suggested to help control catfish populations. And in Virginia, a new commercial fishery was developed using low frequency electrofishing to harvest invasive catfish. This gear is often used on biological studies on catfish. Prior to opening the fishery, a commercial fisherman in collaboration with the Virginia Commonwealth University conducted four years of research on the effectiveness and profit potential of using this gear in the commercial fishery. During that time, over 1 million invasive catfish were removed from Virginia's waters. During um, one advantage to this gear is that under the right conditions, it is highly efficient and it only stuns fish without scales. So there is virtually no bycatch. And in the reports, the researchers suggested that the initial costs of the gear were recouped quickly. Since that time, there have been modica modifications to the gear, and now an electrofishing unit and generator are estimated to cost between fifteen dollars and $20,000. There are some limitations to this gear, however. In order to support a commercial fishery, water temperatures must be between 73 and 86 degrees, and salinity is roughly between 0 0.5 and 1 part per thousand. Many areas within the Albemarle Sound rarely meet these requirements. Additionally, the, as I mentioned, it is very, very efficient and multiple chase boats are necessary to collect a large amount of the catfish that are stunned. During the initial phases of the study period, when they were using only one chase boat, only one to 20% of stunned catfish were harvested. And finally, there is a recovery period once a catfish has been shocked, after which it will be susceptible to shock again. This is on average five days, but is longer for larger fish. And this has led to the fishery being extremely limited entry with only three individual licenses being issued, one for each river system that Virginia's waters feed the Chesapeake Bay. But with opening a new fishery and increasing harvest, Chesapeake Bay found themselves in, with the need to expand the market for blue catfish. This was done through increasing consumer awareness through outreach events, research festivals, and hosting derbies. Additionally, Chesapeake Bay blue catfish were added to Monterey Bay's seafood watch report as best choice. Supply chains were increased through grocery stores such as Whole Foods, and in Maryland through state-owned institutions such as correctional facilities, schools, universities, and hospitals. As part of her PhD project at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, Shelby White, who works with the division on a part-time basis, is conducting research on the sustainable development of the blue catfish fishery in Virginia. The main goal of this project is to determine the economic viability and growth potential of this fishery. This will be done through outreach and collaboration with commercial fishers, processors, dealers, distributors, and consumers. So blue catfish are an invasive species that have the potential to negatively impact North Carolina's coastal ecosystems, but the extent to which that may occur is unknown due to a lack of directed and published research in our state. To help address this, the Commercial Fishing Resource Funding Committee, which funds various research projects relating to commercial fisheries in North Carolina, recently put out a call for proposals, which includes projects focused on blue catfish abundance and ecological impacts in the Albemarle Sound, underutilized and new gear for harvesting blue catfish, and bycatch reduction in the blue catfish fishery. While it is highly unlikely that we will ever eradicate blue catfish from our coastal waters, increasing harvest can help to control populations and potentially prevent further range expansions. However, the impacts to native species need to be closely monitored. And as is the case with the Chesapeake Bay, outreach and public education will be vital to increasing harvest and consumer demand. And this is the state record blue catfish for North Carolina. It was caught in the Roanoke River system in 2021 and weighed in at 127 pounds. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I will be happy to take any questions. Questions or comments? Commissioner Roller. Thank you so much for your presentation. Welcome to the division. Um, I have a little bit of a comment, maybe jumping on the soapbox for a little bit, but it is a question, I promise. And it is no way a criticism of your report. I think you did an excellent, thorough job. Though, I'm a little troubled by a few things with the blue catfish fishery. First of all, I'm here on the uh, North Carolina Department of uh, Health and Human Services website under the North Carolina Department of Health. and. First thing is, is blue catfish are listed as a fish, wild caught, or I should say all North Carolina catfish are listed as a fret or a, uh, um, a fish that is high in mercury with we only with uh, the recommendation is for only one 
fish or one meal of that fish per week. And it's important to note there's a lot of saltwater fish in that list as well. But what's most troubling to me is that if you look at the site-specific advisories by water body, when it comes to consumption advisories, the Albemarle Sound specifically lists, again, from another North Carolina agency, as catfish as a fish of concern in the Albemarle Sound because of uh, pollutants of dioxins. And it says, women of childbearing age and children should not eat any catfish or carp from this area until further notice. All other persons should eat no more than one meal of uh, one meal per month of catfish and carp from this area. And so when I look at this and I see our state looking at ways in which to increase harvest, increase marketing of this fish, it bothers me. Um, and I'm getting a little personal here and get on my soapbox. You know, I'm a, I'm a recent um, cancer patient and cancer survivor. I had a type of blood cancer, which has been traced to um, potentially, in no way implying that you know, eating blue catfish or any other fish cost, but to uh, exposure to environmental toxins. And I wouldn't wish what I went through upon my worst enemy. Now, that being said, when we talk about blue catfish, shouldn't we be including these potential health impacts there? Because I've seen this in a lot of fish markets, as well as Whole Foods, and I've never seen a little advisory, women of childbearing age and children should never eat. Right, so those advisories come from historic levels of dioxins. Um, I tried to get the most recent report. So the paper mill out there has to assess the dioxin levels in the fish yearly. And I tried to get a hold of the report, the most recent report, but one was unable to do so. However, um, my boss, Charlton, as you know, uh, he was in touch with them a few years ago, and they said that the recent reports that they've been getting, the dioxin levels are way below the values that are con the con consumption level advisories. Now, the reason that they do not take them off the list is because on very rare occasions, they have a fish that comes up with levels over the consumption advisory level. But they said it was very rare occasions. Thank you. But, you know, as this is a specific fish in this area, I do think it would be helpful to include that information for the public to know. I was just going to add also, um, so a couple of years ago, we had uh, somebody call us up and ask us that uh, same question. They were at the Roanoke River boat ramp, and it's really the, the Roanoke River, um, that south side uh, down to Columbia where the docks and um, advisory is relative to. So they do sample from there, um, white catfish, channel catfish, blue catfish, carp. Uh, if you'll notice that um, advisory is kind of a broad general catfish and carp. Um, and again, um, that advisory has been up since 2001. The levels, the levels of dioxins in the blue catfish now are actually below what the, the requires a DHHS um, advisory. Uh, but because it's a mixed catfish, carp, and um, the comment was it's, it's been in place for so long there at the boat ramp that they just have not actually remove that advisory for you know for those several reasons i think mainly because it's also lumped in with several fish so but I, I that is a concern as you noted with with many many species in north carolina have you know high levels of, of mercury that um warning so okay commissioner posey well thank you again for a wonderful report i'm curious is electroshocking effect eels that is a great question um according to the reports from virginia um, they said no other species were affected. Um, speaking with one of my technicians, he was there. He said he had, he, not in that, not in Virginia, he was in a different low frequency electric fishing. He said he did see some eels come to the, to the surface. Okay. Other questions, comments? I got a couple. Is, is this invasive issue a North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland issue, or is it going to other states? Oh, it's in a lot of other states. Okay. And they've got the same amount of concern, correct? And is, it's probably a question for the Colonel, is um, electro fishing allowed in the commercial industry? In that area, no. We have one area that in the rule book that would allow it, but in the Albemarle Sound, no. Okay, anything else? Uh, Commissioner Roller. Um, we have several other invasive species in the Roanoke River, isn't that true? I mean, largemouth bass aren't native to North Carolina. That is true. Yeah. 
So, you know, I just find it interesting. There's been a lot of discussions in Maryland, Virginia, in the fishing industry about snakeheads, right, which are found up in, in Maryland. And they'll probably find their way here eventually. But the big discussion up there is people say, we got to get rid of this invasive. But they also have an invasive, in quotes, blue catfish that are from the Mississippi River Valley, largemouth bass, which are not found in the mid-Atlantic tidal basins, as well as black crappie, smallmouth bass at some of those rivers. They're not native. So a lot of these fish we actually manage as native fish are invasive. So I just want to point that out because it's kind of interesting. It is definitely true. Um, I think one of the biggest differences is the, the level of reproduction and just the way that these populations have just exploded and the impacts that, that blue catfish have the potential to have on our native species particularly our juveniles. Thank you. All right. Mr. Blanton. I think it's interesting that um, the comments made towards you so, so far have kind of been toward negative of, of uh, sort of increasing this fishery and, and, and talking about what we can do to sort of mitigate the factors that these catfish have created over the past five years, seven years, which you can see on the graph there that it ex exploded. Um, you know, I work on the Almall Sound crabbing uh, probably 150 trips a year, 125. You know, the crabbing seasons are short. Um, and I can I can tell you for for a fact that these fish are annihilating the crabs. I can see it and they go into pots, they're going into peeler pots. They, I mean, just absolutely slaughtering the soft crabs when they shed. What's interesting to me is that in the 33 years that Maryland, Virginia has been conducting the blue crab survey, it's the lowest abundance they've ever seen. But they don't have correlating factors to things like invasive species or anything like that to, to, to sort of... Um, try to understand why that blue crab population is going down because they've actually done some really good work towards seagrasses, stuff like that, that should be bringing these crabs back up to pretty abundant levels based on habitat work alone. What's interesting is if you go look at some of the data, the most abundant fish in these systems nowadays are blue catfish. So in my mind of common sense suggests that when you have such a population of something that hasn't been there very long in that high of abundance, um, that it's having some detrimental effect and that it should probably be looked at and favored to the people that can actually help take some of these fish out of the system. Now, there's various ways we can go about doing that. We can you know, asked to be put on the, just the blue crab task force that they have in the Chesapeake Bay, send biologists up there to start working with them. We can fund studies. We can look at sustainable ways of doing things to get rid of these things as much as possible. We can look at marketing and expanding marketing. People have eaten millions of pounds of stuff out of the Albemarle Sound, and I ain't never heard of one that has gotten sick off of anything. Now, maybe if they had mishandled that product, they could have potentially gotten sick of it in, in one one off instance. But there, you know, is is hundreds of thousands of pounds of crab meat picked out of there. Baskets upon basket of crab picked picked up from North Carolina and sent up north. There has been millions of pounds of catfish harvested over the last 10 years, and I ain't heard of one one issue with health. So I, I, I don't know that that's a big factor. What I would be interested in is to see the division seek ways to join this conversation that's been going on in the Chesapeake Bay to, to help study what the impacts are, what these fish are doing to these native species when they move in and out. So, so far as river heron, which are actually have been entertained to be put on the endangered species list. OK, so to, 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 to sit here and say that these fish are, oh, well, they're just there. They're kind of like a largemouth bass, not even close. These fish school heavily. They produce massively. They are very good at it. 
I can tell you right now that we have done ourselves a disservice by not doing as much as we can to take these fish out because the traditional fisheries are suffering. The blue, cat, the blue crab fishery, for one, I believe wholeheartedly has suffered tremendously to these fish. So I think it is our duty as a commission, the Marine Fisheries Commission charged with the coastal and joint waters and, and, and the, and the uh, management of those species and those waters that we, we have jurisdiction under is to look into this heavily, get heavily involved in this and to try to be productive in the conversation that's going on in other places so that we can actually be productive with our commission and our management of our species instead of overlooking the factors that people were trying to describe to you that are big factors nowadays against these species that we're trying to bring back and manage. I have actually seen with my own eyes a blue catfish spit heron out of its mouth, blue crabs out of its mouth, flounder out of its mouth after harvest, sitting in the totes where they're, they're sitting there gagging for, gasping for air. I'm just telling you, these things eat. They're going to eat, they're opportunistic. They eat 5% of their body weight every day, up to. That is a lot of, uh, that is a lot of food, man. Over a, over an abundant species, so I encourage the division, this commission, to get behind this. I I, I encourage work group or some or, or something put together by the division to come back with with more ways to, for us to get involved and how we can help. I encourage those out there listening that have been a part of the process of of the commercial fishing resource fund to diligently take what we have put out and put something together to bring back and make this um, a reality that we can look at holistically because and there is no i don't feel like there is a, a reasonable argument against it at all thank you mr chairman Thank you, Commissioner Blanton. Any other comments? Commissioner Henderson. Um, one, uh, Director Rawls and, and Jenny, thank you for been digging into that. I, the reason I made the request, uh, I guess, at the last meeting that we elevated is I continued uh, for several meetings to hear Commissioner Blanton sort of raising a flag, and we'd go on, and then we'd raise a flag again, and we'd go on. And it's probably time to stop talking about it and take it into this this if you follow the trend uh, you know we've we've heard the sort of the canary in the coal mine on this but it this this species has the biological capacity or so it seems until you tell me it doesn't it, it seems that it has a biological capacity to completely disrupt one of our significant water bodies and and it is invasive and you know, I'm not sitting here to say I, I know what the answer is, but I do think that you know I, we don't have a you know specific uh, management plan on it. Uh, we see what Virginia, some of the things Virginia is doing, but I would echo Commissioner Blanton that we we need to take get some task, you know, some some group to focus on what are the specific ways that we can get ahead of the curve if we're, we're behind it now. So what can we do to actually make sure that we don't look around here 10 years from now and go and have folks look at us now like folks look at folks this commission in years past on Flounder and go, well, what the hell were they thinking? Didn't they see these, these fish coming in? And, and when, they're, when they are coming in with that, with the level of growth and abundance and, and with their biological capacity to... Uh, uh, to to grow and and live long. I mean, we're not talking about you know a, a species that lives three years and is out. You know, this is you know you got obviously you said twenty five years. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I would uh, encourage the division to uh, let's take some specific actions toward uh, coming back with recommendations on what what are the op reasonable options to uh, to whether it's increase the 
the uh, blue catfish fishery. Uh, I, I think that's um, short. That's the only thing I can think of right now that would ultimately uh, retard the the uh, the growth and the damage that that, that could happen if it, if they continue. If this chart trend line continues, obviously it's going to be incredibly devastating, and we don't need to wait till it's too late. So, but thank you for bringing it up, and let's. I, th I think this is a good next step. But I'm not sure. I'll leave it to y'all to figure out what to move forward, but let's move forward. Okay, thank you. Could Commissioner I, Posey. Um, I, I'd like to just jump off of those comments and sort of a broader comment. Um, I've been involved in several introduced species studies over the years. And over the past 10, 20 years, we have received, we have a number of introduced species. These larger ones are the obvious ones. Equally important are the many smaller ones at the base of the food chain. Um, you look at the communities in the mud, no one cares about mud, but that's what our juvenile fish, juvenile crabs, juvenile shrimp are eating. We're seeing some major species changes, including a number of introduced species. An obvious one down south where we are is that red algae, the gracilaria that we see. It's what we can do in the Albemarle Sound. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yes. I just wanted to reply to um, Commissioner Hendrickson's comments about, you know, what we can do. You know, there's there's little we can do, obviously, to eradicate this, this species now, but we have um, promoted um, trot line uh, fishery up there, which a lot of people are using and is a very effective gear for uh, blue catfish. Um, we didn't have to do any rule changes for that. That's a legal gear anyway, but um, you know, um, gill net is a very effective gear as well for catfish, but we have issues with, you know, you know, trying to conserve flounder. So the flounder gill net season is very small, same thing for striped bass. So we have actually started allowing um, to use a large mesh gill net as a strike net. So as Commissioner Blanton mentioned, you know, at certain times of the year, catfish school, um, just like menhaden or striped bass or anything else, and, and the fishermen can actually ride around and um, look at for the schools on their depth finder and use that strike net, uh, immediately retrieve it. You know, it's not something that you have to leave overnight that's gonna have striped bass discards when striped bass season's closed. Um, so we certainly are trying to give every opportunity for the commercial fishermen to harvest um, these these fish, uh, which is I think really the the biggest thing that we can do now, and again to promote the um, just to to promote the um, it is actually on the in in Chesapeake Bay they have ha actually gotten blue catfish put on the Monterey Bay seafood thing. You may have mentioned that, but um, so providing that they are um, you know low in in levels, so that's 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 some of the things that we're already doing. Um, so thank you. Anything else? Uh, Madam Director, I think you've heard a consensus from this um, commission that this is an issue that we do need to address, maybe in concert with our friends in Virginia and with wildlife and see if we can. I know we can't eradicate it, but we can probably hopefully suppress the, the stock levels. So look forward to future.
Thank you. Okay, let's get back to our seats. Okay, Madam Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's see. Um, next is our uh, chip implementation. So I'm going to ask Jacob Boyd to come up and provide an update on that. Thank you again, Director Rawls and Chairman Bizzle. Long time no see. It's good to see everybody again. Uh, so today I will also be discussing some important updates on the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan since your last meeting, uh, specifically the 2021 CHIP Amendment. Since your last meeting, staff began drafting an initial work plan to aid in prioritizing the 49 recommended actions um, in the amendment, delegating lead staff for specific actions and establishing timelines for steps to achieve those. Staff have planned a CHIP implementation kickoff meeting for June 21st with the CHIP steering committee, the CHIP team, division directors, and department leadership, including Secretary Bowser, uh, to keep everyone informed on actions needed overall, and particularly this year, progress to date, progress to date, engagement of other divisions to actively work on implementation actions and discuss how to address current and or emerging habitat issues. Habitat Enhancement hired a new coastal habitat biologist, Charlie Deaton, who, who began working in the Moorhead City office this week. He comes to us from the Coastal Reserve Program in Beaufort. We also have an intern starting this week at the Washington office who will be assisting Jimmy Harrison with low salinity SAV surveys in the Pamlico River system. They are seeing lots of grass so far this year. And uh, just to give a shout out to Casey Knight, somewhere here that this was her replacement and um, big shoes to fill with Casey and uh, we're excited with Casey's new opportunities in fisheries management. The division and AppMet work collaboratively with a core team of NGOs to form a public private partnership, which we are referring to as the SECI, the Stakeholder Engagement and Coastal Habitats Initiative, because public private partnership is very hard to say over and over. Uh, as a reminder, this was a recommendation from the 2021 CHIP amendment and was included in all three commissions motions to approve the amendment stating further encourage that all avenues to obtain federal, state, local and private funds to implement the actions in the plan be pursued, including forming the pu private public partnership. See, it's, it can, it's a, doesn't come off the tongue well, that the plan recommends. The purpose of the SECI is to A, strategically engage a diverse group of stakeholders to assist with developing and implementing recommendations to improve water quality, B, secure stakeholder and decision maker support for the actions, and C, a SECI core team will facilitate productive, efficient, and action-oriented engagement of diverse stakeholders Based upon their past work with DEQ on helping to engage public involvement for the CHIP, the initial private sector members of the core team include staff from Pew and the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Both organizations have committed staff time to help form an effective SECI. Additional private sector members that can help with the SECI facilitation process will be recruited. The core team is planning to hold a water quality summit on October 12th to build momentum for water quality actions among a wider public audience, provide a forum for good ideas to emerge on how to implement CHIP recommendations with tangible, measurable, and meaningful actions, coordinate an inclusive stakeholder work group that provides opportunities for diverse, action-oriented, and innovative stakeholder participation, and provide specific actions such as expanded cost share or watershed management that stakeholders can embrace to begin implementing after the summit. There were several recommendations associated with improving water quality to levels that will sustain SAV and allow it to return to where there, has, there have been losses. The Division of Water Resources staff is the lead on implementing new water quality standards. 
To assist with this, APNEP funded research by Nathan Hall, the Institute of Marine Science, to evaluate water quality, water clarity metrics by calibrating a bio-optical model and use that to determine chlorophyll A and turbidity targets needed to allow adequate light penetration. Results from that chlorophyll A and turbidity standards need to be lower in high salinity waters. More data are needed to refine the estimates in low salinity waters due to high color dissolved organic matter and limited data. Data are also limited in the vicinity of the Outer Bank seagrass beds. DWR and the Seagrass Advisory Committee will use this information to continue work on drafting a nutrient criteria development plan for the Albemarle Sound. Progress has been made on coastal habitat assessments. SAV delineations were complete for the coast based on 2020 and 2021 aerial photographs. High salinity SAV field monitoring is focused in, on core sound in May and June. The work is being done by the SAV partnership consisting of APNEP, DMF, university researchers, and retired scientists. The plan is to rotate annually to a different water body rather than doing the entire coast at once due to logistics and costs. The shellfish mapping program is repeating mapping and monitoring at sentinel sites along the coast using drones to map intertidal strata, which is greatly increasing efficiency and accuracy. And finally, staff have been working on incorporating the 2021 CHIP amendment recommendations into existing plans, existing programs, and ongoing efforts to prioritize actions for coastal habitats that will increase climate resilience and carbon sequestration and align with the 2020 North Carolina Climate Risk and Resilience Plan and the 2020 Natural Working Lands Action Plan. To accomplish this, staff are collaborating with multiple agencies and organizations on several projects, including the Division of Coastal Management and the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency and the North Carolina Flood Resiliency Blueprint to increase coastal community and ecosystem resilience. We are trying to get the most bang for our buck by getting existing programs to include check recommendations and get credit for work already being completed. And that concludes my report, Chairman Bizzle. Questions? Mr. Posey. I just like to commend staff um, on the great work they're doing and getting this going. Um, there are a lot of recommendations. I think they're fairly exciting, particularly the, the PPP. Um, I think has a lot of opportunities that they can do things that a state agency can't. Thank you. Yeah. Other? All right, Jacob, thanks for your report. Thanks. Madam Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The last thing I want to do uh, in the director's report is uh, recognize John Batherson, who um, works with DEQ General Counsel, and John is retiring, and this will be his uh, last meeting with us. And John, when did you start with DEQ? 2018. 2018, yeah. So he, he's been with us for quite a few years, and, and most of you will also remember that he's not only served as counsel for Division of Marine Fisheries, uh, including uh, Marine Patrol, but he's also served as the interim director for a time period after Steve Murphy retired, and he enjoyed that so much. Um, and and we, we really just want to thank John for all of his hard work. It's been a pleasure uh, working with him, and, and we really do uh, wish him the best in his retirement. John, thank you so much for everything. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, and I know you're glad of that. <laughs> thank you, Madam Director. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Let's move on into our stock assessment 101. CJ Schlick. So we're going to have a Schlick report, huh? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. That was kind of a bad one. <laughs> Turn it off and turn it back on. Mm, that'll take too long. I think we'll just skip. 
I didn't realize at first that you were using the mouse, Laura, and I was wondering what the three of y'all were going to do. Was y'all going to meditate that <laughs> thing to work or what was going on? I just realized that. Uh, interpretive games. Interpretive games. <laughs> Well, Chairman, we got you faster internet and slower computers. <laughs> All right. That should go. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. CJ Schlick with the Division of Marine Fisheries and the new stock assessment scientist on staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My presentation is going to cover just some of the general information about stock assessments specifying the type of data that we use to go into the stock assessments, the considerations that we take into account when we're discussing the models, and the types of tools that can be developed from the stock assessments used for management. Before digging into the stock assessments, there are a few terms that will commonly be used in this presentation that are important to define as they are used in stock assessments. The unit stock is a fish stock of group of fish of the same species that live in the same geographical area and mix enough to breed with each other when mature. Ideally, the unit stock is the same as the biological stock. However, fish populations do not adhere to political boundaries. So this unit stock may be defined by an agency or um, local, um, agency or organization responsible for the management. The natural mortality rate is a rate at which fish are removed from the population due to any cause other than fishing and is denoted by a capital M. Fishing mortality is the rate of fish being removed due to fishing activities. And recruitment is the addition of individuals to the stock through reproductive means. But I do want to note that recruitment is based on the definition of the unit stock. And many times recruitment is the fish as they are recruited to the fishery rather than young of the year. Fish stocks change over time due to mortality, individual growth, and reproduction. And all of these rates are completely dependent on environmental variables, such as temperature, habitat availability, prey availability, and others. Because of this, we do need to assess the environmental conditions along with the fish stock to see the change through time with or without fishing activities to see how the fish stocks are doing. A stock assessment is the process of compiling and evaluating the data, analyzing and interpreting the results, then reviewing and presenting the demographic information for determining the effects of fishing on fish populations. In fisheries, determining stock status means estimating one or more biological characteristics, such as abundance or biomass, and comparing that estimated value to a reference value of desired um, conditions. Stock assessments are the primary tools used by managers to assist in determining the status of the stocks and developing appropriate management measures to ensure the long-term viability of the stocks. The formal process of stock assessments for the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries consists of a series of workshops, including a formal external peer-reviewed process. So the stock assessments can give us information about how many fish are in the stock, whether or not the stock is sustainable, how many fish can be removed through fishing activities and remain sustainable, and how might future abundance and the catch be affected by various management activities. I do want to stress that our current conditions are always compared to reference values of a defined desirable stock. The stock assessment steps are simple, but not simplified. And what I mean by there are three main steps. You have your data collection, the development of the assessment model, and then the tools that are developed through the model use. The data types that go into a model are termed the ABCs by NOAA fisheries, by NOAA fisheries. And these are the abundance or the relative index of this population size, the biology, so the additional information about the fish, such as length at age, growth, maturity, migration, and you have catch or the actual fisheries and what's coming out of the population. The basic data needs needed from these models are your migration and your movement of the fish, your landings and harvest, including bycatch and discards, your surveys and indices to give you an idea of what the population size is without management strategies, your natural mortality rates, your growth, and your maturity. 
These data needs are completed through four primary data sources. Your fisheries dependent are your commercial and recreational fisheries. Your fisheries independent are the surveys conducted by the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries and other agencies throughout the region. Your biological data can be pulled from these data sources. However, these are the additional data other than catch, such as length at age, migrate, um, length at age, genetics, diet, and things like that. And we have additional tagging studies that give more information on migration and mortality. So when we start thinking of the stocks, an uh, analogy that is commonly used in stock assessments is to think of a stock like your bank account. You have your bank account at time one, you have an X amount of income coming in, X amount of expenses going out, and you can estimate your uh, bank account at time two. Stocks work the same way, where recruitment is your income, your mortality is your expenses. However, with fish stocks, this is a little more difficult because your bank account has potentially unlimited growth. Stocks do not, so think of them more like a piggy bank. At some point in time, the piggy bank is not going to be able to hold any more coins. The stocks are the same way, and this is the carrying capacity of the environment. It is just as impacted by environmental variables as the stock itself, since prey availability, habitat availability, and other in conditions can change the carrying capacity. So all of this has to be taken into account in stock assessments. However, because it is impacted by um, environmental variables, your carrying capacity of the environment also changes from year to year. So in stock assessments, we capture all of this through multitude of different models that can be used. All of the equations you see on the screen are mathematical models that are used in stock assessments. I do want to note that George E.P. Box stated very plainly, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And while this is completely true, his meaning was that models are a simplified representation of a complex process. It is impossible to characterize all of the variables that need to be taken into account. However, we can put in enough information to get to the point that we want to look into. So the models that we use can vary in complexity. A very simple model would be your index only or your trend analysis. And with more available information, you can go into more complex models, such as fully integrated models or even multi-species models. The type of model that you pick for a stock assessment is going to vary or is going to depend completely on your available data. Not only how much data are available, but the quality and the relevance of the data. You can have amazing data set with a great time series on the wrong species. It's not going to do anything for your model. Similarly, you can have an amazing data set on your species, but it's only a few years, still not going to be useful to your model. So all of this has got to be taken into account. And all of this incorporation will determine your confidence in your model. I do want to note there are a variety of software programs that we use in these models that you commonly hear. Stock synthesis is the most commonly used at the Division of Marine Fisheries, but you'll also hear ASAP or the Beaufort model. All of these are the statistical package that is running the same mathematical equations. So essentially, it's just a different computer program doing the same thing. A few of the programs have a few additional bells and whistles, but most of the programs still have the same basic mathematics underneath. A few important considerations when developing the model are your unit stock. How big is it? How small is it? And are you incorporating the entire unit or do you have to take migration into account? Are all removals included? So is there a major fishery source, bycatch, discards, or other taken into account? Are there other important data sources available and included? Is the selected model appropriate for the available data? So are the mathematics you're using actually going to give you the information that you need at the end? Once the model is developed, there are several model outputs that can be developed, but a few of the common goals are predicted values, your fishing mortality, and your population size, which are always, in ref are always developed to reference points. The reference points used by the Division of Marine Fisheries are the management reference points or the targets and the biological reference points or termed the thresholds. And these are always a point that indicate the desired stock state or the boundary of what undesirable conditions are. I do wanna note that thresholds are the limits that the Fishery Reform Act discuss, which trigger population status as overfished or undergoing overfishing. 
Reference points are decided through data-driven information on the life history traits of the species. There is an extensive literature review that goes into this, and the model considerations are taken into account. Also, management needs are discussed while, discuss while determining the reference points for a species. So when your population size hits the threshold determined as a reference point and goes below that line, we term the fishery as overfished. When the fishing mortality is greater than the predetermined threshold, it is undergoing overfishing. So to give you an example of what we would present after a stock assessment has been developed, this is a graph of a random fishery where the spawning, spawning stock biomass is plotted over the target, which is the green dotted line, and over the threshold, which is the red solid line. This particular population always stays above the threshold, so it is not overfished. Similarly, we would also present something like the fishing mortality plotted against the thresholds. In this case, the fishing mortality is always below the threshold, so it is not experiencing overfishing. And to summarize all of this information and give you an idea of a stock assessment timeline at Division of Marine Fisheries, we start the process always with data collection and stakeholder input. After all of this information is gathered and a stock assessment is kicked off, we go into a planning workshop where a team is formed and the planning workshop is scheduled. This planning workshop is used to define the unit stock as well as the standardize the data summaries. So make sure everything is on the same timeline and looking at the same standards and identify the programs that have the available data that are needed for these stock assessments. From there, we adjourn and go gather all of the data needed and then come back for a data workshop to compile the data and critically evaluate all of the information available and decide which data are going to be best used in a model. After that, we convene a methods workshop to discuss the specific methods that are going to go into the stock assessment model. So what model is going to be used, which software is best available, and select the stock status criteria. This is when the, those reference points are dis discussed. After that, we have an assessment workshop. I do want to note that there is a longer gap between the methods workshop and the assessment workshop because this is when the actual model is being developed by the stock assessment team. So it's being developed and fine tuned and then it goes in front of the DMF staff in an assessment workshop to determine the species status. So going back to those reference points and determining if the fishery is overfished or overfishing. Identify major uncertainties in the model, so things that need to be reassessed and balance the realism of the model versus the model fit. So some additional statistics are discussed in this meeting. Once the assessment is accepted by the DMF team, it goes into a peer review process where it goes in front of an external panel of experts and they review it for the suitability of the science and examine the scientific methods that were used in the assessment. Once a peer review panel accepts the model, it goes back to DMF to be approved by, or it goes back to DMF where the stock assessment is determined to be appropriate for management use. Once it is approved again by DMF, the stock assessment is then presented to the commission and used to inform management for the fisheries management plan. The data used in the assessments is reviewed each year as part of the fishery management plan annual review, which is presented to you each August and available on the DMF Managing the Fisheries website. At this time, I will entertain any questions that you have. Thank you. Questions or comments? Commissioner Rolla. Thank you. This is just um, kind of from my own curiosity. You had a slide in there regarding how you take into consideration of fish migrating in and out of a population. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give me some examples of any stocks where that is the case? <laughs> I can name a few, but. <laughs> yeah, I can give you one. Um... Chair or Commissioner Roller, and one you might be familiar with. So um, King Mackerel in the South Atlantic and the Gulf, there is a um, mixing and a transition zone um, between the Gulf and the South Atlantic stock that the assessment takes into account. Um, so both those stocks um, come together and mix and spawn in that area and then go their separate ways. And there was um, tagging work and reproductive work done in that zone, um, not only to um, look at the 
proportion of Gulf and South Atlantic fish that were mixing in there. Um, also, um, to get an idea of um, recruitment from that zone. So, you know, once they get together and spawn and go, and so that is um, incorporated um, in that model. Um, we don't have any um, North Carolina stock assessments where we really take into account um, immigration and uh, immigration um, from the unit stock of North Carolina, um, either in or out, um, just because. You know, for the most part, uh, most of our stocks um, kind of stay in our waters um, and to you know, really be able to account for that in the assessment. It would take, um, you know, intensive tagging work, not only here, but in those areas where they come from. And um, there's just not a lot of evidence yet for uh, many of our stocks that, you know, that needs to be a factor that's accounted for. Um, but, you know, Southern Flounder is one of those stocks where uh, the science, um, informed that that stock was much broader than just North Carolina, um, the whole South Atlantic. So, I mean, there's reproductive um, output from those other states that affect the stock and movement. And that was part of the decision why um, the most recent Southern Flounder stock assessment was a coastwide one and just not a um, North Carolina one. So I hope that addressed your question. No, absolutely. Thank you. That was an excellent explanation. And I think that was great for the commission as well as the public. But your king mackerel example is great because I think that shows why you have a population that's mixing. You have the genetic and well as the tagging work, why you can't assess small aspects of like one population like North Carolina, Southern Flounder. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, how you guys uh, calculate natural mortality or what inputs you use to kind of discover that and how it integrates into your models? There's a lot of information for each species. Um, I may ask for Laura Lee to join me on this one. I'm still jumping into it. So it's, it's going to be species specific. Um, different species, we have different information on, obviously. Uh, there are, are a variety of life history based me methods that we use for some species. So based on the longevity of the species, there's some sort of common rules of thumbs that we can use to estimate the mortality. Um, a better way would be to use uh, tagging studies um, to, est to directly estimate and get an empirical estimate of natural mortality. Um, and so we go, we look for the best estimate that's out there in literature or, or something that maybe we've done ourselves, some, you know, research we've done ourselves, and, and that's what we input into the stock assessment model. And we typically do sensitivity analyses around those estimates. So, well, what if we had assumed a value that was a little higher or a little lower? So, so basically, you, you look at the life history and you kind of come up with a factor, like a, some sort of factor of, of natural mortality based on that species, and that's kind of how it gets into the model. Is that? Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? Mr. Rola. Um, and while we got Laura up here, I've got another question for you guys. Um, so I've been a part of a couple of CDAR processes um, and I've also, you know, obviously followed the North Carolina. One thing that comes back to me from other people involved in the process or particularly here from fishermen and stakeholders in the federal processes, we got all the input, we hold the workshop and you run the model. And then people, when we come back and they say, oh, well, this model looks pretty bad and this one looks pretty good. And then you change data. Could you explain a little bit how that works in the process where you kind of tweak stuff? Is, is it, am I asking that? In a clear, clear way. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So, and, and the reason being is I just want people to kind of understand that. So, okay. I think I understand your question. <laughs> um, so, when we when we're at the assessment workshop, you know, we want our first of all, we hopefully we've selected a model that's appropriate for the species and appropriate for for the management um, intent. Um, and so we want to make sure the results make sense. And if they don't make sense, um, this is where I guess you would say the tweaking comes in. We, we look a lot harder at our assumptions and see where maybe um, we made a mistake or something can be tweaked to make it a little more accurate. And, and we, we can do this. And then this process happens at the assessment workshop and it happens again at the peer review workshop where we have um, external experts helping us in the, what you would call tweaking um, and coming up with the best model based on what we know about the life history and what we know about the fisheries. 
but but more specifically, you could say have one input that maybe has too much weight or something like that. Is that is that one way to look at it? So yeah, some yeah. we do talk about weighting. Um, that that's definitely an issue. Um, that we have to that we have to consider, and that's one of the things we'll look at. To see, okay, it seems like this in, in a particular index may be driving things. Is that appropriate or not appropriate? Okay, thank you. And, and again, that comes back to me from a lot of stakeholders. Are like, oh well. They went and they changed it. Well, no, not really. You know, it's kind of the way the process goes. But thank you for that explanation. You're welcome. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Not thank you for your presentation, CJ. You added some clarity to a very complex process. So thank you. Chairman? Yes. Can I just make one comment? Yes, please. Just in reference to um, Chairman... Everyone's a chairman today. Everybody's a chairman. That's fine with me. <laughs> um, statement, uh, the um, peer review workshops that we hold for these stock assessments are open to the public. So if anyone is interested in seeing the quote unquote tweaking, um, certainly they can listen into those conversations to hear how that's done in more detail. So just a- And then come and see how the sausage is made. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, um, next up is our fishery management plans. Corin Flora, please. Chairman Bizzle. Yes. Our WebEx is having issues. So our presentations will be posted online after this. Um, the audio fine. is recording now. Okay, that'll be fine. All right. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Corinne Flora. I am the Fisheries Management Plan Coordinator for the division. And today I'm going to be giving an overview of our fisheries management plans, which are currently under review. There is a corresponding memo in your briefing materials under fisheries management plans. And today there will actually be an action item during this presentation, um, and that will be to adopt the FMP for Interjurisdictional Fisheries 2022 Information Update. So as a reminder, we currently have five fisheries management plans under review. Today, I will briefly touch on where in the process each of these is. So starting with the spotted sea trout fisheries management plan, the stock assessment for spotted sea trout is continuing with a schedule of the spotted sea trout FMP review. The 2014 stock assessment indicated the stock was not overfished and not experiencing overfishing. The current assessment includes data through February of 2020. And the division will be holding a peer review later this year with plans to complete in 2022. And as Laura said, that is open to the public. And so you are welcome to join us. The stock assessment for striped mullet has been completed. An external peer review panel concluded the stock assessment is the best scientific information available and is suitable for management advice. The stock assessment with the terminal year of 2019 indicated that the stock is overfished and undergoing overfishing. Staff will review the assessment with you today. 
Later this year, the division will hold a scoping period for Amendment 2. That This will likely take place this summer. The scoping period is intended to solicit input from stakeholders and to inform the plan. Following scoping, staff will present the scoping results and the draft goal and objectives to Amendment 2 to the Marine Fisheries Commission, and at that time request additional management strategies from commissioners. This will likely occur at your November meeting. The Estuary and Stripe Bass plan continues to be managed under Amendment 1, its supplement and revision. The jointly um, developed FMP is with the Wildlife Resources Commission and covers more than one stock. In February of 2022, the commission voted to send draft amendment two for public and advisory committee review. The division held public comment from March 4th to April 1. This included an online questionnaire, a public listening session, and three advisory committee meetings. The division has received a lot of positive input on these public listening sessions, um, and we have <clears throat> had a lot of public tell us that they appreciate the opportunity to ask questions prior to giving their comment. Today, staff will present an overview from the comment period and the Marine Fisheries Commission will be asked to vote on preferred management. After the preferred management is selected, the division will transmit the plan to the DEQ secretary and the secretary will report progress to the appropriate legislative bodies for review. The process, which I just described, is what has been completed for the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan uh, for Amendment 3. At the February business meeting, the Marine Fisheries Commission voted on preferred management for that plan. The full plan with your preferred management was transmitted to the DEQ secretary who informed the appropriate legislative bodies for review. Neither provided significant suggestions or recommend, recommended changes. And so today the MFC will be asked to take a vote on adopting that plan. And finally, we have the North Carolina FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries, which is our state FMP that focuses on adopting management approved by federal councils or the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission appropriate for North Carolina. At the November 2021 business meeting, the commission approved the goal and objectives for Amendment 2. In December 2021, the division staff held an FMP advisory committee workshop. The FinFish advisory committee sat in as the FMP advisory committee since this is a policy driven plan. Based on the feedback received on Amendment 2 management options, the division determined that further consideration is warranted. Therefore, since no management change are, is required at this time, the FMP for Interjurisdictional Fisheries 2022 information update is presented to you today to satisfy the five-year review of that plan. So, before I continue, I will give you the opportunity to discuss or make a motion on that plan. Okay. Uh, you see this uh, interjurisdictional inter plan in front of you that we've have had discussion on and uh, comments on in the past. Are there any other questions or comments about this FMP? If not, the chair will entertain a motion to approve this. Commissioner Roller. So I move. Yeah. Okay. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second, second. Commissioner Cross. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. We thank you. <laughs> so to, um, wrap up everything today with my talk. Um, I'll review 
um, a little bit more about the FMP process timeline and where the FMPs sit. Uh, the division will be holding that mullet scoping, uh, likely in the summertime. Uh, we'll put out press releases and information um, prior to that meeting. Um, and we um, currently plan to have three in-person um, scoping meetings, and there will be an online component as well. Um, so look forward to that. And then... Um, <clears throat> The striped bass plan uh, is ready for preferred management options to be selected today. And the southern flounder plan is ready for adoption. And you just adopted the interjurisdictional plan. So with that, I could take any other questions. Um, and that wraps up what I have. All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now for our striped mullet stock assessment report. Um, it's like we got a gang that's going to come up here and give us this, so come on up. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> this morning we'll be talking about um, the stock assessment of striped mullet. I want to mention that this stock assessment went through the standard DMF process for stock assessments that Dr. Schlick covered in her presentation. And as um, Corinne indicated, this was um, given the stamp of approval by the peer review and then also recommended for management by the division who has the basically the final say in whether or not um, the stock assessment is going to be used for management. Okay, so um, just a little rehash of, of Dr. Schlick's talk, but um, just in general, uh, stock assessment and stock assessments available data are critically evaluated, and those data that are deemed useful are fed into a model, and that's typically a mathematical model, and that produces predictions of observed data along with characteristics of the population, such as spawning stock biomass and fishing mortality, uh, and then these values are, are compared to reference point values that um, our desirable conditions, and that gives us an indication of stock status. Okay. Uh, this is just an overview of our model um, and the data that went into our model. The time series started in 1950, and our most recent year was 2019. We use both fisheries dependent and fisheries independent data. The fisheries dependent data consisted of commercial landings, recreational harvests, and biological samples collected from both of those. Um, sectors. We also included the fisheries independent data, um, the gillnet survey, also known as program 915, and biological data collected from that survey, length, the length, weight, and age to characterize um, the, the fish that are coming out of that survey. Here we have our time series of commercial landings going back to 1950, um, some variability over the time series and a slight a slight decline over time, I will point out that our x-axis is year, our y-axis is in metric tons. Um, sorry, I meant to put that in pounds. <laughs> Here is our recreational harvest, and I'm going to take a minute um, to explain what's going on in this graph. It's not that our recreational anglers are extremely precise in, in fishing, um, but the units are, first I'll point out the units are in thousands of fish there on the y-axis. Um, so there, there were some changes to MRIP. As you know, MRIP started in 1981. Um, but in 2002, there were some changes that made us um, 
have less confidence in the estimates prior to 2002. And because the peer reviewers really wanted us to extend the time series back to 1950, so we had to make an assumption about the recreational removals. So we assume the recreational removals from 1950 through 2001 were equal to the median, the median value from 2002 through 2019. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that at the end. Any questions on that? Sure. Okay, Commissioner Posey. Um, are you using that value as part of a trend analysis? Um, the, no, the series of medians over time, is that going into part of a trend analysis? It's just going in, it's being um, taken, entered as removals. It's, it's our removals from the population. That, that's going, if you take it all as a median, by definition, it's going to eliminate any trend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it, so it goes in exactly how it looks right there. So obviously, there's obviously trend over that time series. We did do um, a few sensitivity analysis on the recreational data mm -hmm. that showed, um, like, so time, starting the time series, when was starting the time series much later? no real impact on our final stock status. We did a um, one where we assume the recreational movers were larger, right, larger. Um, no impact on stock status that I recall. And also one where we just didn't have a recreational fishery. Um, we made that assumption. And again, there was no impact on the final results. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate going back in time, but I, 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 I kind of wonder whether it perhaps gives the casual observer kind of a miss perception of what's what happening um regarding that slide you know in a lot of the data it's kind of hard to source out striped versus white mullet so is that just striped mullet in that so very good point so um the harvest consists of two types of landings sort of your observed landings and your unobserved landings the observed landings are the fish that are brought to the dock and observed by a trained MRIP interviewer. But for striped mullets, most of those are the, what are we call the unobserved landings. Um, and so they go in there since 2002, this is the change that occurred since 2002, instead of um, relying on the angler's identification, no matter what the angler said, if it was striped or white, it just got labeled as mullet genus. And so we did a study in early 2000s, thank you, um, to look at what proportion are striped mullet in the recreational fishery, and that was 29%. And so we used that value and applied that to estimate how many were actually striped mullet. So, yes, we, we're confident that this is just representing striped mullet. Thank you. Um, that does make sense. I, you know, probably a little bit high in my personal opinion, but, you know, I, I, I trust your, your data on that. What, what percentage of the, of the overall harvest is recreational? Do you know that off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, I don't. Dan, do you? It's minimal. Minimal. Yeah, like less than 1%, right? Probably. Yeah. Right. And that's we, why it didn't have much impact when we actually removed the um, fishery from the sensitivity analysis. Great. It would be helpful to have that number, though. Sure. Before, we even if it's really, really de minimis. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so next we have our trend in relative abundance from our gillnet survey. This is in numbers uh, per effort over time. And, you, and this index starts in 2008, so a little later in our time series. And there's a general declining trend um, from 2008 to 2015, and then a slight increase through the end of the time series. Next, um, I'm going to talk about model outputs and stock status. And this graph is a little bit different than what you've seen in the past in terms of determining stock status relative to our threshold. Um, usually we, we show the point estimates of spawning stock biomass relative to our target and threshold. But um, this is, I think, a much more simplified version of how to interpret stock status. And what, we, what you do is you take the model estimates of spawning stock biomass and you divide by the threshold. And that's what you're seeing in the orange line. And then your, your solid black line at one is your threshold. So when spawning stock biomass falls below that line, you're overfished. So this is just a, a more simple representation of how to show the model outputs. And you'll be seeing this in future stock, stock assessment presentations. So you can see that in our final year, um, spawning stock biomass, and this is the female mature fish, the fish that are capable of reproducing. Um, you can see that that estimate is below the threshold. So in our terminal year of 2019, the stock is overfished. 
and for, for those interested in the absolute numbers, um, spawning stock biomass in 2019 was estimated at 263 metric tons. Our threshold um, SSB at 25%, and that's 25% of spawning stock biomass relative to the virgin or unfished condition with 619 metric tons. Be because spawning stock biomass in 2019 um, is less than our threshold, and I see I made a little mistake there, um, should be SSB 25% that it's less than, the stock is overfished. Now, fishing mortality, again, is similar to the spawning stock biomass graph where we're showing it in relative terms. So we take the model estimates of fishing mortality divided by the fishing mortality threshold, and that's what you're seeing in this dark purple line. And then the black line at one represents the threshold. You can see um, relative F is increasing over the time series um, with some variability. And in our terminal year at 2019, our final year, um, F relative F is above the threshold. So that indicates that overfishing is occurring. Our terminal year F in 2019 was 0.42. Our threshold is 0.37. So because 0.42 is greater than 0.37, overfishing is occurring. Um, that concludes my presentation and we look forward to your questions. Questions and comments. Mr. Roller. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, I'm not surprised that this is the outcome of the stock, you know, particularly those of us who spend a lot of time on the water. There's been a definite decline in mature striped mullet. You know, I know that's anecdotal, but it's very clear. There's also a, a huge, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, explosion effort in that fishery, particularly commercial. I followed the last stock assessment pretty closely, and, you know, it would, this would indicate the stock status was the same at that time. What changed in your data and model that allowed us to reach this point here in 2022 that we didn't at the last assessment? So there were definitely changes to the input data in, in the assessment model. Um, we used more independent surveys in our in our last assessment. I think one of the one of the biggest changes um, that happened was a change in our peer review process. In the last striped mullet stock assessment, um, even though it did go to peer review, it was through what we would call a desk review. So we just, we sent the stock assessment to the peer reviewers, gave them a list of questions and asked them to answer them. There was no interaction, which is so important as part of the peer review pro process. So we couldn't really refine the model to get it to that best, you know, representation of, of the stock in the fishery. Since 2017, we've been doing these in-person or webinar peer reviews where there's interaction and back and forth, where we can actually refine the model um, based on comments from the peer reviewers. So that's why some of these inputs have changed, I, I believe, because we just didn't have that, that feedback loop as part of the first stock assessment. Now, I do believe that that first stock assessment was the based on the best available data at the time, but I do think this one is more representative of what's going on in the stock and the fishery. Um, did you incorporate the electroshock survey? Initially, we did, but the peer reviewers felt that it was very spatially limited, and also the survey that we did include covered the same area and more. So they felt it, it wasn't really adding information to the assessment. Yeah, I, I picked that up during the process, and, you know, that was always my concern because I know it's a really good program. I mean, I, I mean, I personally caught fish that have been tagged, like drum and trout and striped bass have been tagged in that survey. But I was always concerned because the surveying was done in areas where there's no commercial effort as well, which I would assume would produce some sort of bias in that survey. So, okay. Other questions, comments, Commissioner Romano. Um, with this particular species, how would you compare natural mortality and fishing mortality? Um, and is there any sort of ratio that we can kind of understand, you know, the differences between the two um, in, in this particular fishery? You understand what I mean? I'm not sure. What did, do you remember what we assume for natural mortality? Sorry, I've been working on several assessments since. So no, I, get no, them I, understand. I guess I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to understand because I know that fishing pressure can change pretty dramatically with mullet. And I was just wondering about, um, you know, how you compare that to like the natural mortality annually of, of mullet obviously they're big feed fish for other right so we we do assume in this model that natural mortality is constant over time um it probably does change over time as you said as um prey or sorry predator abundance changes and stuff so it's, it's one of those simplifying assumptions that we need to make 
Right. I just, I, it's, that's a little concerning to me because I, I just feel like with this particular fishery, it could be just so um, varied, but I, I, I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Romano. Commissioner Romano. <laughs> Commissioner Roller. Star hey, I'm not, I'm, but I'm not chairman. Right? I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, you, you made me lose my train of thought there, but um, hold on a second. Good for me. Uh, yeah, good for you. Good for everybody, probably. Um, yeah, I completely forgot my question. <laughs> if you think of it. <laughs> it worked. It worked. <laughs> okay. Now you got it. Okay. Um, so what is the poundage we have in metric tons of commercial take per year? Just you know, like, do you have like just just throw something out there for the record? We're we're usually between about a million and two million pounds. Yeah, so big 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 fishery, right? A mm -hmm. million to two million pounds. And so you know, as we all know, this is a row based fishery, right? And so we harvest these fish to take the row, and it goes to various markets. And that also follows American shad, chicory shad, and river herring, all of which are declined, declining, really important species, which were row based fisheries for much of their um. Their periods. I just want to point that out. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Commissioner Blanton. Is there a distinction between what what fish are row based fish and what fish are bait bait based fish? You know, time of year they're caught. What poundage is comparatively throughout the year? Um, you know, because the row mullet fishery only is prosecuted. You know, maybe late September, right on October, uh, November. However, the rest of the year is more of a bait fishery. Um, so, is there any distinction there on poundages? Um, which I know would you could probably do some analysis and look, you know, you know, a, a annually and and what could be assumed. But I didn't know if that was something readily available there. Uh, we don't have the the specific numbers like as part of this presentation, but um, yeah, we, we can make some uh, general assumptions about what part of the fishery is the row fishery and what part is the either bait or just regular food consumption parts based on the time of year that they occur. And I think on the trip tickets that are filled out as well, there is categories for red row and white row mullets that can be recorded by the, the fish house. Um, generally, what we see in the fishery is pretty consistent low landings throughout the, the spring, summer, um, and then in the, the early fall, October, September, October, November, the fishery really starts to pick up, and that is the, um, the, the row fishery really starting to come in there. So. Right. Yeah, I just think that's going to be an important point moving forward, you know, as to uh, what 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 stage these mullets are in throughout the year when they're taken what they're used for um x y and z you know whatever the topics come up based on that because it's a very diverse fish it's very rec recreationally important fish probably the most commercially taken recreationally important fish um they kind of one 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 sector scratches the others back here um with that fish so um i think you know moving forward i'd like to see when we get, talk further about mullets the distinctions between you know how much is taken uh different types of different times of the year excuse me thanks okay anybody else mr roller Thank you. I just want to agree with Commissioner Blanton there. As we go forward, I think that's going to be an important analysis to understand how we look at this fishery going forward. Uh, when I when I read through all this material, I, I get a little heartburn, not because of the material, but because how I think we're going to try to regulate this fishery. It's going to be very hard. You know, like what we do to try to bring this fishery to a sustainable level, right? So I think we're going to need to understand the different times of year, um, how we how we do this spatially. We're also going to have to understand what our fishermen target in this fishery because the, the, you know, the striped mullet fishery isn't just a striped mullet fishery. It's a red drum fishery and a speckled trout fishery as well. So we're going to have to understand how these fishermen rely on these other species in concert with mullet and how they fish. So I hope that you're going to provide us some analysis in that because 
you know, when we look forward to your recommendations going forward, it's going to be tough. I think we all know that. So. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Madam director. I, I'd just like to make one comment. There's an excellent uh, comments from commissioner Roller and commissioner Blanton. And I just, we, we did receive a lot of comments last night as well about fishermen talking about uh, the mullet fishery and, and, and how important it was. And I just would like to encourage and for folks listening uh, online, encourage those fishermen uh, because we do need to understand the bait fishery, the, the, the market fishery, the, the road fishery, all of those things. It's a very complex fishery altogether because there's so many variables. Just encourage those folks that commented last night. We need at when we start down the process after we get through scoping, we will be establishing advisory committee, uh, FMP advisory committee, like we do for all our FMP. So just encourage folks to be thinking about that and participating because we're going to need fishermen on this advisory com committee to help us with the development of this plan once we get to that point. So I just want to put a little plug in for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Anything else? All right. If not, thank you for your report. And we're a little early for lunch, but let's go ahead and adjourn for lunch right now. We'll be back here just a few minutes past one o'clock.
Hey, Tom, you want to pass something real quick? Make a motion. Me and you vote. Me and you vote. <laughs> We may need to send somebody out for a gun to go get everybody. They're paying. They're paying. Doug may have to wash dishes. I don't know. Colonel, if you got bullets in your pistol, I may have to send you on a roundup. All right, slowly but surely. Let's see, one, two, three, four. I need one more pork horn. Well, as soon as I get a corn, I won't get going because I don't be going to be here till seven at night. Okay, we have our quorum. We're going to start back on the program. Um, under fishery management plans continued, we're going to talk about Amendment 2 of the Estuary and Stripe Bass FNP. So, Charlton, Charlton here. 
There you are. Didn't see you back there. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, commissioners. Um, I'm Charlton Godwin, and with me today are Nathaniel Hancock and Joe Frischindler. Um, we are all co-leads for Amendment 2 to the North Carolina Estuarine Striped Bass FMP. Todd Mathis could not be um, with us here today. Um, I would also like to mention again, this FMP is jointly developed with biological staff from the Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, and I would also like to welcome and introduce to the Marine Fisheries Commission. We have two Wildlife um, Commission staff here today, um, Christian Waters. He's our uh, he's the chief of their Inland uh, Fisheries Division. And Jeremy McCargo, he is the research, anadromous research coordinator for all things uh, striped bass, sturgeon, shad, river heron in the, um, in the Aramal Sound area. So today we are here to present information collected through public comment and provide the recommendations from the Northern, Southern, um, and Fin Fish Advisory Committees, as well as the uh, DMF and Wildlife Resources Commission recommendations. Uh, and again, this is all, uh, this information is in a table um, of all of the advisory committee's uh, recommendations in Appendix 6 of the FMP, uh, as well as the divisions and wildlife recommendations, and also uh, in the de decision document located in your briefing book. So first, we would just like to remind everyone where we are in the development process of draft amendment two. Uh, this will be an action item at the end of this presentation for the commission to select its preferred management options. And after this meeting, we will forward the commission's preferred management options uh, to the DEQ secretary, where she will report FMP progress to the legislative bodies for review. Um, in August, at the August business meeting, the commission will vote on final adoption of the FMP. So draft amendment two contains three sustainable harvest issue papers, one issue paper that deals with the potential use of hook and line in the striped bass commercial fishery, and one information paper about the history of striped bass stocking in North Carolina. <clears throat> amendment two addresses the management uh, Amendment 2 addresses the management strategies for the uh, Aramal Roanoke stock and the CSMA stocks separately. So Appendix 2 focuses on the Aramal Roanoke stock, while Appendices 3 and 4 are focused on the CSMA stocks. Uh, and Appendix 5 addresses the hook and line gear issue. Uh, public comment, regional and standing advisory committee comment and review uh, was based on the options contained within these issue papers. So the public comment period was open from March 4th through April the 1st, 2022. This included a public listening session and three advisory committee meetings. The meetings were a hybrid type meeting with an in-person and online participation. Uh, all of the meetings were held at the Moorhead City Central District Office. So the division provided listening stations in Dare County um, and at the Wilmington Regional Office. Um, we did, as, as mentioned earlier, we, we got a lot of public comment back uh, that liked the format of this. They were uh, able to not travel as far to be able to attend and watch the meeting and provide public comment. 35 written comments were received and are in your media material briefing books. 264 responses were received through the online questionnaire and a total of 15 people uh, provided comment in person at the advisory committee meetings. So this slide uh, just provides some demographic information about the respondents to the online uh, questionnaire. Um, as you can see on the uh, pie chart there with state of residency, majority of the uh, respondents were from North Carolina. Uh, and then in the other pie chart, we have uh, the respondents that identified by user group and the um, most identified were with the recreational angler um, user group. So now we're going to get into the summary of the uh, questions and the responses related to the individual issue papers that were um, from the online questionnaire. So for the Albemarle Roanoke Sustainable Harvest issue paper, 53% uh, of the respondents supported the um, supported a moratorium, while 41% did not. Uh, six were uncertain or had no uh, opinion. Uh, of the uh, 56 percent of the respondents indicated they would continue to practice catch and release fishing for striped bass if there was a moratorium in place on the Air Mall Roanoke stock. Uh, for the bycatch issue, 70% uh, supported continuing to use the bycatch provision for the commercial fishery, 8% supported ending the bycatch requirement, and 22% were uncertain or had no opinion. So 
So for option three, uh, which discusses what to do if the fisheries harvest above their towel, 68% uh, of the respondents supported option 3D. Each fishery had their own towel and would pay back all landings above the towel. Uh, for the size limit option, option 4, 83% supported size limit changes to increase the abundance of older fish in the population. 71% uh, specifically supported op, uh, options C and E. And for option five, gear mo modifications to, re discard, to reduce discard mortality, 49% uh, supported option B, 5B, and with 19% supporting option D, 17% uh, supported option E, and 11% supported option C. So moving on to Appendix 3, Achieving Sustainable Harvest for the Tar, Pamlico, and Noose River Stocks. For Option 1, the Harvest Moratorium, 59% of the respondents uh, support continuing the Harvest Moratorium. 32% supported lifting it if sustain har sustainable harvest is possible, and 9% had no opinion or were uncertain. As for how long the moratorium should remain in place, 51% supported keeping it in place as long as necessary to do achieve sustainable harvest. 20% supported a five-year closure, 8% supported a five to 10-year closure, and the rest were unsure or had no opinion. All right, 54% um, of the respondents did support uh, supported harvest on hatchery fish if there was no sign of natural reproduction after a um, continued period of no harvest. 27% uh, opposed harvest of hatchery stocked fish and 19% were uncertain or had no opinion. For Appendix 4, Achieving Sustainable Harvest in the Cape Fear System, 65% support continuing the harvest moratorium, 14% were opposed, with 21% having no opinion or were uncertain. Or were uncertain. Uh, if harvest was allowed in the Cape Fear, there was an even split among the location of the harvest to allow it in all of the Cape Fear, joint and inland waters only, or just inland uh, fishing waters above Lock and Dam. So they were split at about 16, uh, 15, 16% each. However, the majority, 53%, um, were uncertain or had no opinion on uh, where the uh, fishing location in the Cape Fear, if it was open. So uh, Appendix 5, the hook and line. If hook and line was allowed for commercial fishing, 23 respondents said that they would enter the fishery. Um, there was support by respondents to allow hook and line gear um, if gill netting was not allowed. So these next slides, we will uh, present the actual options for each issue paper, and along with the option, um, we will then present the advisory committee, the division, and the Wildlife Resources Commission's um, recommendations. So now going back to the Admiral Roanoke issue paper. The first option we will discuss is the option to operate under a harvest moratorium or to continue with the total, uh, total the current total allowable landings, the tail. Uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries, WRC, Southern and Finfish AC's recommendation is to continue the use of a tail to manage harvest. Um, the Northern AC made a motion for each option, but neither passed due to a tie vote. Um, however, it should be noted, uh, as we've stated before, that if we if we do not get some good spawning events in the coming few years, uh, the next stock assessment update, uh, which we are just starting um, in the process of starting now with data through uh, 2021, um, could ab uh, could indicate that a moratorium is absolutely necessary. So for option two, um, that's the management of striped bass and the commercial fisheries of bycatch fishery. Um, all of the ACs, the division, and the Wildlife Commission um, supported to continue uh, manage as a bycatch fishery. And I will just say, I, I meant to say before we got into these, on the majority of the issues, uh, the division, the Wildlife Commission, and all of the ACs um, actually agreed on uh, picked the, the same option for the majority of them. There are a few that are, are different that we'll go over, but. So uh, here are the options for the next issue, which is accountability measures to address what happens when the towel is exceeded. <clears throat> the division recommends any overages above the towel be paid back in full with no buffer. Um, the Wildlife Resources Commission would prefer a 5% buffer over the towel before paybacks are triggered to account for uncertainty in the recreational landings estimate. Uh, in addition, in the event that the towel is exceeded by more than double, the WRC feels payback should last only one year instead of having to take reductions or, uh, potentially over multiple years. So this one is 
a little bit of a complicated issue with all of the options, so we're going to just take a couple of slides here. Um, next couple of slides, just kind of understand exactly what the, the options are that the division and the Wildlife Commission supports. So this again is is option three D. I mean option um, option three in appendix two. If you're following along in your briefing book, and so this is just a hypothetical scenario. Um, this is this is an example of option three D, which the division supports, and that is each of the three fisheries has their own own tail. Uh, and would pay back all overages above the tail, even if the overage is so large, it may take uh, more than one year to pay back. So again, uh, we're looking at just a hypothetical scenario using fishery one and two uh, and a total tail of 10,000 pounds as an example. Uh, I want to point out that the bars on the graph represent the landings in each year with pounds on the left axis. Uh, and that little black line represents the hypothetical fisheries tail, um, which again, in this example, it starts off at 10,000 pounds. So in year one, both fisheries go over their tail. Fishery one landed 10,400 pounds, while fishery two landed 25,000 pounds, um, which is more than double of the tail. So in year two, fishery one would have a slightly lower tail to account for their overage of 400 pounds, while fishery two would not have a season at all because they went over their tail by more than double. So then in year three, after the overage, fishery one um, would be back to the original tail amount, while fisheries two, fishery two's tail would still have to pay back some additional landings from the overage that happened um, two years ago. Um, so in this example, they would only have a 5,000 pound, uh, 5, pound tail um, in year three. Um, the following year, presuming neither fisheries go over the tail this year, both fisheries would be back to their uh, 10,000 pound tail. So for an example, for the same landing scenario, using the WRC preferred language, which was not actually an option in the FMP document that went out to public comment, um, but that was the option that the Wildlife Commission um, did choose at their at their April 14th business meeting. And you will also see that in Exhibit H um, in your briefing materials. I think the uh, their commissioner sent a, a letter um, outlining the, the, the commission's um, Wildlife Commission's um, preferred management recommendations on each one. So we have the same landings in excess of each fishery's tail as in the previous example. Fishery one landed uh, 10,400 pounds and fishery two landed 25,000 pounds. So in year two, fishery one does not need to reduce their tail because the landings were within the 5% buffer. Uh, fishery two has no season because they went over their tail by more than double. Um, in addition, in year two, fishery one exceeds their tail by 400 pounds again, but since it is within the buffer, um, no payback is necessary. So in year three, uh, both fisheries are back to their original tail and no further payback is necessary for fishery two. Both fisheries also exceeded their tails, but because it wasn't over the buffer, uh, they do not have to pay uh, anything back. I think the real differences around this between the, the two um, the two options are you know, centered around the buffer and how much to pay back. Um, in the WRC preferred option, if landings do not exceed the buffer, no payback is necessary. Um, so you could theoretically exceed the tail by a small amount each year um, and no payback would be necessary. Um, and also relative to the buffer is that landings exceed the buffer, only landings in excess of the buffer are paid back, not landings in excess of the actual tail. Um, and the other main difference is if landings um, exceed the tail by more than double, paybacks would only occur for one year, no matter how much that tail is exceeded. So, all right, moving on to the fourth issue for the Albemarle Royal Oak stock, still in Appendix 2, uh, size limits to expand the age structure of the stock. Again, um, uh, staff from both agencies, uh, the Division and the Wildlife Commission, and all of the AC's recommendation was 4C and uh, 4E. Um, so in 4C, in the Aramal sign management area, uh, that's going to be, that's going to implement a harvest slot of 18 to 25 inches. Uh, in the Roanoke River management area, they're keeping their current harvest slot of 18 to 22 inches, but in addition, uh, they are removing that provision that used to allow one fish greater than 27 inches and are now just, uh, just having a harvest slot of 18 to 22. So moving on to option five, gear modification and area closures to reduce discard mortality. Um, again, the division WRCs and ACs recommendations are for options uh, 5A um, and 5E. So 5E is a is a uh, an additional restriction on the Roanoke up there, upstream of the 258 bridge um, to require um, non-offset barbless circle hooks. 
All right, so for the adaptive management, uh, this is the last issue for the AR stock. Uh, again, the divisions uh, and the WRC and the AC's recommendations are to support all of the adaptive management measures listed listed here for the, um, for the AR stock. All right, now moving into Appendix 3, which deals with sustainable harvest for the Tar Pamlico and Noose River stocks. Option one is to continue the no possession measure or to possibly end the no possession measure after a data review scheduled for 2025. Um, the division, WRC, Southern and Finfish ACs recommend option 1A to continue the no possession measure. Uh, and the Northern AC um, did not, they did vote to end the no possession measure. Um, option two discusses maintaining the gillnet closure above the ferry lines. Um, in 2019, the Marine Fisheries Commission directed the DMF director to close waters upstream of the ferry line to the use of gillnets. In order to maintain this closure, the management option must be selected in Amendment 2. Um, and as a reminder for the reason for a single option here at the February 2022 uh, Marine Fisheries Commission business meeting, the Commission passed a motion to remove options 2B and 2C from Appendix 3. These were options to allow gill netting above the uh, ferry lines in certain times. The rationale for allowing gill netting above the ferry lines was based on research that showed um, minimal interactions with striped bass and gill nets set greater than 200 yards from shore. So for this option, the northern and the southern ACs voted to end the gill net closure above the ferry lines and return to the gill net regulations in place prior to the 2019 closure. Uh, the division and the finfish ac do not have a recommendation and the wrc uh, supports option 2a um so again for adaptive management for the tar pam and noose river stocks which really uh, focuses around uh, a data review in 2025 um so that'll be out of you know out of out of cycle with the with any sort of fmt thing it'll just be uh, a data review we'll look at the data through 2024 um, to see how, you know, uh, to see how the stock has responded since the um, harvest moratorium was put in place uh, and the other measures, uh, gill net measures in, in 2019. Uh, so again, the DMF, uh, WRC and ACs support um, all the adaptive management um, measures. So moving on to the Cape Fear uh, River issue paper, uh, this is one. This is one of the couple of uh, instances in which the division and the Wildlife Commission did not agree on a recommendation for this issue paper. Um, the division, uh, as well as the advisory committees, support option one A, which is to maintain the Cape Fear River Harvest Moratorium, um, while the Wildlife Resources Commission uh, supports option one B to allow seasonal harvest in all the Cape Fear River fishing waters. Um, with the, those season and length and creel, daily creel limits there um, in option 1B. Uh, again, uh, the adaptive management for the Cape Fear River stock, uh, can, you know, entails continuing the young of year surveys that were started several years ago, looking for um, potential spawning success, uh, genetic PBT analysis to inform adaptive management. Um, and, and this must will be evaluated with, by staff with the MFC FinFish AC consultation. All right, this is the last one. Um, if you remember, this issue paper examines management considerations with implementing hook and line as a commercial gear, and if it is an appropriate time to allow the gear. Uh, the division, WRC, and the ACs uh, all supported uh, option 1A and the adaptive management. Um, however, to use adaptive management to maintain hook and line as a gear if needed as stock uh, status improves. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer um, any questions about the presentation before moving to your action item of uh, selecting your preferred management options. Um, you'll also note our contact information is provided on the screen if you reach to uh, wish to reach out to any of the leads and the next steps of the development of this FMP. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. And I will, um, I will have a recommendation overview slide that you can just look at while you either have questions for staff or during your deliberations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Before we get into the needed motion, any questions or comments about the um, presentation? Commissioner Roller. A uh, question about the Cape Fear harvest aspect of it. Um, Recently, I was made aware, I believe it's from the, the River Watch, Cape Fear, uh, uh, Cape Fear River Watch, is that right? Cape Fear River Partnership. Cape Fear River Partnership. There's been a lot of 
discussion due to you know waterborne contaminants like PFAS or the river watch. Yeah. Works. Okay. Um, in the Cape Fear, where they're recommending people not eat fish from the Cape Fear River at all, um, was that made aware during this process, or was that talked about or thought about in regards to whether or not we recommend harvest the striped bass in the Cape Fear? Yeah, so that was, um, there's some, a little bit of information. You can speak in the microphone a little bit better. Sorry. Appreciate it. Let me move in. Um, so that was, there's some information there in the, the FMP and the issue paper there. Um, and it was discussed about the PFOS and the striped bass. Um, but as far as kind of the, the discussion between uh, WRC and DMF was kind of, uh, we don't typically make management decisions whether or not to allow harvest based on consumption advisories, and there's not a current uh, PFAS consumption advisory. However, uh, we, DMF is working with Health and Human Services to provide um, some samples of fish from the Cape Fear um, in the upcoming weeks, probably, um, to potentially look at that. So that might be something that's coming down the road as far as a consumption advisory, but it just kind of depends what they find and where. Thank you very much. Anybody else with questions or comments about the presentation? Commissioner Cross. Charles, when you're talking about exceeding the towel by either sector, I know what that would mean on the commercial side when you exceed the towel, but so far as the moratorium on the recreational side, does that mean uh, basically no hooks in the water, or what does that exactly mean? Uh, so I don't think I'll... If, 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 let's say that we have a situation where we put the measures in place and we exceed the towel on either side. So, I, I, I know what that means on the commercial side. It's gear out of the water. So, I mean. Well, I mean, so, yeah. So, I mean, we ha we do have the ability uh, because we, you know, we have our own the Wildlife Commission and the division has their own krill surveys for striped bass in these areas. Excuse me. We can come up with. Um, estimates a little bit quicker, well, a lot quicker than the Emirate estimates. So, yes, we, we would close, uh, just as the recreational season in Albemarle Sound did this year, we closed our spring season of a few weeks early because the estimates were showing that we were getting ready to exceed the towel. Um, and, you know, for the Wildlife Resources Commission, they had just a really, uh, a very short season, a couple, you know, two two-day seasons up there. Uh, but in the event that our towel is exceeded for um, the recreational sector, it's going to be reduced uh, the next year. But but no, uh, we would not stop any hook and line fishing for other species because the. I understand that. I'm just talking about. But it would be. So it, but if you had gear directed at that particular species, you'd be you'd stop that. Not for the hook and line. I mean, there were no plans to, if you're asking, could they still catch and release fish, basically target striped bass for catch and release and, uh, after a towel was exceeded? Yes, we wouldn't really. Um, so the amount of discards would just continue to rise. Is that's, that's my point I'm getting at. You know, basically, if he, if he got, if we reached that point and we had to close it because we thought, you know, we're going to exceed the towel, they could continue to catch and release fish but in in that process also you begin in a, a, a number of discards will continue to grow i mean that's that's true they can still catch and release but we we have um so yes they they would still be able to Mr. monitor i see your hand up um this is just kind of a general question um if we continue to have kind of unsuccessful spawns at what how many years you know in y'all's opinion um like how many years are we going to continue to kind of do this stocking? Because I know the stocking's got to be have an expense attached to it um, before we do. It, or is it possible to do just a put and take fishery where you're basically spawning fish and and taking off of them? Um, what's like your trigger point, or what's what what are we looking at? So just first, um, keep in mind that these systems are, are very very different from each other. Right. You know, we've, we we haven't stocked any fish in the Aramal Sound um, since the mid '90s when right. natural reproduction started started going on again. So let's let's just, I mean, if you want to just talk about yeah, that yeah, one just, yeah. first. So okay. you know, we have a plan in place now um, to where if river flow is uh, really high in the spring, which usually is, is pretty much almost guarantees a poor spawn that we're going to start stocking some um, striped bass and arable sound like like we used to. Uh, they will be genetically marked, uh, and we can monitor 
Um, if we do happen to have so, a, a good spawn from natural reproduction, we'll be able to see the difference, just like in the other systems, what's stocked fish and what's naturally um, spawned. Um, so we have a system in place to address what happens there in the air mall already if we continue to see poor spawns or have that high flow. We really don't want to stock fish. Obviously, natural wild reproduction is always better um, than, you know, putting out 100,000 fish from two or three females and five males. But uh, for the central southern areas, um, you know, we, we really have been stocking fish in there for an awful long time. Um, and until we really started doing the, uh, the wildlife commissions initiated that uh, genetic analysis, we didn't really know that what such a vast majority of that system was um, made up of stocked fish. Um, so um, we realized that had a couple of good potentially good year classes up there closed it. So really, I, I guess, um, you know, in, in 2025 uh, for the central southern tar pan and the noose, if this option gets approved, we want to review the data to to determine if this harvest moratorium has worked, if the gill net ban has all of that together has, has uh, got enough fish in the system, and all we see in natural reproduction, we have young of year surveys, and at that point in time, um, the wildlife, I mean, the Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, they'll have an option to, to decide, um, do we want to start a limited amount of harvest back again, knowing that it's going to be majority of, um, you know, a hatchery fish. And we're understanding now that the population may not be self-sustaining. So at that time, um, I guess 20, you know, 2025, when we do that would be the next option to, to say, okay, we're going to shift to something different and we're going to start harvesting hatchery fish. Does that answer your question? Other questions or comments on the presentation? Okay. Mr. Henderson. So, which there is precedent in the mountains with the trout program in the mountains, where that's 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 a large, you know, that's wildlife resources, not marine fisheries, but that's that's what's happening up there. Is this just a, it's a given that if you catch a trout up there, it's by and large, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's rare if it's, it's if it's not a stocked one. But but when we look here back in the Roanoke Basin. Do we have any other example of any managed fishery? I know with crabs, we, we, we protect spawning grounds, et cetera, but is there any example anywhere in the country where uh, targeting spawning females on the spawning grounds during the spawn is allowed? Excuse me. Um, there are some other uh, states uh, in the, um, you know, north of us, uh, Virginia, New York, um, they, they do allow, uh, these are the ASMFC managed species, they do allow um, targeted uh, fishing on the spawning grounds. I think that was, that discussion was actually had at the um, ASMFC meeting about that. Uh, they talked about, um, should that be, um, should they think about curtailing that? Um, so yes, there are some other states that harvest um, fish on, on, the, on the spawning grounds. Um, so that's just the one example I can I'm, I can think of. So, so just Virginia and New York that I know of for for sure. Yes, sir. And striped bass is what they're there's a line they're there line striped bass. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions, Commissioner Roller? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I believe South Carolina doesn't have any restrictions on their spawning grounds. But Georgia. I mean, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't really because they're not part of the ASMFC. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't really. No, I, I think they do allow harbor because most all of the states south of us, you know, they they have they stock their striped bass as right. well. So we, they're they're harvesting probably on. They, I think they do have some natural reproduction, but they're stocking. So as far as I know, I, I think they allow. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if they lie there or not. Yeah, I mean, South Carolina takes its striped bass fishing very seriously, as does a lot of coastal Georgia. They do have wild fish. There's wild striped bass in Florida as well. The very small populations of them. Um, you know, we have this discussion multiple times about um, fish being targeted on the spawning grounds. Did you? Do you have that slide I asked you to about the length distribution? Maybe you could pull up really quickly. Thank you, Charlton. So. When we look at that, is that recreational? So, so this is the um, recreational um, for the 
thermal sign management area. I have on the Roanoke River management area. If you want to look at that one, well, I, I just want to show all three of them. I've yeah, yeah. So all three. So here's here's the so what we're looking at is the length frequency of our um, recreational harvest and aeromoss sign management area. So these are the fish that the krill clerks measure when they talk to fishermen. Um, years across the bottom, the bigger the bubble, the, that means the larger proportion of the fish that year were in that length frequency. And you can see on that uh, vertical axis the, the the length bends. Obviously, very few fish under 18 inches, which is our minimum size limit. Um, and even though we don't have a maximum size limit in air mall sign, you know, they still typically don't tend to catch fish much over 25, 26 inches. You can see a few bubbles in there, especially in the 2000s, you know, when the stock was really at high numbers. Um, so here is the length frequency graph uh, for the recreational harvest in the Rona River management area. And of, and of course, um, the reason it is so constrained uh, is because of their 18 to 22 inch harvest slot. Then no harvest from 22 to 27. Um, and even though they do allow one fish over 27 inches up there, it, it's pretty rare to, to see one in the, in the creel yeah. survey. So that's the Rona River. Um, and then here's the same one um, for the commercial sector. Um, so similar to the reason um, the, you know, the majority of the, the kind of like for the Roanoke River management area, the, the commercial sector, their size of their fish they collect is, is really influenced by the gill net mesh sizes that we allow in the shad fishery mainly. So that's why you see the majority of their harvest is, is in that 20 to 25 inch range. And, and again, this is also why we picked that 18 to 25 inch slot because the majority of the fish that they're normally harvesting anyway uh, from the Flandern shad fisheries are gonna be in that area, but you can see that there are some larger fish um, harvested here, which are gonna get saved um, and add to the expanding age structure. Well, well, hopefully saved, I'm sure there will be some discards, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is we've heard about this complaints about harvesting on the spawning grounds or fishing on the starving ground. If you're really worried about protecting female striped bass, I mean, look at this graph right here. There's a lot more larger females being caught in the gillnet fishery than the recreational fishery, right? And we heard this from our, our you know, Commissioner Cornegy last meeting. It doesn't matter when you kill the female bass. If you kill the, fe if you kill the mommy striped bass on Monday, she can't make baby striped bass on Friday. And if you kill her on the following Monday, she can't make baby striped bass the next year. So does it really matter when you harvest that mature female? Other comments or questions, Mr. Romano? Um, this is kind of related to the same kind of spawning issue. I just, the, the last meeting we, we closed um, shrimping to the crab spawning grounds. It didn't matter. We were not going to have, if we're catching jimmies in there or not, that's the spawning ground. So we just can't interact with them. So there's no pots. So there's no fishing. So I, I, I find it hard to believe that, you know, we're protect that we're allowing fishing, even though that whether you, what size or not they're catching, it's, it's, it's an area we easily close other areas for spawning grounds. Um, so it just doesn't, doesn't really compute for me. Do I'm going to respond. Yeah. To, so, I mean, you know, so don't forget for striped bass, we have a quota. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for crabs and a lot of other fishers, they don't have a quota. What we calculate based on the stock assessment, we calculate the number of fish that we can remove each year. As long as we stay below that, and we're making correct assumptions about recruitment that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, which is some of the reason that we haven't met our quotas, in, you know, previous years, and we've had to reduce it is because we've seen much lower recruitment. So, so it's a little it's a little different in a fishery where that you you have unlimited harvest except for just ever how much effort you have out there, right? Is the the blue crab example? There's not really a well. I guess there's I no guess, there's no effort. You know, there's no. I guess what I'm I'm saying is, you know, if I were able to fish in there, if you were to compare the two. Um, and I was just able to fish in the crab spawning sanctuaries and I threw out the, the spawning females, wouldn't that be similar to uh, catch and release fishing on a spawning ground for striped bass or no? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not the blue crab biologist, but I do think that when you catch uh, spun crabs and you and you throw them back, they typically lose that sponge. Um, I don't know that we have any, um, well, I mean, we, we don't have any evidence that catching and releasing striped bass on the spawning grounds um, affects them in that way. We don't have any way that it is adversely affects their um, spawning potential. I mean, you know, so the, well, if, if fishery has occurred on the, in, you know, on the spawning grounds in the Roanoke River for 
a long time. The stock recovered in the in the 90s, um, 93 um, through 96 and 2000. We really had those big. So just, you know. Yeah, just, I understand. But but as a matter of if we're concerned citizens about Stripe, it seems to be a pretty, you know, we're, we're taking on some pretty heavy measures. Um, what is the reason for allowing that? Is it an economic reason primarily that we allow that on the spawning grounds? I mean, if 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 we're just doing a, a, a we just want to conserve the fish, that would be something that we would we would probably close. But there's probably some economic interests in that area that keep us from doing that. Is, is that kind of the main reason? Hard to say. I, I mean, I don't know if that's the main reason. It is certainly just like any um, fishery anywhere. It is a it is a big economic driver to, to that area. Um, but, you know, like I said before, um, before we even had a fishery management plan or even any memorandum of agreement with the Division Marine Fisheries and the Wildlife Commission um, in the 90s, before we've had any management for striped bass, the fisheries occurred up there. Um, and, and through the through the memorandum of agreements and the FMPs um, that, you know, that's just how the, the fishery has, has been managed with some of the quota going to the Roanoke River management area. So I'm going to the Hermos Island management area and split between the commercial and recreational sectors. And, and initially, how did they go about splitting those up, like the different, um, the Roanoke River fishery and the lower Albemarle Sound, the commercial, how did, how did it all break up or what was the... So it initially, um, everybody was just reduced from their um, what they had traditionally harvested over a time frame. They just looked at that and they said, OK, we're going to reduce everybody's landings by about 80 percent. So that's how they came up with their first quotas um, through the development of the first fishery, real fishery management plan, you know, beyond that memorandum of agreement in 94. Um, that's when the um, commission decided that they would. Um, as when, if and when the stock were to rebuild, uh, that they would increase the quotas uh, for the recreational sectors uh, to match the commercial sector. And I think that parity was uh, achieved with the 1997 quota increase. So that was by design, um, and the you know that was that was the management plan from the 94 FMP was to start out at this level. Um, if stock increased, uh, then they would increase the total allowable landings, um, and they would give more to the recreational sector over a couple of years until they got even, and it's been like that ever since. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Carlson, Commissioner McNeil. So I'm I'm, I'm return back to the question I asked you a while ago, Chalk. I'm looking at this graph that Commissioner Roller pointed out that we're catching bigger females and more females in the commercial on the commercial side. But uh, when we reach our towel or reach get close to our towel, we're shut down for for capture by proclamation. We stop. So at that point, our capture of any striped bass stops. But what you're telling me on the recreational side, when they approach their tow, then they're continuously allowed to capture and catch and release more and more fish along after they reach their tow. Am I correct on that? Uh, yes, sir. Currently, I'm, I'm not aware of any fisheries that we stop. Okay, I, just, that's, I understand. So when we get to that point on the commercial capture in our tow, though, we stop. They keep on. And just based on some information we are given yesterday, I mean, it looks like to me in the CSMA after the commercial trips were closed, there were roughly 23,288 discards. And in the Neuse River alone, there was over 8,365 discards. So when the commercial season is closed and we stop and mommy has escaped past the commercial guys, even when the recreational guys get to their towel and they start keep fishing, hook and release, mommy doesn't escape year round. Mommy can get hooked anytime on the recreational side and mommy can get gut hooked or die or whatever. So, you know, it's not equal. We get stopped, they keep fishing, there's discards involved. That's just the truth of it. The numbers are there. And I mean, it's just like I, I have a close personal friend that fished up there during the the hook and line season when it was open. He carried his wife and eight other women that had a fishing club. They caught 1,436 fish in two days. Now, this guy's pretty much an expert. I mean, that's what he does. He fishes every day. 
And I asked him, I said, well, how many, you know, did you? He said, well, after about the first three or 400, you know, we, we were probably losing one in 11, one in 12 that we thought maybe wouldn't make it. They went to fly fishing and caught the rest, which he said was highly successful. So these numbers are not correlating the same way. We, the commercial side stops, the recreational side keeps fishing, they have discards, and they're going to have death involved in it. There's no way around it. So when you start talking about mommy escaping this and mommy escaping, mommy don't escape. It's just whether or not she bites a hook later. So, I mean, it's not, it's not the same bag on each side is my point. Thank you. Mr. McNeil. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> it gets kind of confusing when we're talking about, uh, you know, up the Roanoke or out in the river. Just to clarify, we only can control what happens in the sounds. We're, I mean, the WRC controls the season, right, for the upper Roanoke? Or how? Sean, would you address that? You can do it better than I can. Is that a, if you're asking um, who, who has jurisdiction in what waters, I don't know. Is that better addressed by the uh, attorneys? Well, who I'm, sets the season? So, I mean, current, currently the Wildlife Resources Commission set, sets the, the seasons based on um, uh, based on the current FMP that we are developing, right? So based on whatever whatever amendment we're in, um, they set their seasons to, you know, com comply with the FMP just like we do, which is, you know, typically is remain below this level of harvest or your total allowable landings. So, Colonel, could you address who controls what in the Roanoke? Who regulates what in the Roanoke? For striped bass, we regulate coastal waters and joint waters, and the WRC regulates inland waters and joint waters. So we work all the way up to the joint water line, and they work all the way up to the coastal line. So it's it's a it's a mutual partnership between the two agencies. So we I appreciate you clarifying that. So we can only regulate what goes in and out of these rivers. We're not setting the seasons for what's happening up above the joint jurisdictional waters. Uh, above the in the inland waters, wildlife regulates that. Yeah. Director. I'm probably going to make this worse. <laughs> but the, the way that, and Sean is going to step in here as soon as I'm done, I'm sure. The way that, that we look at this, um, it, it the Wildlife Resources Commission is responsible for striped bass management in the Roanoke River management area. The Division of Marine Fisheries, the Marine Fisheries Commission is responsible for the management in the Almar Sound management area. And our rules also state, our joint rules also say that both agencies will abide by the fishery management plan, which is statutorily uh, under the authority of this commission. And I'm going to shush up there. And if Sean has anything to add or if I have misspoken in any way, uh, I, I would invite him to jump in here because um, I think this, I think we're getting wrapped around the axle on the jurisdiction of this. Um, and it, it probably does need a clarification. And uh, Madam Director was correct in what she said. Uh, she's referring to uh, 15A. 03Q0107, um, and I think part of the confusion is talking about jurisdiction versus management actions versus uh, those management actions have to be consistent with the fishery management plan. And so uh, each agency has responsibility for management in their respective management areas, but ultimately the, the management actions that are taken are required to be consistent with the FMP. Our FMP. Correct. So whatever we decide to do with our FMP, WRC has to follow that. That is what the rule says. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes. Please come up. Or right there. So, no. Okay. 
<laughs> We're complicated here. Yeah, this is this is different than what I'm normal used to, I should say. So um, when it comes to the Roanoke Albemarle system, uh, by agreement between our two commissions, which is in rule, and in the rule O3Q and 10C, in fact, it's one of the rules y'all be considering later for concurrence with us. It defines the Roanoke River management area and it defines the Almarle Sound management area. And it clearly states that the Wildlife Resources Commission has authority in the, in the Roanoke River management area and the Marine Fisheries Commission has authority in the Almarle Sound management area. And by agreement for the Roanoke River management area, that includes both joint and inland waters where we have jurisdiction. And in the Albemarle Sound area, it includes, y'all have authority for striped bass, at least recreationally, over um, not only uh, coastal, but joint and inland fishing waters. So you set the season, the size, and the creel, even in inland waters in Albemarle Sound. So the tributaries to the Chuan, the tributaries to the Pasqua Tank, those are all set by marine fisheries. On the flip side, in the Roanoke River, we set those regulations for the recreational fishery, fishery all the way from the mouth to Roanoke Rapids Dam by, by agreement, which is codified in rule. So that give us some clarity. Uh, so the, Mr. McNeil. Sorry, quick question. So, but your seasons that you said can't contradict our FNP. If we decide that that season needs to be shut down, y'all can't open a season. Yes, we have jurisdiction on that. We do have a management plan that says we have to be consistent with the FMP. Um, but I think there is some debate over um, the role the role our commission plays in a joint FMP. And so I think it could be debated. As far as you being able to, to shut it down, um, yeah, I, I think the lawyers would get involved pretty quickly because, you know, if it's a joint FMP that we have adopted, um, I, I'm pretty safe to say that our commission would not support an FMP that gave the Marine Fisheries Commission authority over uh, the Roanoke River management area. Good enough for now, I guess. Good enough for now. Okay. Okay. Yes. Cap. Yeah, j just one clarification. The rule states that uh, both commissions will be in compliance with the FMP. But to Christian's point, we have an FMP that is statutorily responsibility of the Marine Fisheries Commission. So it's under the Marine Fisheries Commission's authority. So the Wildlife Resources, to, to Christian's point, the Wildlife Resources Commission is try, really working with us on a plan that statutorily is under your authority. So it does present an issue. And I, I totally agree with Christian that if this commission were to pursue a closing or a discussion about closing on the spawning grounds without the concurrence of WRC, that's going to be uh, that would absolutely be a mess. I'm not trying to guide the, the conversation one way or the other, but I, but I think he's very accurate. It's not it's not going to be just as simple uh, as a as a vote of, of this commission, regardless of the authority. That's my opinion on this, and Sean may may ha want to have if, something, maybe not. If, one if, if I could now, um, if I could clarify one other thing, yeah. the FMP right now, as it's written, gives it, it it continues that agreement that we have authority over the Roanoke River management area. So if the FMP, unless the FMP is changed to, to, to determine who has authority in which area, then I would argue that, that even under the FMP, Marine Fisheries doesn't have the ability to close the Roanoke River management area. Because it clearly is, is the Wildlife Resources Commission's jurisdiction. Same way in the Meharan River, for example, or the Wicacon River. We can't go in and close that fishery to recreational because by agreement, it codified in rule and backed up by the FMP, the Marine Fisheries Commission has authority in those waters for striped bass. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're good enough for right now. <laughs> Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chairman. So this is some clear clear um, clarification stuff from Manny Charlton. 
Thank you. But I'm sure you guys are good too. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming Thanks out, so Rich. Um, so this is the simple one because I think people kind of forget about about this. So the Roanoke River fishery in general is designed to put harvest on the male fish, correct? Because males, like boys in a bar, go and stay there for a while and waiting for the spawning females to come up. So they go, and the females, right, they go up and they don't spend as much time on the spawning grounds. So they go up, spawn, turn and leave. Is that right? For the most part? In general, that's correct. And I would say that anywhere from, you know, 55 to 75 or 80 percent, and Jeremy can correct me, harvest is usually on male, male fish. Okay. So in the commercial fishery, it's a bycatch fishery, correct? Uh, yes, sir. And it's mostly in the shad fishery, correct? Uh, it, 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 it was, it's changed some, you know, when, when we still had a larger striped bass quota um, and the shad fishery had gone down to three weeks, um, the harvest has shifted to other fisheries. But his, historically, it did occur in the, in the shad fishery. Do you still allow shad fishing after the quota is caught or does all the nets come out? Um, in, in recent years, um, we, we have closed the uh, shad fishery earlier, uh, even when the, yes, so when the, when the striped bass quota got caught this last time, um, shad season still had about a week left. We, we took gill nets out of the water. They could um, keep shad from the pound nets, but of mm -hmm. course they were relatively small. So yes, we actually did take the shad nets out of the water when the striped bass quota was caught. And what about other commercial gears? Small mice gear nets, blue crab nets. Do you take those out of the water when the quota is caught? So small mesh nets, we have a requirement to reduce uh, in an effort to reduce discards from small mesh nets because typically, um, you know, 90% of 95% of striped bass caught in small mesh nets are going to be less than 18 inches. Mm -hmm. um, so in order to reduce the discards for the from the small mesh nets, um, really ever since the big 2014, 15, 16 year classes, um, we required the small mesh nets to be tied down as well. And, um, you know, once the end of April gets here, um, we require uh, small mesh nets to be attended at all time. I mean, di discards from the gill net fishery, um, as far as the discard mortality, it's it's similar as it is to, to hook and line mortality. In, in that, the, the cooler the water, the lower the discard mortality, the warmer water um, discard mortality gets really high for both. So that's why we require um, mandatory attendance in the summer and, and basically the small mesh fishery in the summer Except for some mullet up narrow mall sign is pretty much not many trips going on. I understand, but my point is the gear isn't out of the water. You have some restrictions on it, but commercial fishermen can still fish and they could still potentially have bycatch, correct? In in small mesh nets, yes, yeah. sir. But like right now when the flounder season's not going on, there's understood. no flounder nets in the water. Understood. Okay. Yeah, yeah, understood. But there's still strike netting, there's still blue cat fishing, there's still some small mesh netting. That's still allowed, correct? Yeah, that's, yes, what I, that's what I'm getting at, too, because we keep hearing that, well, what are we going to do on the spawning grounds? Maybe we should stop all recreational fishing. It's not like we stop all commercial fishing. We still have plenty of that. And, and I just want to do, when I, for both, for both sectors, One more we, um, we, we, we measure, we, you know, we estimate, we have an estimate of discards, dead discards from both sectors, mm -hmm. and both of that, those numbers go into the stock assessment. Yes, awesome. So, and the one last comment is, I, I'm hearing some fantastical numbers about hook and line catches. If hook and line is really that effective, maybe the commercial industry should take it a little bit more seriously. Okay. Mr. Cross, did you have your hand up? I was just going to just comment on the, you said the shad fishery, most of the bycatch was what size fish? You know, they're, they're 21 to 24 inches in the shad. No, in the, not in the shad, I'm sorry, in the small Masculine net. You said it was 18 inches and below. So in the Albemarle Sound, you know, we we really don't allow a whole lot of just different small mesh. T typically, the only thing they can fish is either three or three and a quarter. They can use strike nets up to four inch, but for a three or three and a quarter inch gill net, which is typically what they would use for the white perch fishery or something. Yes, sir. The the discards are usually 17, 16, 16 inches. 17, and they would be predominantly males. Is that correct? No, they're they're pretty much half and half in the sound. What what we see in the sound, um, you know, the reason they have that shift in males and females is because of their migratory behavior up there on spawning grounds. When when they're back mixing the, the stock in general, um, what we see in the commercial catch um, is is pretty much 50-50 male and female. And what we see in our recreational in our independent gillnet survey is it's about half male and female. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions on the presentation?
Okay, thank you for the good presentation, but just sit tight. We may need you again. All right, we need to move on into our vote on selected, on, on vote to select preferred management options um, for the um, Estuarian Stripe Bass FMP. Uh, you've seen it in your briefing books. We have talked about this at several meetings. Um, the chair would like to entertain some motion. Is there going to be a motion to on anything with this? And I will just remind y'all if y'all have your decision document, you know it has all of the options. And if you you know if you agree with the option A, B, C, or D, you can just pick that one rather than having to write a long motion out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. Chartner, what what are you asking us that we need to go down each one and choose an option out of each one of those six? So so for each so for each appendix, um, you know that's a that's a separate issue paper. Um, you know I would it if you have you know for, for the ones where you may support both the um, already DMF and WRC recommendations. I you know I guess it would be simple enough just to say support the DMF on that one. And if you have particular uh, if you have particular um, issues uh, for each different, um, you know, uh, issue paper like the Cape Fear River or Tarpam News, and you want something different than what we've the division has recommended, then you could you could talk about that one individually, I guess. I think there may be a need to bring these up um, more or less one by one. These options, can we get that up there, Laura? Yeah, and and they're also um, again in in that um, they're in our brief in your decision document. But uh, let me yeah. let me get them back up there right here. Let me just go through. Chairman. Yes. So in your um, blue folders, or I don't actually know if you got blue folders. Um, <laughs> you should have your decision That's document. Right Those have the issues um, listed out, and then it has all of the recommendations listed. And if we are fine with all of these, we can vote on it as a package to, or if there's some need to change anyone along the way, we can do that. And I, I can flip through these slides too, as well as your decision document right there. They, they, both of them will match. And again, in, in that decision document, I think they have them highlighted in different colors if you know both agencies agreed on the, that was a recommendation from both agency and whatnot. There's a lot here and a lot to be considered. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just, just a logistical, if that's the right way to call it, question. Let's take this uh, appendix two. If we were to have a motion to accept the division's recommendations as noted in orange on this document we're looking at, uh, how does that, how did then you? How do we then reconcile that, or how does that get reconciled with WRC's differing opinion? Is that a fair? So everybody um, else may understand that. I'd like to know what what, what you're saying. So how is that going? How is that going? Yeah. So, so for Appendix Two, for for instance, um, you know the the only. The only one of these um, issues that the Wildlife Commission and the division um, disagreed on were, were, was um, issue three, how to address measures that were over the tail. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer for how that's going to get reconciled if y'all were to support the division's recommendation, which is a little bit uh, different. Um, but for Appendix Two, that's the. There's really only a couple of places where we differ. That's Appendix Two, and then Appendix Four in the Cape Fear River, which is for allowing harvest. So luckily, there's you only have a couple of issues where you got to worry about that, and you know. Um, let, let me, sir. Another answer. Let me ask the director this question. Uh, th this is, since has been stated, our FNP, and this is what will happen. What wildlife has done is suggested some changes. Is, is that the best way to kind of describe this? So, I, I really, well, yes, I guess you could describe it that way. We just see these, and I, again, to Charlton's point, these two issues a little bit differently. Um, certainly, you know, the commission has the option of 
uh, going with the Wildlife Resources Commission on these. Uh, that, that is certainly an option that this commission has. My understanding and based on Sean's comments uh, is that this plan is a statutory authority of the Marine Fisheries Commission statute overrides rule uh, in the way that this would work. So um, I, I really don't, other than to say what we've already said, and of course what Sean talked about as well, I'm not really sure what the answer would be. If we do have differences, uh, if this commission um, would like for us to go back and talk to WRC about these issues, I really don't know exactly how that would work, but uh, I, the statutory authority for this fishery management plan lies with this commission, so. Um, let me try to paraphrase what a little bit I've heard right here. The, the you know, this is our FMP, and this is what statutorily um, wildlife will agree to abide by. Wildlife has made some suggestions. They may be better suggestions than what we have. They, and we may just prefer to go along with um, what the division recommended. If we decide to go along with what wildlife recommended, it's a change in um, management options, and it would take a supermajority vote for that to happen. We're just just keeping this in mind. Commissioner Posey. Yeah, better <laughs> okay. Okay, um, Commissioner Cross. So I'm, I'm looking at this. Does each one of these appendixes need a separate motion? We could or we couldn't. We could vote on the whole package as is with the division's recommendations, or if there's somewhere along the way you want to make a change, we could address that one individually. Okay. I, I think I, I can make a motion. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to make a motion, and this is based on, you know, we, we've talked about gill nets that so were blue in the face on this commission, and it's it really, our, the gill net closure that we put into place above the ferry lines, I believe was ill-contrived, and we've had a lot of public comment about that. Uh, it's been a long-standing issue, and so I would make the motion to accept the division's recommendation um, with the... Uh, the reinstatement of the original gill net rules pre that gill net closure. Now, is that for all issues? Yes. Okay. I'll second. And there's a second by Commissioner Cross. So, so just to be clear, that that is specific to Appendix Three. Right. Um, you know, not all issues in all no. areas. No, I, it's, I can, it's just a, Appendix 3. I can do that, it either way. The first bit, I mean, I can do it for just the gear. Um, you know, uh, I believe that that would be not as simple because we had to go back into each one of these uh, appendixes. Yeah. Um, so... Let, let me see if I can make some clarity to it, if I could. You're, you're making a motion to accept the division's recommendation on all appendices, except to reinstate the gill nets above the ferry line. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking I'm thinking it over in my head right now. I may just want to keep it under the heading of the gear restrictions. That way it allows other people in here to perhaps change something in another appendix um, as well. So that will give leaves the door open for that. So you just want to address just the, yes, the gear. gear. Yeah, okay. Correct. All right. Commissioner Posey. So for clarification, we are simply debating Appendix 3, Management Option 1. We could pull that up, too. It would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm reading out the decision document. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. A management option two. So appendix three, management option two. Is that right? Or am I somewhere wrong? I, I don't. Mm, that's not the division not recommendation, the right? That's just clarifying. Yeah, they don't have a recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's right, because it's not. It is a recommendation, yeah. correct? 
Sure. They have yeah. a recommendation for three. But it's not just that we don't. It's not just that we don't have a recommendation. So the commission at their last meeting instructed the division to pull the option yeah. um, for allowing gill nets above the ferry lines from the FMP. So it is not currently an option in this plan. So you want to add it as an option? I would add it as a preferred management uh, option. So not just an option, because then we'd have to debate no. it again. So I'm I'm adding that as a uh, as my as preferred management option. So, in other words, if it were up there, which I wish it was up there, I can I can do it first if we want to get it up there and debate it again. It's essentially the same thing. I mean, that option was taken out. I'd like to put it back in, and I'd like that to be the preferred management option. Okay, do we have the motion up there as was made and seconded? Okay, is that, is that the motion as you made it, Commissioner Romano? Okay, and a question, Commissioner Cross. In this motion, you're approving the rest of the package completely? No. But, but, okay, just explain. No. Just make sure where you're at. Accept a friendly amendment from someone. No, no, I'm just saying. No, this is for, yes, this is for just that particular appendix. Just okay. that particular issue in that particular okay, appendix. Okay, just okay, as long as we're going to okay, itemize it, I'll, I'll still say. Okay, Commissioner Roller. Uh, Chairman, I want to offer a substitute motion. Okay. Go ahead. Um, as a substitute motion, I offer that we keep the current management measures of no gill nuts above the ferry lines and uh, ask the division to do a study as to the effectiveness of that closure to be looked at at the next full amendment as our preferred management option. Okay, sir, so second to this. I'll second, Commissioner McNeil. Any discussion? Walked over you. Okay. Um, I would ask for an amendment to the substitute amendment, um, not by the by the next. Um, so how do you have a conversation? Second, so to keep the yeah, I would um, offer a substitute motion that is not by the next uh, full amendment that this um, research study be done within the next two years, and that at that point the ban be reconsidered based upon the data. Uh, obtained from the study. Could, could I could I clarify something? Maybe I may please, be out of order please. here, but I'm <laughs> I'm not trying to. But so we we have the the next adaptive management for this issue for the tar pan noose. So we so part of the adaptive management is in 2025 we are going to review all of this data through 2024 to do just exactly what y'all. Suggested, but the motion is okay. And the timeline is what I'm thinking of. So three years now. But I'm saying, you know, don't wait five years. Do the study immediately, as quick as possible, um, with a carefully planned uh, assessment of the impacts of the, uh, you know, because well, I have a whole thing written out on this, but I'll describe that. But basically, do a study funded through commercial, recreational, whatever prop, uh, aspects of the bycatch of the gill net, because that's the issue. Um, where you have people placing it out, commercial people placing it out, you assess the bycatch in a one or two year study done over several seasons with sufficient observation um, to address the many concerns that have been uh, um, uh, provided either way. And it's done soon enough that a result is reconciled in a quick time period. So it'd have to be funded. Okay, there is a, you want, got something else, Charlton, you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, hold on, we got, we got it, don't I need to get a second on the motion before we do anything else? I, I was just going to clarify too that. Okay. So we, you know, we, we currently, um, when the observer program has onboard observer trips, um, we, we, we currently estimate commercial discards um, based on a. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. There's. 
Okay, but I'll go ahead and explain it. Technically, I'm not supposed to do this, I guess, until the motion's actually been um, accepted. But I think there's considerable um, debate um, listening today, last night, looking at the um, advisory committee votes and discussions about do we know the effects of the small mesh gill nets in the context of this river system, since every river system has a different context based upon the other associated species and everything else. Um, and do we have sufficient observations to understand the impact in this particular location? Um, you have a fantastic observer program, but we're calling for a targeted experimental analysis where someone will go in to experimental gill netting, um, you know, in an area that has been closed for several years, um, look at the potential bycatch um, with a targeted um, lot greater than normal observations as opposed to the randomized um, sort of structured randomized something. So this is not I'm not saying we should do it as the regular part. This is a targeted project that would have to be funded through one of the funding sources. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, I need to get a second on this. I need to try to get a second for it. Chair, point of order. Okay. First off, we need to get the rest of your uh, substitute motion up there. Let's make sure we get that up there. I'm trying to follow Rogers. So hold on. But, okay, but quick point of order is on Robert's rules. Okay. okay. Can I just clarify if if, if uh, uh, Commissioner Posey's motion is a friendly amendment or a full substitute motion? Yeah, that's up to you. And who seconded? It's up to you. It's up to me. <laughs> Why is it? Because you made it. Well, yeah, it was a friendly amendment. Make it, but that, I think the, to be a friendly moment, it has to be approved by the original approver and the original yeah. seconder. Yeah. So, if if you may, okay, let me clarify. First, first off, get your, get your motion up there, and then you're proposing a fin friendly amendment to his. He's got to agree to it, correct? And then we still don't have a second on yours yet. Right. Unless it's a friend, friendly man, they just agree to it if it's a friendly man. That's right. Okay. All right. I, I would agree for the sake of compromise. I would be willing to accept Commissioner Posey's friendly as amendment. a friendly amendment. Okay. All right. Now, is all your motion up there? I don't think it is, is it? Well. Hey, get the last part of the motion up there. The last part of the motion, as I originally said, was to study the effects of the gill net closure to be reevaluated, something along the lines of this, at the next full amendment, which would be five years. Okay. Let's get this up there. Okay, is that your motion? Is that your substitute motion as you have made it? Yes. And you have accepted the friendly amendment to your motion? Um, I've accepted the friendly amendment, though I would ask to clarify that um, what the terms of the study would be, if it would be more than one season or a couple seasons. Um, I think the um, study worth it. The study. Speaking in mic, please. Oh, mic. Um, so, I think we want to do something relatively quickly because, as you mentioned, 2015 will be with the adapted management, the time at which this could be reviewed and so we can move fairly quickly. I think that's important. It's been three years. Um, what I would envision, and I'm thinking, you know, as writing proposal, um, that we actually, I'll back up because um, I'm getting ahead of myself. In listening to the concerns, there's considerable concern about the potential impact, um, I think, by catch of uh, the small mesh scale nets that has been expressed. I think there are some people, there, there's suggestion that have minimal effect. There's suggestion that there's insufficient data to really assess the effect. And there are some suggestion that there's more effect. Um, I'm also aware that the potential effect of a gear such as gill nets can depend upon what other fish are there. 
that determines on what you might catch. Can you depend upon the season? Um, Geonetting in January, February may have different potential for bycatch than something in the middle of the summer. So, given this, um, I think that it is um, very, um, I think it's important that we actually look at this issue in an experimental fashion to really test to see what the impacts are, given it is an issue that receives such strong um reaction on all sides so what i'm suggesting um continue the um yield net closure within the next year or two i understand this based upon funding so you have to find a funding source institute a um, controlled experimental design where you actually place out yield nets presumably done by fishermen so it can be done in the way in which fishermen are done um, have targeted observe, um, observers as you would as if you were submitting this for a proposal to look at the bycatch um, amongst the various seasons. From that result, you can then come in 2015 with the adaptive management and with more data, we can make a, a much clearer um, decision, I think, that would help deal with some of the comments about lack of data. So that's the rationale okay. on the actual design. You know, I, I could write something out right now, but that's, I'm not, that's not my job. Um, they gave the rationale for your friendly amendment. amendment friendly amendment. Okay. So the details right. would be worked out. You know, I could write a proposal, but I'm, I'm not a fish biologist. Commissioner, Mc Commissioner McNeil, do you accept the friendly amendment? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Commissioner um, Blanton. This sounds like fishermen fishing with an observer on the boat. That's all it sounds like to me. So instead of going through all this rigmarole of formulating some sort of study, of the effects of this and that and blah, 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 because, you know, hooks have effects. <laughs> I mean, you know, how, why is that so, so, so easily avoided at this table? You know, them hooks catch fish too. There ain't been a net up there since 2019 when uh, the abrupt meeting happened and i got a phone call hey be here the next day oh where and didn't he know what was going on but th this is nothing other than observers riding on a boat with a fisherman that sets a net that's what we already got now any common sense that could come to this would be maybe hey let's let's require 50 percent, 75 percent observer coverage above them lines for that line to stay open. That makes more sense to me. I think that would be, be a more reasonable approach to all of this. If you want to study anything, then then let, let's go on and beef up that observer coverage. You don't, you, you want to scrutinize the observers and, and, and the observer coverage we have right now, let's just go ahead and suit that stuff right on up. We got the money to pay the people to go out there and do it right now. That The program's already in place. We have already done this and it's ludicrous to sit here and and come up with some scheme that's really going to be not, not productive for anything the division is not going to take the time to go out there and 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 and, and study the effects there they don't have the manpower nobody is going to uh, as a biologist going to go out there and fish as a fisherman would and study what they're catching because we already have that program. So I'm just not sure what we're even doing right now. We're, we're pretty much wasting our time. You're either going to open it up and go fishing, give the recreational crowd their fish back, let them keep the stripers that are up there, and, and just let's go on about it. Or we're going to keep it closed we're going to not allow anybody to harvest the fish up there. And that's what it's going to be. But th this is not a compromise to me. Now, what's crazy to me even more is that a recreational
commissioner is speaking on this subject and there's not a commercial guy here that would even agree with that. So, I mean, what are we doing anymore? Seriously. And I got a question. I got a question for Charlton. Charlton, what's what's going on above that ferry line? Where did them fish go? Did you tag any? Y'all tag any fish up there? Where did they end up? Did did they get re any returns? Are, are you talking about just in general or in general. specifically? So yes, sir. I mean, we 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 tag fish. Um, I mean, we, we currently gillnet sample in all of this area. Our independent gillnet survey occurs. We, we tag fish, um, Vimco tags, uh, external anchor tags. Um, some of those fish that um, are in the lower noose, lower tar pam, they're fish for the Albemarle Royal Oak stock that are resident there in the fall, winter, uh, and then go back up the Roanoke, Oak, and some of those fish will go up the tar pan and, and noose to spawn. So they, they really kind of mix between um, both those two systems. Um, and, and again, depending on any particular year class strength, the, the bigger the spawn for the AR stuff, the more fish we'll see in the central southern area, the, the smaller the year classes, and when the total population is smaller, the less fish we'll see from the AR in that central southern area. And a and follow-up question here is, is you know, do we really know the survival rates of these of these stockfish? I mean, do do you have any any answers on that stuff? Uh, you know, what did the genetic testing come back to look like? You know, we only we ain't heard any of this stuff. So you know, in my mind, I still keep the same same mentality that these fish are bought and paid for fish. They're stock fish. All I hear is it's not a productive system. The only productive system we have in the state of North Carolina is the, is the Roanoke River, right? The Almaw Sound Roanoke River population. That's the only productive. Every other place is unproductive for striped bass. So why have we taken the fish away from the recreational angler and in turn taken nets away from from the from the the commercial fishermen that could that could very much so use them to catch bait and other species that we're allowed to that we're allowed to harvest and allowed to have. Uh, that's my biggest question to this commission. Why have we done that? Because it makes no sense to me. We've turned this hole into a big science project at the will of the people. The people have sacrificed for nothing. And that's wrong. We shouldn't approach it that way. All in the all in the all in the sake of getting a handful of commercial fishermen out of a recreational man's way. Just a handful. That's it. These boys just want to go up there and, and, and catch a few handful of fish that they're allowed to catch. And, and that's all they're asking. But we have to turn it into this great big study when we already have everything in place, the infrastructure is already there. Just don't understand it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, judging by some of the comments that were made yesterday in the public comment session and, and some of the conversation here today, I want to point out that commercial fishing isn't banned in the Upper Noose River. You can still cast net there and do other things. There's just no gill netting. Okay. So it's not like commercial fishing is banned. And the fishermen who came here yesterday, they said a couple of things. They said, for the most part, I want to shad net again and I want to bait mullet again, bait mullet fish. I would like to remind everybody that our shad fishery is worth almost nothing, tens of thousands of dollars. Some of those rivers are less than $10,000. Very low value fishery. It's also a depleted fishery, that's why. And when it comes to mullet, that's another depleted fishery, right? We just heard the presentation, overfish with overfishing occurring. We're gonna have a hard time trying to figure out a way to regulate that fishery. I'm really interested to see what the division comes back to, but you know, to expand more of that fishery now, I think is technically irresponsible at this time. But I would point out that we, we do have the infrastructure there. We do have the observer program. But if we want to study, we're going to have to do more. I mean, you know, lacking in a lot of data due to COVID, 
you know, during which we, this point in time, small mesh observer coverage is very low across the state. It's not required to be much higher. Um, we're going to have to do a little bit better. And if we're going to have a study, I hope that it is more representative of the fishermen in the study, because that is one criticism of the observer program that I would offer. And it's not due to staff. It's due to the fishermen. You have a hard time getting people to call you back and schedule observer trips. So the data that we do have, I'm very concerned, is not representative of how the fishermen fish and of the fishermen in general. So I hope if we do a study, we can get a little bit more beyond that and see what people are catching. Thank you. Commissioner Cross. The real problem I have boils back to the same thing I've talked about a couple of times. This is nothing more than a fight over allocation. That's what this is. It's a simple fight over allocation. And in that, in that argument, it's always made out that the commercial fishing industry or the commercial fishing side is doing more damage than the recreational side. And we all know sitting here now that in a lot of these fisheries, that is not the case. There are more takes, more discards, or just plain dead fish at times coming from the recreational side other than the commercial side. And I go back to this Rachel's and Rick's report that some of the people love the champion, and it clearly states in here, the inability to include recreational angling as an exploitation factor reduces the amount of variability in spawning stock mortality that can be accounted for in this study. The median annual recreational harvest during 2014 was 2,337 kilograms and similar to the medium commercial harvest of 3,355 for the same period. Thus, the actual commercial harvest and recreational harvest exploitation rates are similar. And observations supported by simulation studies, it is likely that the inclusion of factors that represent recreational harvest and discard would perform comparably to the results of the commercial harvest factor used in the linear modeling. So, I mean, both sides are catching and killing fish. Why it always has to be skewed that the commercial side is doing more damage, especially now with the boys with the gear they've got on gill nets and targeting certain species, is, it's unfounded. And this is more, nothing more than another witch hunt to get the nets out of an area that they hope they can expound on later. And I don't have a problem with studying like Martin's talking about. I don't have a problem with that at all. But it's also like Commissioner Blanton's talking about. The pieces are in place. We can change and demand more observer coverage, and we've got the same thing that you're asking for right then. So why have we got to go around and make another dart game to get the same end results when we have the pieces in place we can move on immediately? And that's my problem with the friendly amendment right there is that in a nutshell, we can move on this a lot quicker and get that information back a lot quicker than what it's going to take to do that and write up the proposal and everything else if we demand greater observer coverage and let the fishermen go back to fishing because we're not doing any more damage on that, on that area than the recreationals are doing with the discards they've got. And if it's such a big damage that we are doing to this area with these nets up the Noose River and up above the ferry lines, compare it to the damage being done on the spawning ground. And I'm not an advocate for closing down the spawning ground. I'm not an advocate for that at all. I think it's something that everybody wants to monitor closely. But when you look at the number of fish caught above these ferry lines by these different gill netters and compare them to what goes on up there on the spawn, I man, it don't even compare. I mean, it, it just doesn't. It doesn't make sense. So how are you going to argue, we're going to shut them down there, but we're going to keep fishing on the spawning ground? I mean, a, a second or third grader can argue that argument. It just don't make sense. So that's my problem with this. I mean, I, you know, I think that the, the discards and whatnot are a problem. I think they're going to continue to grow and be the biggest problem. And I think the catch and release is going to ultimately turn into catch and quit when it's time. When you're shut down, you're shut down. But I'm, you know, I fully believe that this can be implemented a lot quicker if we mandate greater observer coverage. And then let's go ahead and go and let's let's get it on. Let's go fishing. Thank you, Commissioner Roller. 
Thank you, Chairman. I, I want to thank Commissioner Cross for two of his admissions here. First of all, in saying that this is an allocation fight, you are right. So when the NCFA comes here and says there's no scientific evidence for removing gill nets, what they're saying is, I want my allocation. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So it's an allocation by the retention of gill nets because a dead fish is a dead fish, right? A dead fish is a dead fish and you have to ask what's the greater value to the economy. And in most cases, in many cases, not all cases, it's recreational. We heard an NCFA employee come here last night in public comment and said, when a fish is caught and released and dies, it's of no good to anyone. It's no good to you if you're gonna catch it and sell it. But the process of recreational fishing, whether that fish is harvested, caught and released is a $2 billion industry to this state, a $2 billion industry. And for some reason, we don't seem to understand or appreciate the economic importance of it. I also want to say I appreciate you saying that you think recreational fisheries should be shut down if quotas are met. You said you said catch and quit. And I, I think that's very important that you said that. So I do have a question, for Charlton, the, the circle full circle. So when we look at harvest in the ASMA or the, the mortality numbers, we include recreational discards, correct? Uh, yes, sir. We include all discards from both all sectors. Thank you. So when we look at the harvest numbers, they include all our discards, correct? In the yep. stock. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Cross and Commissioner Posey. So when I said catch and quit, I mean it mandated that it's time that we stop fishing on a fish that's already overfished on either side. It's like when they tell you to take the commercial gear out of the water, we take it out of the water, we stop. If we're mandated by quota or whatever to quit taking this particular fish and that particular gear, we have to take it out by proclamation, and that's what we do. And then also you're talking about, no, I didn't, I hadn't had anybody say that the NCFA is trying to get allocation. They're just trying to make sure that the science dictates the policy. That's all they're trying to do. And when I'm, and you know, so when I say catch and quit, I mean if if they came to you and told you tomorrow, all right, this is the date, you got, you're going to stop fishing for these fish, and you've got to stop because your discards are going to be a problem going forward. Would you stop? That's what I'm getting at, because we, we, we're mandated, and when we are mandated, we have to stop. Mr. Posey. Oh, I, just want, I just wanted to kind of clarify something that sometimes when I speak quickly, I may, may not speak accurately. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the comments that have been said. And the one thing I want to make sure I emphasize is I am not saying um, one aspect is more of a problem than the other. Um, you know, I guess there was controversy when this um, ban originally went into place. I was not on the commission then. Um, and I think there's been... Um, discussion in terms of the recreational bycatch, and so I'm in no way saying anything about recreational discard mortality rather than commercial. My comment was more related that this seems to be something that this one piece here um, is something that's argued a lot, uh, was at least included considerably in public comments and has been discussed by um, advisory committees, and they were, they were um, somewhat varied. I mean, on your advisory committees, you had one that was 551. Yet another one was 711, which was, you know, very strongly to go ahead and allow access. But the one that, the last one that, um, you know, the other one that voted act to allow more access was four, but then five people did not vote. So that's not saying one's right or the wrong. I'm just saying this little piece seems to have a dramatic amount of controversy to it. And so that's why I'm suggesting that, you know, we, we need to spend a little bit more effort on something that's receiving a lot of public attention and um, uh, user attention and and um, attention from the people who are really involved in it. Um, you have a great observer program. I understand that. Um, but I suspect if you consulted some of the people who know much more than I do, they might suggest some some recommendations in terms of replication by season um, that would, might make it just a little bit more targeted for a short period that could add to your extensive uh, monitoring program, which is fantastic as it is. And that's sort of what, that is what I'm suggesting. And you know who to consult with on that, you know, the various experts and how to do that within the state. 
Okay, um, I think we've hit all the pertinent points. Kat, do you want to add something to this, please? Yes, sir. Just real, real quick about uh, Commissioner Roller's um, offerings there. Certainly, and, and staff reminded me of this, and y'all have even touched on it in your conversations about what the division, the data that the division is currently collecting in these areas. And we do tagging. We have our observer program, which we've talked about. We also have our uh, Gillnet study, uh, which we collect data on. And I'm not certainly I just want to clarify that we couldn't possibly get funding for a focused study and do it within two years time. We couldn't even probably get the funding. I mean, we could get the funding, but it's going to take time to set up the study. And I would ask staff that in addition to the data that we're currently co collecting, what what in, a, what in addition to that will we currently collect? With the with the caveat that we could uh, expand the observer program, focus it in the places and the time periods where we know is most important. But outside of that and our Gilnet data and our tagging data, that's already a lot of data that we can look at. Uh, as well as different uh, landings data from below the ferry lines and things like that to determine the effects of the gillnet closure. So for Commissioner Roller, his recommendation to look at that in the next amendment review would certainly give us time to collect additional data and look at those data uh, to potentially come back with some uh, an, another well-flushed-out issue paper that would cover this issue. But again, I have to remind the commission that this issue, the division did not even finalize, I'm not offering this, Lord help me. The division did not finalize a recommendation on this issue because the commission pulled this issue from the FMP. It's not an option in the plan. So we we'll certainly will need some direction on that, but to do something that is pinpoint focused on this in a two year time period is not reasonable for us. And if staff has anything to offer about the data or what additional data we might look at, please, please feel free. And one last comment from Commissioner Hendrickson. It might not be the last, but it's going to be the last for this before we vote. <laughs> so we should, we should then all listen to what the director just said, and yeah. we should be mindful that we sit here today uh, probably on the heels of a reasonably illegal action by this, by this commission in 2019. Uh, we ignored the science. We got reprimanded by a letter from the secretary. The director refused to to go to go the direction that the commission went at the time because there were the votes there to go there, not because it was the right place to go to. And um, he didn't. Uh, his his information is in the record, but you know when you look at that, you look at the other data. The the division has the data. They had the data then and said there's nothing here to justify it. So we are ignoring the data. We did then. We apparently still are now. I, I get the concept um, and would, uh, would be okay with the concept of a, of a study if it could be handled under the umbrella of the adaptive measures uh, over the next couple of years. And ha but, but to drag it out for, I don't know when it would come back around again, with it basically waiting for science to prove the science when the in when the science never you know there was nothing ever disproved it was ignored and so maybe the science is are we already have the data we probably somewhat inadvertently for some of us maybe took that issue off the table from the commission so they're they're not sitting here telling us that the that the um, above the ferry line issue, the ban is valid at all. So I'm not sure what we're doing, asking them to re-verify that which they they haven't said shouldn't be there at all. Well, that's been something that came about in a, in a couple of years ago. Um, again, I I think there's real questionable procedures back then. Um, and we ignored our own science. Um, and actually, I think you know, in terms of meeting something that would that would comply with comply with, um, let me get my letter right. Your adaptive uh, which one? Under management measures under three. 
I'm not sure that getting a very stringent observer program on a limited season as suggested by Commissioner Blanton isn't the path of least resistance, the most common sense way to make it happen and something that can happen in measured measured ways during the next two years. And, I'm, and if it turns out that, that the data from that proves that it should, that the net should be out, they should be out. But then you've got something that's, you've got then a more precisely um, data-based decision. We're sitting here today making a decision. We're, we're talking about a decision that was not database at the time. And, and in fact, it violated the data. And it's one of the few times that I'm aware of where a director and a secretary both re reprimanded this commission for ignoring the data. So I think that puts that's an odd place for us to be at this point. So I wouldn't get any of us on any high horse to say, well, we've got to protect the sanctity of th this process, because this, this particular one has not been a particularly process that any of us should be proud of. Okay, um, we're going before we, we're going to go to a vote on this. Uh, um, I think it's important. Okay, uh, I think the um, uh, I think it's what it's been said that um, suggested that a, a change is necessary that we should say conduct it preferably within two years. That will provide the division the full flexibility. So I, I think that um, I think that's, that point has been well made. Okay, so it's so is your friendly amendment and that that provides the, the division the, okay. the latitude to, to do it within the time frame that's needed okay okay i'm going to add one more comment where we we've, we've i think we've hit on everything we need to about this on 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 both on all angles uh, what happened in 2019 was strictly by the statute it was an emergency meeting all the lawyers approved it it was done uh, people might some people might not have liked the results or like what happened but three and a half years ago and nothing's been said about it since then so it was done the right way am i not am i correct shown yes thank you okay call the question okay uh, uh, Real, real quick. W would you entertain um, allowing uh, the the previous regulations in gill nets and doing a study simultaneously, and then in two years we reevaluate? Would you uh, would that work for you as as an amendment, friendly amendment? Um, no, because um, I think that this stuff, this is the topic's received an awful lot of controversy and. I understand what um, Commissioner Blanton's saying, but I think that if you can get it with the least variables possible to look at it within a couple of years, it'll make a more it'll make a much stronger case when combined with the excellent broad level um, um, information that's provided through the um, observer program that's broadly spread throughout the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm going to call the question on this. We're going to vote on the substitute amendment with the friendly amendment. Now, so, excuse me, substitute motion with the friendly amendment. So we're going to do a roll call vote on that. Laura, would you conduct that, please? Commissioner Cross? No. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? No. Commissioner Hendrickson? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Romano? No. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion passes 5 to 3. Now, since this did not come in from the advisory committees, oh, Okay, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, now we voted on this as a substitute motion. Now it is the motion. Now we got to vote on the motion. So Laura, would you conduct a roll call? Mr. Chairman, point, yes. point of order. Yes. Yes. Point of order, yeah. Okay, point of order. I'd like to discuss the motion once again. 
Martin, to, to, to study something, you have to create data. Mm -hmm. You're not creating any data up there. To study the effects, you have to let the fishermen fish. You have to let the, the fishermen be observed and you have to actually create that data. Right now, you don't have that data. You have data previous to 2019. That's it. That's all you got. So to study something that doesn't exist and put that in the hands of the D Division of Marine Fisheries and task them with that study makes zero sense to me. Because I'm going to reiterate this again. We have the infrastructure in place paid for right now to implement a data, a data set, build that data set, letting people fish. You gather that observer data, you, you require that observer data to be up there above 50%. Let's go right on ahead and shoot for the moon. You want to put some people on some boats, get above that line? We got to have 50, 75% coverage, put them people to work. You want to know, they'll show you. But right now, this motion right here don't mean nothing. This is a feel good motion right here. This doesn't create anything. Nothing at all. It creates a, a smoke screen. And I can promise you that because there will not, there's not going to be data to look into. Just not. How do you gather data from a closed area? task the division to gather this data, what are you going to turn them into fishermen? They don't get paid to do that. So this, this, this doesn't mean anything. Nothing is going to come from this. I can, I can reassure you because there's no data to look at that's new. And that's just, a, that's just a fact about it. And I think you should understand that more than anybody sitting at this table. We're not creating new data to study here. We're keeping an area closed and asking somebody to somewhat imagine up some data and study it that is not even real. So I just can't understand what this achieves and where this is a compromise because this is not a compromise. This is just kicking the can of this these lines and above them being closed. That's it. And we're gonna come back and say, well, what did y'all gather? Well, we didn't have no data. Why? Because it won't nobody fishing. So what are you going to compare it to? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, we've got a substitute motion that was passed that has now become the motion. That's up there on the board. Call roll call. Or Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. You, you started speaking and then you stopped relative to what's your threshold for these upcoming votes? Uh, okay, well, excuse me. Sorry. Go right ahead. I, I was asking you. I, I thought you were asking Sean whether this was whether you were in the major, super majority or just simple majority. No, uh, this is. Of course, either way, it's going to be. It's five versus six, but this is just a straight. Majority. Okay, this is just a straight majority. Okay, okay, just, right. sure thing. No problem. Yes, real quick, please. Madam Director, you got a question coming your way. Madam Director, just just a quick question in the text of this particular program that's being suggested versus putting more observers on the boats now immediately and opening it back up so far as getting effort back in there and opening it back up with 50 to 75 percent observer coverage which way would be the easiest way to implement and which way would get the most data back the quickest. I mean, I, I don't really know if I can really answer that. The only, the only thing I can say about the data that we have is our independent gillnet surveys. We have that data and that's basically what we have. To your point, we are closed. We don't have observer data in that area, but we have independent gillnet survey data in that area as well as the area south of that, that we are continue with, we have not stopped collecting. Right, but if we were to consider these two on a level playing field, which one could be implemented the quickest with the least amount of effort 
and get you information back the quickest now if we could get the, the observer coverage in place. I mean, I, I don't think one or the other. I mean, we can certainly, if the commission, I mean, to me, I still think this begs the question regarding what happens to this vote if this commission decides that they want to reconsider uh, allowing gill nets above the ferry lines in this fishery management plan, in my opinion, based on our process, we would have to go back out to the public. As we went to the public the first go around, they saw a draft FMP that did not have this option in there. Uh, that's my opinion on, on, on what we'd have to do with this. No, I understand, so, and I agree. Uh, I'm just, uh, what in my last, I guess the last thing I'm going to ask, and I'm going to hush. In your opinion, is there any scientific information whatsoever right now towards harming the striped bass stock that would prohibit this regulation going back to where it was prior to 2019? So I, I don't see that we have any additional data prior to the data that we leaned upon in 2019 for our recommendation. We understand the bycatch concerns relative to discards and gill nets, but we also um, have data that we looked at to provide our guidance at that time, and we do not have any additional data that would, would speak to that. Okay. Roll call. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? No. Thank you. Commissioner Hendrickson? We get that we try not. So. Commissioner Hendrickson. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Romano. No. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes five to three. Okay, this was uh, a change on one of the articles that we were looking at in the whole plan. Um, does anybody else have anything specifically in this plan that uh, we need to look at, possibly add and change, or what have you? And Commissioner Rowland. I would move that we accept the division's recommendations. Accept the division's recommendations for the, for the FMP. Correct. Okay. Is there a second to this? No, second that. Second, Commissioner McNeil. With, with the change that was just made. Correct. Okay. All right. Just, just a matter of clarification. Yes. What we just did wasn't so much a change as the addition of the comment about research. Um, yeah. Yeah. So otherwise it was the same. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion on this? All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Cross? No. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? No. Thank you. Commissioner Hendrickson. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Romano. No. Thank you. Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Motion passes five to three. Charlton, thank you and you guys for your work on this. Uh, let us take a short break, 10 minutes.
mean, I, I, I'm just, I, I was, um, I kind of like shoes. Yeah. It's too sell. So, is that not automatically accepted that that's part of the process and not had to make a motion to do it? Because we have to do it. We're statutorily bound to do it. We'll just do it. Sure. You want to bring this back up this round? No. I don't. But I also don't want to give them any True. extra chance to try to challenge what happened. All right. So, so let's do it. Yeah. All right. So vote to amend the agenda first, or can they just vote? We need to send it. We could say that this generally. It's that step. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think. Okay. Your lawyer said you don't vote to amend the agenda. I do. Well, what do you, you just, say? I say you just say. I, we need sometimes to I believe you more. I believe him. I just make stuff up. I would. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's get our seats, please. <laughs> All right, one, two, three, four, five, seven. Okay. Okay, one over one overlooked little piece of business. Uh, we need to have a motion second and pass to send um this um, amendment to to the secretary and the general assembly for comment. So may I have such a motion? So moved. So moved by Commissioner Roller. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner McNeil. Any other discussion on this? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. All right. Moving on to amendment three of the Southern Flounder FNP. Mike, take us away. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As many of you know, I'm Michael Leffler, lead for Amendment 3 to the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. With me is Ann Markwith, co-lead for the FMP. Today we are here to present where we are in the timeline for Amendment 3 and a brief overview of the Commission's preferred management strategies for Amendment 3 to the North Carolina Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. In February, the MFC selected its preferred management strategies. Draft Amendment 3 was forwarded to the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality, who notified the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee on Agriculture and Natural and Economic Resources of management changes. No additional comments were received from the Secretary or the Legislative Committee. Today, you will all vote on final adoption of Amendment 3 to the Southern Founder FMP. Once approved, the division will implement the commission's management strategies by a proclamation. Before we move on to today's action item, we wanted to review the commission's February 2022 preferred management strategies for Amendment 3. We will begin with sustainable harvest, which establishes the strategy of setting annual harvest quotas for the commercial and recreational fisheries. For the commercial fishery, these quotas will be divided into various area and gear combinations, and the division will have the ability to set trip limits for either the pound net and gig fisheries only after meeting closure thresholds. This means that when landings are approaching the harvest limit, the division will close the fishery and evaluate if there is sufficient quota remaining to reopen under limited catches. The recreational fishery will be limited to a single season with a bag limit of one flounder per person per day, but no harvest allowed using recreational commercial gear licenses. In conjunction with the recreational harvest quota, a season from March 1st through April 15th for an ocean hook and line fishery for oscillated flounder has been selected. It's important to remind everyone that any southern flounder caught whether harvested or released, will count against the total allowable landings for the southern flounder quota. Additionally, added protections for southern flounder while traveling through inlet areas or slot limits were not selected for implementation at this time. Adaptive management has been selected, and as a management strategy, it will allow the division to alter regulations to manage the quota to minimize overages within this plan instead of drafting additional amendments to make necessary changes in the near future. 
A strategy to allow the continued use of large mesh gill nets to harvest southern flounder has also been selected. In addition to the management strategies developed under Amendment 3 to the, MF, the MFC passed, a resolution recognizing the potential for a future moratorium on the southern flounder fishery based on if there are excesses in the allowable catch of southern flounder for both sectors, as well as a motion that updates the timeline for transition of allocation between the commercial and recreational fisheries for two years. This changes the date of 50-50 allocation from 2024 to 2026. In addition to the previous division recommendations, there are some management measures that will carry over from Amendment 2 to maintain the reductions. These include minimum distances between commercial gears, commercial gear requirements like the six inch minimum mesh size, five and three quarter inch escape panels and pound nets, and the 15 inch minimum size limit. The requirement for removal of commercial gears outside of the season if they interact with southern flounder, possession requirements outside of seasons, and finally recreational requirements like the 15 inch minimum size limit. The action item before the MFC at the conclusion of this presentation is to vote on final adoption of Amendment 3 to the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. Thank you for your time. We look forward to the completion of this amendment that includes recommendations for comprehensive long-term management strategies to rebuild the Southern Flounder stock. At this time, Ann and I will be happy to answer any questions you have before moving to your action item of voting for a final adoption of Amendment 3. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Commissioner Croft, you, you comment? Nathan, just waving at me? Okay, hold on a second. Let's see if there's any questions or comments. Commissioner Roller. Were any comments received during its review? And if so, can you, by the secretarial and legislative review, were any comments received? And if so, could you let us know what they were? No comments were received. None at all? Zero? None. Not passed along I, to us, no, sir. Okay, I, th I thought I heard someone say no significant comments, so just clarifying, clarifying on that. Thank you. Okay. All right, if nothing else, uh, Commissioner Cross? I make a motion. We approve the Southern Flounder FMP Amendment 3 as presented. So second, Commissioner Posey. Okay, let's get a motion up there. Right, motion as you made it and okay any further discussion if not roll call vote please. you got a got a comment hold on yes i just want to clarify before we vote why i will oppose this that's okay chairman okay. So I'm, I'm going to oppose this not because i don't support the recommendations of the division but i support don't support them in their entirety my concern is this fishery looks exactly here as it does right now. And I don't believe that we are going to make substantial changes towards sustainability fishing as we do today. And I wish that we were moving towards something that looked different with less gill nets, more pound nets, more gigging, and also a different allocation. Um, in addition, I'm concerned about the paybacks by recreational fishermen. And, uh, you know, even the NCFA came out and said that when it comes to paybacks that we should not be doing such for the recreational fishery and it, until a time in which we could have better real-time reporting. Um, you know, and that is something that I would have been supportive only because it's nice to have a deadline behind you, right? So that is just my rationale as why I will oppose it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Roller. Any other discussion on this? If not, roll call vote, please. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Ah. Uh, Thank you. Commissioner Hendrickson. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. No. Thank you. Commissioner Posey. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. No. Thank you. Commissioner Romano. Abstain. 
Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle. Abstain. Motion passes four to two to two. All right, thank y'all very much. Okay, moving on to our rule suspension, Steve. It wasn't even worth the travel for my in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good afternoon. I'm Steve Poland, Fishery Management Checks Section Chief, and today I'm gonna briefly review the rule suspension memo located in your briefing materials and ask that you consider new temporary rule suspensions MFC rules 03M515 and 03L0105. <clears throat> so in accordance with DMF management policy and MFC rule and general statutes, the director may suspend in whole or in part any MFC rule that may be affected by variable conditions until the next meeting of the commission, at which time the MFC may vote to delegate to the director the authority to continue to suspend the rule um, the MFC may vote to suspend the rule indefinitely for a fixed period of time or until external conditions change or established triggers occur. Following a vote by the MFC to suspend a rule, the division will update the MFC at each meeting with a memo detailing the current list of suspended rules and verbally review the list of suspended rules annually at every November meeting of the MFC. So today there are rule suspensions for you all to consider as action items. First, the director suspended a portion of rule 03M515 dolphin fish, specifically section A2. Um, the suspension was needed to issue proclamation FF30 2022, which reduces the vessel limit of dolphin from 60 fish to 54 fish to comply with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Amendment 10 to the Dolphin and Wahoo FMP, um, <clears throat> which is associated federal rules when um, went into effect May 2nd. Secondly, the director has suspended a portion of Rule 03L-105 titled Recreational Shrimp Limits, specifically Section 2 of that rule. The suspension was needed to issue Proclamation SH4-2022, which removes the prohibition of possessing more than four quarts heads on or two and a half quarts heads off of shrimp per person per day with a cast net from areas close to shrimping and allows 48 quarts heads on or 30 quarts heads off of shrimp per person per vessel per day with a cast net for recreational purposes in all coastal fishing waters. The suspension was needed to implement these recreational cast net provisions from Amendment 2 to the North Carolina Shrimp FMP and is effective May 15th, 2022. So the division recommends that the MFC consider voting to suspend the aforementioned portions of Rule 3M515 and 3L105 indefinitely to allow the director and the division to continue to manage the dolphin and shrimp fisheries under variable conditions. I've provided draft motion language on the screen for your consideration, and I'm now happy to take any questions. Questions or comments? Okay. Or do you want me to scroll down? Yeah. Okay, these are the... Um, requested or needed uh, rule suspensions. Can the chair's looking for a motion to um, uh, to approve this? Commissioner Blanton. Mr. Chairman, I move to suspend portions of the following rules for an indefinite period. 15A NCAC 03M.0515 Dolphin Section A2 and 15A NCAC 03L. 0105 recreational shrimp limits section two. Okay, motion has been made. Is that second. a second? Second, second. Uh, Commissioner Hendrickson. Any other discussion? If not, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. All right. All, all right. right. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Catherine, rulemaking guru, come on up.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Catherine Bloom, for those who don't know me, and I'm the division's rulemaking coordinator. And I'm glad to be here today before you. Uh, in February, a family emergency prevented me from attending, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you to Lara Klebanski for filling in for me and providing that rulemaking update to you, especially since her plate is already quite full. Uh, so thank you, Lara. All right. So in the rulemaking update section of the briefing book is a memo and supporting documents that provide an update to the commission on the status of rulemaking. And I'll pause here for just a moment if you would like to refer to those materials. The rulemaking update memo is the first document and that's probably the easiest thing to follow along as I briefly review the rules. Now, the memo was written a few weeks ago, and it indicates there are no rulemaking actions for you today, which would be unusual. Um, and so uh, the chairman has added an item to your agenda for action, which is you know, more consistent with your other meetings. So we actually do have a rulemaking item, and I'll explain that when we get to it. So I will start with a quick update on one of the rule packages from last year, and there is no action for the commission to take on that package. At your August 2020 business meeting, so almost two years ago, you approved notice of text for rulemaking to begin the process for 50 rules in that year's package B, and three of the proposed rules address user conflicts associated with shellfish leases while supporting a productive shellfish aquaculture industry as required by session law 2019-37. The proposed changes would increase setback requirements from developed shorelines for new shellfish leases, limit the allowable number of corner markers for demarcating shellfish leases to simplify the polygon shapes, set new criteria for shellfish lease stakes and signage to alleviate navigation concerns, and initiate the new shellfish leaseholder training program that Jacob Boyd talked to you about earlier today, and that emphasizes user conflict reduction strategies. Now you gave final approval of these rules at your February 2021 meeting, and the rules were automatically subject to legislative review per session law 2019-198 and general statute 14-4.1. The proposed rules could be effective on the earlier of the 31st legislative day of the 2022 short session that's current, excuse me, currently underway or the day of adjournment. Um, and so a news release and rule book supplement will be issued if and when those rules become effective. This could be within the next few weeks. So it's been a, a couple year process and we may be nearing the end of that so we can implement those. So next I'm gonna to shift to this past year's rulemaking cycle. There were rules from three different packages. And the first is an update on package A. And again, there's no action on this package for the commission to take today. At your May meeting last year, you approved notice of text to begin the process for readoption and amendment of 56 rules in that package A. And these rules cover four subjects, general and gear rules in 03J and 03I, interjurisdictional species, rules with minor changes related to standards for handling, packing, and shipping crustacean meat, and prohibiting the repacking of foreign crab meat in North Carolina. You gave final approval of these rules at your November 2021 meeting. And the rules that are not automatically subject to legislative review have already become effective. That occurred on April 1st. A news release was issued and a rulebook supplement is available on the DMF website on the rules webpage. Both documents are also provided in your briefing materials. There were no impactful changes to the rules that became effective April 1st, only technical and conforming ones. 13 of the 56 rules are automatically subject to legislative review, and those do include the rules to prohibit the repacking of foreign crab meat in North Carolina into another container. The proposed rules could be effective, again, on the earlier of the 31st legislative day of the current short session or the day of adjournment. And a news release and rulebook supplement will be issued if and when those rules become effective. And again, this could be within the next few weeks. So the next package in this year's cycle was package B. 
and there is one action item for the commission to take on this package and I'll get to that. So at your August meeting last year, you approved notice of text for rulemaking to begin the process for 109 rules. And those rules cover eight subjects. Highly efficient gears, artificial reefs, and research sanctuaries. Additional shellfish leasing regulations, again, some of those that Jacob Boyd mentioned to you earlier today. Rules with conforming changes. A group of assorted rules covering definitions, imported species, record keeping, gear, marketing, shellfish, and licenses, commercial blue crab harvest and gear regulations, permit and license suspensions and revocations and pound net gears, administrative procedures, and finally, crustacea and shellfish. You gave final approval of these rules at your February meeting this year and the rules were submitted to the Rules Review Commission, or RRC, for review at its April 21st and May 19th meetings. The RRC approved 107 rules and objected to the remaining two rules, and it is on those two rules that action is needed today from this commission, and I'll explain those separately. But to finish the pathway of the 107 rules, um, the intended effective date of the rule package is June 1st, next Wednesday. Of those 107 approved rules, 70 of them are automatically subject to legislative review and thus will have a delayed effective date. Three of these subject rules covering highly efficient gears, artificial reefs, and research sanctuaries were approved by the RRC April 21st, and so they just made it in time for legislative review during the 2022 short session. So those three rules, just to refresh the Commission's memory, because there are an awful lot of rules underway, uh, they restrict highly efficient fishing gears on artificial reefs in state ocean waters to protect all species of finfish as a complement to the restrictions for artificial reefs in the EEZ for snapper grouper species. The allowed gears are hand line, hook and line, rod and reel, and spear fishing gear, and spear fishing gear would be restricted to recreational limits. The intention is to reduce the likelihood of overexploitation of those finfish resources that aggregate on the artificial reefs. The remaining 67 rules in package B were approved by the RRC May 19th, and those will not be available for legislative review until the 2023 long session. So they are going to be sitting and waiting for a while. But a news release and rulebook supplement will be issued next week for the 37 approved rules that were not automatically subject to legislative review. And then separate news releases and rulebook supplements will be issued at later times if and when those rules that are awaiting legislative review become effective. So to get to the business at hand, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this year's package B, that leaves two rules that the RRC objected to at its May 19th, 2022 meeting. The first of the two rules is 15A NCAC 0300114, suspension, revocation, and reissuance of licenses. The RRC found the Marine Fisheries Commission lacks statutory authority to criminalize evasion of service of written notice of suspension or revocation of licenses that are issued under Article 14A, 14B, and Article 25A of Chapter 113 of the North Carolina General Statutes. In everyday terms, this means the RRC found that if a commercial fishing license, a recreational fishing license, or unified hunting and fishing license is suspended or revoked, the MFC does not have the authority to adopt a rule that makes it a crime to evade written service by an officer of that license suspension or revocation. So in your briefing materials, which actually Laura has provided you a hard copy of two rules that should be on the table in front of you, um, they are in those supplemental materials also on your iPads, but there are hard copies here for you on the table. So you have an amended version of Rule 0300114, and you'll see if you go to page two of the rule on line 12, you'll see paragraph G. It's a one sentence paragraph, it's yellow. 
and that sentence is now proposed to be deleted. And so that is what contains the requirement for which the RRC is found there is insufficient authority. And the removal of the paragraph is intended to satisfy the RRC's objection. So that one is uh, pretty simple, just one sentence. So if you'll switch to the second rule, and that's 030-0209, Assignment of Shellfish Leases and Franchises. There's a little bit more to explain here. So for this rule, the RRC found that the Marine Fisheries Commission lacks statutory, statutory authority, excuse me, to condition the transfer of a shellfish lease or franchise on approval of the Division of Marine Fisheries that the shellfish lease or franchise met the requirements of both North Carolina General Statutes and Marine Fishery Commission rules. The RRC also found insufficient authority to require the use of a transfer form that is provided and approved by the division and also to limit the size of a transfer. North Carolina General Statute Section 113.202 sets broad, very broad requirements for new and renewal shellfish leases, but contains only two requirements that are strictly about lease transfers. The RRC did not agree that the General Statute 113.202 applies broadly also to transfers. As a result, you have an amended version of that rule 00209 in your materials. You'll see that on page one of the rule, paragraph B, as in boy, on lines 15 through 18, the text is yellow. And then just further below that on paragraph D, as in dog, lines 31 through 32, the text is now proposed to be deleted. And that matches with those three items uh, for which they have objected. The removal of the text is intended to satisfy that objection. And what this means, though, is that if a shellfish lease or franchise or a portion of a shellfish lease or franchise to be transferred or subleased, does not meet the requirements of North Carolina General Statutes or Marine Fishery Commission rules, it will first be transferred. And then the Department of Environmental Quality Secretary can initiate proceedings to terminate the lease. The transferee by law has 30 days to notify the division of that transfer, but it is difficult to enforce. And so it can actually end up being much longer before the division is aware that a piece of a lease or an entire lease has been transferred or subleased. So for example, if an individual receiving a transferred lease is not a resident of North Carolina, a statutory requirement, or if the receipt of the transferred lease means the individual exceeds the maximum of 50 acres allowed to be leased by one individual, also a statutory requirement, the transfer must still occur and then the secretary can initiate proceedings to terminate the lease. And the process of termination can take a period of months or longer to be completed. The RRC found there is insufficient statutory authority to address the situation up front. And so upon termination, the status of that area is such that if someone else wants to lease it, they would have to submit an application for a new lease, which is a lengthier process than for a valid transfer. All the while, the area in question is not able to be used to cultivate shellfish. So I know that's a lengthy explanation, but it is an important impact to the shellfish lease program. So before you, you for approval, are those two rules uh, both revised and they have been amended with the intention of satisfying the RRC's objections. If the Marine Fisheries Commission approves the revised rules as presented today, then the rules will be submitted to the RRC for their June 16th meeting for final approval. And Mr. Chairman, I'm glad to pause here and take any questions the commission may have prior to a vote on these two revised rules and then before continuing with the remainder of my update. Um, but what the division is looking for is a motion to approve the revised versions of 15A NCAC 0300114 and 0209 as presented by DMF staff pursuant to the May 20th, 2022 Rules Review Commission objection letter. Yeah. 
Any questions on what we're doing here? If not, Chair would like to entertain a motion to uh, uh, approve the revisions to these rules. Is it Commissioner Cross, second Commissioner Posey? Any further discussion? I'm sure you got all that up there already, don't you? I hope so. If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Just a, a little bit more to cover, and I'll gladly sit down. <laughs> <laughs> sit back down in my normal seat. Okay, so the final package for this year is package C, and there's no action on this package. At your March special meeting this spring, you approved notice of text for rulemaking to begin the process for nine joint rules that pertain to the classification of the waters of North Carolina as coastal fishing waters, joint fishing waters, and inland fishing waters. And the rules are proposed for readoption with no changes. On April 18th, a news release was issued and the proposed rules were published in the North Carolina Register. And both documents are provided for you in your briefing materials. And the commission is accepting public comments on the proposed rules from April 18th and until 5 p.m. on June 17th. To date, no public comments have been received. An online public hearing was held on May 4th and no members of the public were in attendance. But thank you to Commissioner McNeil uh, for being willing to chair the hearing um, and ready for the public to be there. So to meet the readoption deadline, the Marine Fisheries Commission will need to meet in late June to vote on final approval of the rules. Um, the rules have an earliest effective date of September 1st of this year. Um, and the, uh, there is a table showing the steps in the process uh, that's provided in your briefing materials. And of course, we're coordinating with the Wildlife Resources Commission. And I think Sean Meyer is going to talk about the joint rules a little bit more after I'm finished. Um, but I'll pause there in case there was anything on that package. And I just have one final thing about a preview for what's coming up for next year. Okay. Any questions yet? I'm calling a special meeting on June the 23rd. We'll get a time appropriate for that, and we'll do it virtually, so it won't be a taxing on everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the last item on my update is a preview of the 2022-2023 rulemaking cycle, and that's scheduled to start at your August meeting. The division anticipates starting a single rule package in the coming year, not three. <laughs> so that should help uh, my updates to be shorter. Um, and right now we have as many as two subjects for that package. Uh, first is a portion of the remaining 80 rules in 15A and CAC 18A. Uh, that are proposed for readoption. Um, the commission has uh, undertaken successfully all of its readoptions except for this final group of 80 rules. So we're preparing, uh, we're striving to prepare about half of those for this year, and then we have a final year left that we would do the second half of those rules. The second topic is the mutilated finfish rule change for which you selected your preferred management option at your last meeting in February. And so uh, just as a quick refresher, those uh, proposed amendments could resolve current conflicts with species that are used as cut bait. Um, also would provide flexibility to manage variable conditions, allow all requirements for a particular finfish species to be aggregated in a single proclamation, including for bait usage, and uh, just generally allow more comprehensive management uh, while continuing to protect the fisheries resources. So a pending approval by the Office of State Budget and Management of the fiscal analyses of these proposed rules the package is scheduled to begin, as I said, at your August meeting, and those proposed rules would have an earliest effective date of May 1st of 2023, except for rules that are automatically subject to legislative review. Any of those that are subject would not be reviewed until the 2024 short session. So I don't make the rules on the timing, so don't, don't shoot the messenger. Okay. Um, there was a third subject that staff was developing for the commission, and that was additional labeling requirements for repack foreign crab meat in North Carolina. 
you selected your preferred management option and associated proposed language at your November 2021 meeting. You probably recall this labeling issue was part two in a two step process. So the first step is to make it unlawful to repack foreign crab meat in the state. Um, and that is what is part of package A that is awaiting legislative review right now during the 2022 short session in order to become effective. The second step was a rule to further minimize any loopholes by strengthening labeling requirements and reducing ambiguity about the true origin of crab meat for consumers. The lead staff for this issue, Shannon Jenkins and Sean Nelson, brought you an information paper and an issue paper in 2020, and then a second issue paper in 2021 to help accomplish these commission goals. And I did want to take just a second and give a shout out to Shannon and Sean for all their hard work that they've done. Following your November meeting, the staff began developing the fiscal analysis of the proposed labeling rule change. And as part of that analysis, staff had to re-examine the authority for promulgating the rule. We encountered complexities that resulted in meeting with the Commission's counsel, Sean Meyer. And I know Sean can do a much better job of explaining these complexities than I can. Um, so he's going to cover that part for you. But otherwise, that concludes uh, my portion of the rulemaking update. I'm glad to address any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions or comments for Catherine? Not Catherine. Thank you. You're a rock star. We appreciate what you do. Okay. Sean, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've sensed a trend that you all keep putting me at the very end of the agenda, hoping you can wear me out uh, and that I'll keep this brief and I will because it's working. Um, as far as the, the crab relabeling issue, um, there are uh, the commission has broad authority when it comes to regulating uh, marine and estuarine resources and doing things for the protection of those um, where you run a little short of authority is when it comes to labeling for consumer protection. And that was uh, kind of the, the heart of the additional labeling, labeling requirements was uh, making sure that the consumer is properly informed of the country of origin of repacked crab meat. Um, and as you all have heard, um, we recently had some rules not make it through the re review process with the RRC based on a lack of statutory authority. Um, and in examining this issue and, and looking at the limits of the commission's authority, it became fairly apparent that um, while that rule was well-intentioned, it was something beyond the scope of what this commission can really do. So um, I, I have spoken with Commissioner Cross about this issue since I know it was uh, near and dear to his heart. And um, it is not that the state is without the ability to tackle that issue and is without the ability to um, make progress on that front. It is just that it needs to come from a different organization, likely something within the Department of Agriculture. So um, we hope to, to have updates on that in the future, but it will not be a, a rulemaking issue for this commission. Um, so happy to take any questions on the repack crab labeling issue um hearing none um and then finally our, our last action item on the agenda today is uh to have this commission give its blessing to the joint rules that were recently readopted by the wildlife resources commission so um we have for the marine fisheries commission we have the uh, o3q rules um, that, that Catherine talked about the process and where those stand. Um, wildlife has its own set of essentially the same rules and they are on the same uh, path as us, which is that they are readopting those rules as is. Um, they've approved those. It is now our responsibility to um, give our approval to, to their rules so that they will do the same thing for us when we finish um, our process. But um, before you today will be the uh, 15A NCAC 10C 0100 rules, and uh, I would recommend that the commission give its concurrence to the Wildlife Resources Commission on those rules. And is there any question about what we're doing here? We do this every, what, five years, 10 years? Um, this is this is the first time we've gone through the process, but yeah, the, the statute requires once every 10 years. Every 10 years, okay. Um, any questions on what we're doing here? Do what? Um, yeah. 
they are out there somewhere. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to diminish the importance of you being informed, but it's, it's the same, same rules that exist. We're, we're yeah. 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 yeah so they're the same rules. That the exist. rules that they have uh, readopted are the exact existing rules. Yeah. Um, so they, they have not made changes, which is consistent with the guidance that we've received from the governor's office. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking for a motion for concurrence on the readopting rules. Got it from Commissioner Hendrickson. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Posey. Any other discussion on this? Let's see. Sorry. Uh, Commissioner Posey. Okay. All right. There's no other discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, issues from commissioners. We allow commissioners at this time to bring up any concerns or anything they might want to see on a future agenda for the staff to be looking into. Is there anything that right now is uh, um, a hot button for anybody that do want to do some further insight in? Commissioner McNeil. Uh while we're just on the subject that Sean's talking about uh, with the crab meat uh, packaging labeling, did we make a recommendation to the Department of Agriculture to take a look at that? Or can should we? Can we? we? Could I guess? There's you're always welcome. Yeah, to send we, a letter. we can we can. So would you like to send a, us to send a letter? I don't think it needs to be made into a motion or anything that that we um, see a need for the, this rule and we'd like for Department of Agriculture to um, consider it. Yeah, well, I yeah. think we should send a letter just to, in case they aren't aware of it, just to bring it to their attention. Sure, all right, we can do that. Okay. Mr. Pacey. Well, yeah, let's make a motion, sure. yeah. Okay, I'll move that um, Chairman Bissell can write a letter on behalf of the um, commission to I ask the appropriate people of the Department of Agriculture to look into this issue. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? A second, second from Commissioner McNeil. Um, uh, let's get it up here. Regarding moving forward on appropriate action, uh -huh. yeah. whatever they need to do. Regarding appropriate action, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess it has to be you know, moving forward appropriate action on the, how do you phrase, crab meat labeling concern. Repackaged. Crab meat labeling repackaging concern or? Just labeling concern, he said. Yeah. All right. Just labeling concern. And with that, I assume you could, you could probably send them a copy of what yeah. we had yeah. previously approved. Yeah, that would be a good thing to do. Pass yes, the motion as you have made it. Okay. Second it by, oh. by um, Commissioner McNeil. Okay. Point of clarification yes. on the the uh, what we're I know what we the intent of what we're voting on. I'm just trying to clean the motion up, maybe. All right. Well, we took up two issues. One was the repacking of the foreign crab meat. Mm -hmm. And issue number two was the labeling concerns. Okay. So I would have maybe um, offer a friendly amendment that there be um, appropriate action on repacking of foreign crab meat and the labeling concerns. If if that's yes. Oh, okay. Labeling. labeling concern. Okay. All right. I misunderstood. I'm sorry. And and just to, just to say, I, I, I'm 
Um, I think this is a great idea because of the work the division has already done. I'd hate to see that go down to waste. Um, so I think um, this would be the appropriate way to All right. try to do it. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay, I assume that says everybody has made it and seconded it. No other discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, any other issues from any of our commissioners that they want to see going forward? All right, um, Laura, give us a wrap up, please. Yes, Chairman. All right, so for Stripe Mullet, today you um, received the stock assessment report uh, on Stripe Mullet. And the next step is gonna be the scoping period, which is tentatively scheduled to be held um, in the second half of July. So staff are working on the projections um, for that fishery based on that stock assessment. And once those are completed, um, the scoping period will then be scheduled. Um, the scoping period uh, is an opportunity for the public to provide insight on the management of the fishery. So um, speaking to Chairman, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Roller's comment. What um, is it with you today? I know, I know. <laughs> Oh, goodness. So um, it's a good opportunity to take a broad look and to come to the table with fresh ideas before we get into the minutia of uh, specific management options. Um, for estuarine striped bass, uh, you selected your preferred management strategy today for Amendment 2 and voted to send the um, plan out to Secretary Beiser for the legislative review. Uh, in August, the draft plan will come back to you with any comments from the legislative review for uh, a vote on final approval. Um, in accordance with the additional motion that was passed by the commission regarding further study um, of the effects of the gillnet closure, the division will um, review this issue and, and start to work to develop a study and follow up with the commission as appropriate. For Southern Flounder, you gave final approval on Amendment 3 today. Um, the division will now move to implement management. Uh, I do want to just um, call back to Director Rawls' comments this morning um, regarding the division's work to implement the quota management of this fishery. So to summarize what she said, um, we're working on it and we're going to get it out as soon as possible. Um, specifically, we recognize the public interest in the uh, recreational flounder season. And um, I, we do want to let everyone know that now that you have given final approval on this plan, we will work to get those out as soon as possible. Um, for commissioner requests, um, the division's going to continue to work on the bluefish, uh, blue catfish issue. Um, and we do expect to come back to the commission for more discussion on it and specifically working towards recommendations. Um, Commissioner Roller, you pr uh, asked for a breakdown of the striped mullet fishery relative to sectors, so I'll probably follow up with you on that directly. Um, and then I will also be working with Chairman Bizzle to um, write the letter you just um, passed the motion on. And then um, in your August meeting is scheduled for August 17th through 19th, and that's going to be in Jacksonville. And with that, uh, I will wrap up my report. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, staff, for all y'all do. Uh, you make this possible. If nothing else to be brought before this commission at this time, we are adjourned.